Finance Committee. I'm Councilmember Daniel Drum, and I'm the chair of the committee. Today, we will examine the Department of Finance's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget and the fiscal 2019 preliminary mayor's management report. I'm joined this morning by Councilmember Steve Matteo and others I'm sure will be joining us shortly. To begin today's preliminary budget hearing, we will hear from the Commissioner of the Department of Finance, Jacques Gia. After we hear from DOF, we will hear from the Department of Design and Construction and the Office of Management and Budget. The hearings with DDC and OMB will be heard jointly by this committee and the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, chaired by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. DOF's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget totals $311.8 million, an $8.3 million increase from the fiscal 2019 adopted budget. One of the significant changes is a new need of $1.5 million in fiscal 19 to provide technical assistance for the new property tax system. DOF recently launched a new public portal for more than 40,000 taxpayers to view their property tax data. With the release, there has been some confusion about information that was used to, that used to be available to residents that is no longer upright there now. We look forward to clarifying this with DOF today. In addition, DOF included $2.3 million, a new need for fiscal 2020, and the out years to modernize its collections process. The Council commends DOF for consistent improvement in ECB debt collections year after year since fiscal 2015. In fiscal 2018, DOF collected $67.3 million in ECB debt, an increase of 9.1% over the previous year. However, we can all agree there is still room for improvement. Even with the allowances for bad debt, DOF reports that there is $642 million in, e in ECB debt outstanding. I, I also hope to learn more about DOF's outreach regarding the rent freeze program or SCREE and DRE. Despite a targeted outreach campaign for the rent freeze program to under-enrolled neighborhoods in 2016, the application and enrollment numbers for those programs remains relatively flat. Based on the numbers, it appears that the administration can do more to ensure that more of our seniors and those living with disabilities are applying for these critical programs that can help them remain in their homes. <coughs> Lastly, I look forward to hearing an update on the implementation of the Income-Based Payment Agreement Program, which DOF dubbed PTA, Local Law 45 of 2019, which I sponsored and which uh, authorized these new installment plans recently went into effect on March 1st. I want to acknowledge the work of Council Finance, who did much in preparing for today's hearing, specifically Deputy Directors Regina Pareda Ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit, unit Head Chim, Chima Obacheri, Financial Analyst Massa Sarkissian, Assistant Director Emra Eddev, and Councils Rebecca Chasen and Stephanie Ruiz. <clears throat> On a logistical matter, I want to remind any member of the public who wishes to testify to please fill out a witness slip with the Sergeant at Arms. The public portion of the hearing is scheduled to begin at approximately 2 p.m., and the witness panels will be arranged by topic, so please indicate the topic of your testimony on your witness slip. If there is any member of the public who wishes to testify but is unable to do so at today's hearing, you may email your testimony to the Council's Finance Division at finance testimony at council.nyc.gov by close of business on Friday, March 29th, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. We will now hear from Commissioner Jacques Gia after he is sworn in by Council. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Chair Drum and the members of the Finance Committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is uh, Jacques Shishiha, and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Finance. I'm joined today by First Deputy Commissioner Michael Hyman. I will begin by providing you with a brief update on the city's financial conditions. Through February, the city's revenue total, $46.5 billion, which represents a 1.2% increase over last year. That is well below the Office of Management and Budget Fiscal Year growth forecast of 2.6%. This underperformance <clears throat> has been driven by weakness in the personal income tax 
especially in the area of estimated payments and a softness in the uncorporated business tax. In light of these uh, weaknesses and uh, the recent inversion of the yield curve, which if continued could signal a recession, we should approach the fiscal year executive budget and financial plan with caution. We will continue to closely monitor tax collections and we will brief the council as warranted. The past four years <clears throat> have been a transformative period for the Department of Finance. Increasingly, we have been relying on sophisticated data analytics and artificial intelligence, in particular, cognitive and machine learning in order to mitigate operational risks, reduce inefficiencies and costs, and make better decisions. Along the way, we have conducted our business in accordance with the agency four key pillars, fairness, efficiency, transparency, and exceptional customer service. Like any business, cities that do not provide good, uh, do not provide good service at competitive prices will lose customers. In our case, this means residents, businesses, and visitors, and the revenue they generate. City agencies cannot settle for providing merely adequate service. Our customers are also customers of Apple, American Express, Chase Bank, and many other private companies which are providing state-of-the-art products and services. They have grown accustomed to a certain level of service, and they will not accept anything less. Therefore, our services must be on par with the services they receive from private sector businesses. When a customer walks into our business centers, they expect the same treatment that they receive at the bank branch. They don't, want, they don't want to wait too long, a long period of time to conduct a transaction. That's why we re-engineered our op operations to reduce wait times at our business centers from 45 minutes to five minutes four years ago. When customers must pay the parking tickets or property taxes, they expect the same level of service and convenience that they receive from major retailers, banks, and other businesses. Again, that's why we introduce new payment methods such as our mobile apps and Apple Pay and have conveniently enabled our customers to pay the parking tickets at any CVS or 7-Eleven store around the country. Put simply, just as private sector firms use big data and technology to provide excellent services, we must do the same. At the Department of Finance, <clears throat> we are at the cutting edge. The examples of our data-driven and customer-centric approach are numerous. I'd like to share just a few with you in the time that we have today. First. The process by which the Department of Finance values properties has become heavily driven by technology and big data. While we continue to inspect properties in person every three years as required by law, we are increasingly relying on technology to do the majority of the inspections. In the last two years, we have increased the number of properties that we have checked for anomalies and have increased assessments by adding misconstruction and fixing incorrect uh, square footage data and incorrect uh, building classifications. More importantly, our assessors are now trained in application where GIS and imagery are the underlying technologies. They appreciate the power of these new capabilities and how they have made their data collection task more efficient. For example, our assessors were able to visit approximately 27,000 parcels in a one five-year period in 2016 before the adoption of uh, streetscape technology. For the same period in 2018, they reviewed about 80,000 parcels, about 67,000 via desktop review and the rest to field visits. The assessment process has also benefited significantly from a Department of Finance initiative that we refer to as cross-agency data sharing. The purpose of this initiative is to create a collaborative culture 
among more than 20 participating city agencies. The property evaluation team is sharing data with nine other city agencies, including the Department of Buildings and the Department of City Planning. As a result, we can now obtain a more timely Department of Buildings certificate of occupancy data to identify parcels with recently completed construction. This result in an increase of more than $40 million in the city's total assets value and generating $5 million in additional property tax revenue in fiscal year 20. We are now moving into mass data collection of building characteristics using machine learning algorithms on LADAR, light, which is light detection and ranging, and imaging, image, image with data, with the goal of capturing data on exterior building characteristics. Hence, assessors can now focus on interior inspections of buildings to find out the number of units, conditions, and alterations, and on the valuation of properties, particularly in growth areas. Mass data collections using LADAR and imagery will give New York City a database that all agencies can share, since many agencies use building characteristics such as footprint, square footage, number of stories, and facade type. This wealth of data that is shared, accurate, and updated on a regular basis, paired with data analytics, is the basis for building the smart cities of the future. Clearly, good things happen when government agencies use and share data to make informed decisions. That is true not only in the area of property taxation, but also in law enforcement. The New York City Sheriff's Office is very active in the areas of data sharing and technology. We are one of the few sheriff operations in the United States that integrates data from the courts and from the police department to our service of court orders. For example, if we serve an order of protection and we know that the offender has an outstanding warrant with the court or is wanted by the NYPD, we will make the arrest on the spot. This is not a universal practice among law enforcement agencies nationwide. Many will simply serve the orders and walk away. You may also have heard about the recent tobacco bust performed by, by our sheriff's office. In January, the sheriff executed six arrest warrant and seven search warrants that resulted in a seizure of over 26,000 cartons of cigarettes in a single operation. The defendants were charged with conspiracy and the trafficking of over 400,000 cartons of untaxed cigarettes. That operation was made possible by joint investigative work with the United States Postal Service and by the multiple data sources acquired by the Sheriff's Office concerning illegal tobacco trafficking. In fact, we are investing in, in information technology to improve our law enforcement efforts across the board. The Sheriff's Office is uh, preparing to deploy a new computer-aided dispatching system to provide deputies with more information in the field. And we are also using technology to protect New Yorkers who are vulnerable to deed fraud, a crime that has been described as an epidemic in the city. <clears throat> the Department of Finance has already implemented a system to inform homeowners whenever a document is recorded against their property so they can report any suspicious activity. Now, we are turning our focus to prevention by acquiring optical character recognition and artificial intelligence capabilities that will make property-related records more accurate and more easily searchable. This, in turn, will make it easier for the city registrar's office and the sheriff to spot suspicious activity and track the connections between perpetrators of fraud and their accomplices. Our objective is to use our machine learning to detect patterns of illegal activity and to start a deed fraud before it starts. We have already seen the benefit of machine learning in other areas of the agency. As we speak, a very sharp team of highly trained economists and statisticians 
is working to make sure that the city's businesses pay what they owe, not one penny more and not one penny less. The Data Intelligence Group has developed more than 200 models to identify potential business tax audit candidates. These models include predictive econometric algorithms which identify common characteristics of past audit subjects in order to find other candidates with similar characteristics. The learning comes in when the results of the audits are then fed back into the models to make them smarter. Put simply, our models use auditors' insights as well as statistical algorithms across multiple sources of data to select better audit cases, which result in a significant increase in revenue for the city. Since 2014, our annual audit have increased to more than $1.3 billion. Our collections, effort, our collections effort has also benefited from new technology and process re-engineering. As a result of the new business tax system, business tax judgment increased to $225 million in fiscal year 17 and close to $200 million last year, after averaging about $70 million each year from fiscal year 09 to fiscal year 15. On the other side of the coin, coin, we are also making sure that business owners receive the refunds that they deserve. The new system has made it easier for taxpayers to request and for DOF to process business tax refund. We issued $600 million in refunds to businesses in 2018 compared to $465 million in 2014. So you see, we don't just come looking for customers when they owe us money. We also make sure that they receive the refunds to which they are entitled. Another, another example of our commitment to use technology to improve tax administration and become more customer-centric <clears throat> is the launch earlier this month of a new online property tax system which makes it much easier for customers to transact with the Department of Finance. Property owners are now able to view important information such as the property tax bill, bills and notice of property value and to pay the property taxes from the palm of their hand on their mobile device. With the new system, homeowners are now able to file online for money saving property tax benefits such as the senior citizen and disabled homeowners exemption and to view the status of their submitted applications. The streamlined electronic workflow of the new system allows us to process applications more efficiently and to grant these benefits more quickly. Put simply, our priority at the Department of Finance is to leverage technology and big data <clears throat> to provide a better experience for the customer and to provide more accurate tax assessment. Before we close, there are a few other initiatives and developments of which I would like to make you aware, all of them geared towards serving our customers. First, working with the council, we have just introduced a very important new program to help low-income property owners who are experiencing difficulties to pay the property tax. The property tax and interest deferral program, also known as PT aid, allows homeowners to defer a portion, or in some cases, all of their property tax payments to help them remain in their homes. There are three payment plan options for homeowners with low or moderate incomes. One for seniors, one for homeowners facing extenuating circumstances such as death or loss of income due to unemployment, and one for homeowners who simply need to stretch out a one year worth of taxes over multiple years. PT8 program participants will have the property re properties removed from the tax lien sale as long as they provide all required information within 45 days from the date of application. We are excited about PT aid and expect it will be an incredibly helpful program for the homeowners most in need of our assistance. We will work with city council members and other elected officials to get the word out in their districts. Second, the Office of the Parking Summons Advocate 
was officially launched on December 21st, uh, 2018. The Brocking Advocate's Office is tasked with helping members of the public who are unable to resolve the parking and karma violation tickets through no more Department of Finance channels. The office also evaluates the parking system to identify and offer solu solutions to systemic issues. The parking advocate and his team have been conducting a robust educational outreach effort, providing in-person assistance at our business centers and assisting customers over the phone and via email. To date, the Office of the Parking Summons Advocate has opened up close to 600 cases and has assisted with about 1,900 summonses. But the advocate's most important work is in educating people before they go to the judge to help them understand their violation and prepare effective defenses. We can be proud that New York is one of only a few cities in the country where people who receive parking tickets have an advocate in city government. And finally, this summer, we will launch a new Department of Finance contact center, which will provide customers with easy access to experts on business taxation and personal exemptions and benefits. With the contact center in place, we'll be able to provide a faster service for customers with sophisticated or highly specific tax questions. This is critically important as our system of taxation involves complicated issues that cannot be answered by 311 operators and comprises many different deadlines and documentation requirements. Our customers require timely answers and with the contact center, they will receive the, informa the information they need as quickly as possible. In closing, the Department of Finance is hard at work on behalf of the city and our customers. We are very grateful for your support, and as always, we welcome your input. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. And just before we get started with questions, I'd like to say that we've been joined by Councilmember Adrian Adams and Councilmember Barry Gudenchik as well. Thank you for being here. Um, let's just talk a little bit about uh, vacancies and operational capacity within the department. Um, DOF has had a high vacancy rate, which currently stands at about 14.6%. What measures have you taken to address the vacancy issue, and is retention and recruiting um, one of the primary issues? Yes, uh, vacancy is, um, as, as, you can, as you indicated, is, uh, is high, and, but the agency continues to operate uh, effectively. And as I indicated to people all the time, we are a very lean and mean machine. So we are very, very effective in terms of managing our headcount. But, but bear in mind, I mean, rest assured that the agencies continue to operate fully. We are we're currently working with OMB to, back, to fill all the backfills that we currently have, all the positions that we currently have. We currently have about 322, if I correctly, open position. And I believe with the uh, freeze, we lost about 46. So, Overall, we have about 20, 276 open positions, but we're currently working with the OMB. And uh, we have, uh, I believe, uh, a couple of hiring pools coming with, uh, for the city assessors and uh, for the uh, auditors and some uh, um, uh, payment operations uh, uh, openings. So uh, hopefully, in the next couple of months, we will begin to backfill some of this position. But again, rest assured that we are fully operational and uh, nothing is falling to the crack just because of the headcount issues that we have. From what we can see, um, it appears that DOF is adding 12 new positions. Is that correct? Uh, yes. And what area are those? Is this the area of uh, huh? the sheriff's office, I believe, yes. Chef six for the sheriff's office. And do you know where the other six are? What are they? I, I would provide you. I would provide you that information once we do. Okay, thank you. And um, of the 322 vacancies that you mentioned, 58 are in the audit program. Is that correct? Yes. And is that the area of greatest need for you right now? Well, we are about to, uh, as I said, uh, to uh, um, onboard uh, uh, because uh, we are moving our staff from um, Brooklyn into Manhattan. 
So we didn't want to hire folks while we're moving. So therefore, after the move, we made the we make the decision to postpone the hiring after the move. But as I said, we are about to onboard uh, uh, a, a big group of auditors in the next couple of months. And uh, you feel that you'll be able to fill those vacancies, most of them, by the end of this fiscal year? Yes. Okay. Um, as part of the fiscal 2019 terms and conditions, DOF committed to submit to the Council no later than October 15th, 2018, a report on the number of applications received for SHE, D, SCREE, and DRE, and the nonprofit exemption for the period beginning July 1st, 2017, and ending on June 30th, 2018. And the Council has not yet received this report. Um, when do you think that we can uh, get that information? Um, I thought we provided a report for, uh, for you mentioned Squee and Dree, you said? Mm-hmm. And, and she and D. And she and D. It's the annual report, but uh, I, I, I will look into it, and uh, if we have not done so, we will do so as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, at the March 6th preliminary hearing with OMB, we asked OMB how it forecast audits and inquired as to whether the agency would commit to sharing the tax audit forecast data with the council. As a response, OMB stated that it adopts DOF estimates of audit revenues and that it could not share forecast data due to the confidential taxpayer information used by DOF. Uh, while the council understands that there are privacy concerns related to certain taxpayer information, it would still be helpful to receive some information to better understand the process of audit uh, forecasting. Can you provide us with some of that information without revealing specific taxpayer names or uh, confidential information? Uh, it's, we could try, we will try, but it's uh, extremely difficult, as you can imagine, because uh, most of our audits are basically coming from a very small group of uh, audit candidates. So it's uh, the information we provide you, you could infer from them sometimes, you know, of who the taxpayers are. So that's why it's a little uh, tricky, but we'll look into it. Which information uh, is used in the audits is um, specifically protected by, by tax secrecy laws? Um, all the income and expense information provided by the, uh, by the, uh, aud I mean, by the clients, by the company. Is there any level of data that, that can be shared with us? Um, we can, again, but the point I'm making is I say we have to look into it closely because, you know, the uh, audit, a lot of the audit revenue that we generate comes basically from a very small group of uh, companies. And you can infer from looking at the data who these people are, who these companies are. So that's why we have to be a little careful. But again, as I said, we will look into to see what can be shared. If it cannot be, we will come back to you and tell you we cannot. All right. Um, DOF is instituting a collections modernization effort to increase how much the agency is able to collect on delinquent fines. Can you uh, discuss the details of this initiative and how it will work? And is um, ECB involved in the process? Yes, it is. Um, as you can imagine, we have been, we are very proud of the uh, collection efforts that we have done in the past uh, four years, four and a half years. We have more than double. Uh, what we collected with respect to either uh, ECB debt or business tax warrants. Uh, but uh, we still believe that uh, there is a potential, there is potential, there is more that can be done. So we hired McKenzie, and working with McKenzie, we basically uh, went to a review of the entire oper collection operations. And uh, so uh, it uh, came down to basically uh, a number of uh, uh, restructuring that we have to do. First, we have to do a better job at segmenting the debts that we have. We have to restructure our operations in line with uh, the uh, restructuring that, the segmentation that we're doing with the debt. We also have to invest in, uh, make some investment in human capital and also in technology. So we're currently working with OMB to implement uh, the plan and uh, we expect that plan to generate significant increase in revenue in coming months. Are you working with the ticketing agencies, perhaps, to identify some deficiencies in the process? We're working, we are, we're working with uh, all, all of the, the uh, stakeholders, in, including DOT, NYPD, but again, that is part of an ongoing work that we have with them to make sure that the tickets are improved. 
the outstanding ECB debt takes into account an allowance for bad debt. How will the collection and modernization efforts affect the allowance for bad debt? Well, one of the things that we, uh, we want to spend a lot of time on is basically uh, scrubbing and cleaning the database that we have. Because there is a misconception that we are, we are owed more than, than we actually can collect. Okay? Because a lot of this business is out of business, so therefore it's hard to collect from them. So one of the, one of the challenges that we always had was, uh, is to have a database that includes a bunch of bad debt. So we're in a process of cleaning that database to make sure whatever we have left is money that can be collected. So it's going to be very, part, very much part of that effort. Uh, after DOS, DOF receives judgments for um, ECB debts, what's your process before you send a judgment to uh, collections? We try to work it in the house for about uh, 60 days. We work it in the house for 60 days. And if we're not successful after 60 days, we send it to a collection agency. And the collection agency has six months to work on that debt. And if they're not successful, we take that debt back and then reassign it to one, another collection agency for another six months. And thereafter, it comes back to us. But as part of the review process that we just conducted with McKinsey, they recommend that we hire a third because to make us in line with what taking place in the private sector. So we are uh, about to hire, we about to issue an IFP to hire a third vendor so that we could have a third vendor, you know, a debt, debt going to the third vendor before it comes back to us so we could see whether or not debt that is uh, writing off. And so during that, those first 60 days, do you reach out to uh, constituents or we reach, out to, we reach out to them, call them, send the letters, and do all the things that we need to do to try to collect, yes. In fiscal 2017, DOF instituted the New York City Amnesty Program, which allowed participants to resolve violations they received from various city agencies, which had gone into judgment. As a result of the program, the city generated $30 million. In light of the apparent success of the last amnesty program, has DOF considered having another amnesty program in the future? And not at this time, you know, because uh, we don't want to make it a pattern of DF. So people expect, uh, you know, every, every year to have uh, an amnesty, so therefore they don't pay their debt. So we're not looking to doing one at this point. How, how long before the last amnesty program was there an, an amnesty program before um, that? What was this, the first one? It was probably seven, eight years. Uh, in the mayor's uh, preliminary uh, management report, the number of interpretation services dropped from 2,891 in fiscal 2018 to 666 in fiscal 2019. Can you provide some insight as to why there was a, a significant drop in these services provided by the agency? Uh, it is a program that is very important to me, so therefore we pay very close attention to it. The challenge we had at the time is because we didn't have a company, it was not a contract for the company expired. So therefore we had to wait, you know, before we could onboard a new company. That's the reason we had the drop off. But uh, since then we have hired a company. And that lasted for what, three months? Yes, I think, what is this? You were citywide? Yeah, yeah, it's about, yeah, three months, I think. Three, four months. Has that ever happened before? Um, not that I'm aware of, no. Uh, if a resident in need of translation services and, and they can't be provided, um, how do you accommodate those residents and are any extensions granted? Uh, yes, we would that? provide any extension if that was the case, yes. If that was the case? Yes. Okay. Uh, recently, your agency has broken with your prior practice of giving the council advance notice of major events and updates that are happening with DOF. For example, this year you rolled out the new NOPV without letting us know or giving us opportunity to provide feedback before it was sent out to millions of New Yorkers. And in fact, our constituents have been calling us confused and panicking because some of the information on the notice is wrong or misleading. Similarly, you recently rolled out a website about the new income-based payment plans, which the council had a significant role in developing without providing any advance notice or, ch or, or chance for the council to comment. So um, why ha have you stopped uh, seeking uh, uh, feedback from the council before rolling out? 
um, progress. To be honest with you, I'm surprised because I didn't know anything about any, I didn't know about this. So I would try to fix that problem going forward because this is not by design. It's not a policy that we have. I'm I, I'm surprised. I, I would have to talk to my staff to find out exactly what transpired, what what happened. But uh, our policy is to work uh, in collaboration with the council uh, to basically roll out any programs that we're working on. So I would. I would have to talk to my staff to find out what happened. Okay. Uh, wherever the breakdown took place, we would fix it. For the NOPV in particular, we've been getting a lot sure, of calls and sure. emails, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm really, I'm really and sorry. And a lot of the blame. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what transpired, but I, you know, to me, it's it's it, okay. it's surprising to me that we didn't do that. Um, as a result of uh, the new property tax system or PTS, the public-facing website where taxpayers see their property tax information looks much different and, in my opinion, improved. However, the amount of information that is now publicly available is significantly uh, diminished and the public has been noticing. Both the speaker and I, and probably other council members as well, have received complaints that the data was previously available is no longer available. Property tax bills go back to only 2014, I think now, uh, and J51 data only goes back to 2014, and NOPVs go back to 2010. Um, can you commit to a timeline to making all data available on the new system? Yeah, the data, the data are currently available at, uh, you know, people used to come to our website to get the information. Now we make the data available on the New York City Open Data op open uh, portal data. So the data is there, so what we have to do is to make sure we instruct uh, uh, the public where to go and find the data and our best to get the data, how to use, you know, what they need to do, you know, to get the data. So we will make sure that, you know, they're fully aware of uh, where the data is located now. And uh, if there is, if there are data that are not currently available on the uh, open uh, New York City open portal data, uh, as we become aware of them, we would make them available. So our goal is to be as transparent as we can be, so we're not trying to limit uh, the information that is available to the public. And Commissioner, we've gotten some complaints also that when people go directly to DOF and request the data, some staff have told them that the data is no longer available to the public. Is that uh, um, something that you've been made aware of, or is that I, true? I probably would talk to my staff to find out. As I said, we will probably have to put uh, some kind of notice on our website to let the rest of the world know exactly what the data are located and uh, what to do to get the data. But your staff would be able uh, to provide them with that, or they should have access to it? They should definitely they have access to it. I mean, again, as I said, I will talk to the staff to find out exactly where that miscommunication is coming from. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to now just um, go to, uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal and Councilmember Powers, and Councilmember Powers has some questions. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, nice to see you. Um, first of all, I want to just give a shout out to the sheriff who, after my town hall, well, most popular person at my town hall, I should mention, by the way, <laughs> with the mayor, but uh, very quickly helped us with an issue that came up at the town hall, and I want to give him a, a special thank you for that. Um, I had a, we, we get calls all the time in my office around, I have uh, a lot of co-ops, I think it might be the most co-ops and condos in the city, so we get a lot of calls around the property taxes, and then on the, uh, a lot of rentals as well. Um, we get a lot of calls about scree, and Dre, things like that. So um, I had a couple questions uh, that have come up through my office recently I want to ask you two uh, about. One is um, about scree and property taxes and rebates, which is that we get a lot of calls from constituents and um, they have talked, to, you know, told us or informed us about a long wait time to get responses back, particularly when they call 311. Do you guys take calls from 311, and, and then what is the re system for responding to concerns or questions from 311 or our offices? Uh, because we've been hearing that people are getting a long wait time to get information back. Um, every time we get requests or referral from 311, we try to address them as soon as possible. And, uh, and we know there are some issues and challenges, and that's one of the reasons why we're about to launch this summer a contact center to deal with questions dealing with uh, squee, injury, you know, personal exemption issues, because we know that has been a problem, a challenge. 
Yeah, I, I, when, when, what's the timing of that? Uh, this summer. We will this summer, okay. Contact center. Okay, so and, and what will be the process then when people... They would call 311 and then they would refer those calls to our office and there will be someone on the line that could answer the questions for them. Okay, while, and, uh, and, to the, and today, what, what, how is well, that different? Today they, send the, today, they send the request to, to our office, and then one of our staff will get back to them at some time in the future. Okay, so it sounds like you guys are working on, yes, on that issue. Yes, we're working on some solution. Yes. Um, the, on Scree, I, I, this is, I, I get, I had a few tenants even recently when they're doing their Scree renewals, ask us, they have to send their mail to New Jersey, I think, their Scree documents to New Jersey, and then, uh, and then it take, that also takes time. Is there a way we can centralize a process around Scree? People have seemed to have confusion around why they're sending their mail to New Jersey for the New York City program and how that can be approved upon. It is um, uh, the company that processed them. You know, it's, I believe the mailbox is located in Jersey. That's the. Do you know the average time for a, a renewal to take place? A renewal for Squee is very quick. I mean, a renewal for Squee, once we obtain all the information, is about like five, uh, six days, the most. Yeah, five, six days, the most. Once we obtain all the competent, because what happens very often is, the information sometimes, you know, it's not fully complete. So therefore, you know, we have to go back to the taxpayer and ask for additional information. Is there a way to do it online? Uh, we renewal. We we working we working on that. When does that become available? Um, I cannot give you a specific time, but we it's it's one of the projects that we have very high on. It's a high priority for us. Okay. Yes, definitely. We, this is, we we fully aware of that challenge. We're trying to create an opportunity so that people could file online. People now can do it for she and uh, for D. They could file online with the new property tax system. Uh, but because you're dealing with uh, homeowners, but for renters, you know, we're creating a part of the system. So again, as I said, it's something that is very high on our priority list. Okay, because I, I think that the idea, I mean, I get that the would, list from the Department of solve, Finance every solve, month. Trust me, that would solve a lot of our complaints. That okay, we okay, we, we get it. I actually send everybody a letter and we call them to make yeah. sure they renew their scree, but obviously still people can fall through the sure, cracks. Sure, sure. Um, on, on, on for individual buildings or, or properties that receive their, um, their property taxes, their bill every year, they, we get so many questions about, from folks about why they're paying more and why they're paying what they're paying. Is there a way that they can do on a case-by-case -case basis, get information from the Department of Finance, um, and I think that's part of the thing I was talking about earlier, which is trying to find, weave their way. But is there a clearest place where either my office or, or our constituent can call to get very specific information about their property and why they're paying what they're paying? Yeah, currently, the, uh, again, as I said, the process that we have is calling 311, and then 311 send a request to us. And then uh, from there, we uh, see if we could, we try to uh, solve the problem as quickly as possible. But as I said, uh, going forward, we're gonna have a better system because with the contact center, a lot of these questions, a lot of these issues will be addressed. Okay, and my last question is, um, as where, what is the timing of the property tax commission when they come out with their, their results? or the their recommendations? The Public Commission, Tax Commission has been busy at work. As you probably know, we have had like 10 public meetings so far this year, one in each bowl, and we have uh, five uh, open public meetings with experts throughout the country uh, that basically we're trying to get insight from them to know exactly what's taking place in what other localities are doing. We also meet uh, every other week in executive session Okay, to uh, review, to discuss uh, um, policy principles and also review simulation, result of simulation models that we have, so to guide the discussion about uh, reforms. The objective is uh, to issue a preliminary report sometimes uh, this year, and then to go back to the communities to get insights from them and feedbacks from them and, and incorporate those feedback into the, into the final report. When is this year? Do you think you'll have the right year? Uh, I, I don't have a time for it, but I know for sure sometime this year we'll issue the preliminary report. And we're working, we're working on it, but you know we're working on it. But I and when do we? Work. And do we have to go to Albany to enact the changes that, or we do? Then it? that's the first step. The, the, far, the next step would be to make recommendations to Albany. And so when do we think we're the city's in Albany asking for? 
I, legislative I, changes to the I, property tax system. At this point, I can tell you because I know for sure right now what we're working on is to get the report out. I, my concern is that we're, we're, we've been telling our constituents that they're uh, that they're there's a property tax commission to help address these issues. If we don't, ha if it's the end of this year, we miss the next legislative session. We are now two years down the road, or three legislative sessions down the road. If we don't get what we want there, we're four or five years away. As you know, it's a very, it's a very complicated system. We just cannot rush into into it. It is a, well, uh, rushing and rushing and acting with a sense of urgency around it. There is a sense. There is a sense of urgency. We're working with a sense of urgency. And in best case scenario, if we were to issue a report this year, that is very, very, very quickly, because it's a very, very, very complicated system. You cannot untangle all the pieces, okay, to have a good grasp of the entire process to see are they, are they interlinked, are they interconnected to each, you know, with each other. It's a very complex system. So we cannot w just wash into it w and come up uh, with uh, results that are not gonna satisfy or that's not, that are not going to address some of the problems. So therefore, we, you know, we have to approach this methodic, method, uh, in a way that is very methodic. And uh, so I think a little patience would, uh, is, uh, is, is needed at this point in time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, the Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman Vigrodzinczyk. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, Commissioner, I just want to follow up a little bit on uh, what my colleague Keith Powers um, and just to emphasize, it, it's an issue that really affects his district, which is the east side of Manhattan, and my district, which is, I think, close to where you live, yes. uh, <laughs> in eastern Queens, where we have um, lots and lots of single-family homeowners who are slowly being taxed out of uh, their ability to, to live in New York City, especially uh, seniors who, in many cases, I, I was a 102nd birthday party the other day for a woman who's been living on practically the last street in Queens County, um, since about 1954. Yeah. She hasn't moved. I guess she likes the neighborhood. Hmm. Um, but um, we need speed here because this is something, and I, I do thank the mayor for grappling with this issue. I know this is something our speaker has pushed as well, and um, I really do hope, I just want to emphasize, that we are able to get this into the next legislative session in Albany because it's going to be a big fight no matter what. But we have got to, um, I want to be on the record very clearly, Mr. Chairman, we have got to, to work especially with our co-ops and condos, our middle-income co-ops who are just getting uh, killed with taxes. And, um, you know, in some cases, I've talked to people, 80 or 90 percent of their, of their charge every month is just to pay New York City property taxes, and that's just not fair. So um, thank you for your work. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with you, and I'm going to turn this well. back. Um, to my colleague, uh, my chairman, Danny Drum. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about the PEG. Uh, OMB has set a savings target of $10 million for DOF. Um, has the agency determined how this will be achieved? Uh, yes, we've been working with OMB. We submitted that PEG uh, program to OMB, savings support to OMB, yes. Have uh, any of those decisions uh, that have been made um, uh, hurt any of the current programs? Will they be cut? It's, uh, on our hand, it was, we're looking at more as uh, a revenue, uh, on the revenue side. I'm sorry, as a what? On the revenue side. Uh -huh. Okay, on the revenue side. So I tried to come up with mm -hmm. that $10 million revenue instead of $10 million in savings. Mm -hmm. All right, let me go back a little bit to um, screen injury. What is the target for screen injury processing times? Why is it so far above the actuals over the last few years? The, uh, for screen injury, I think uh, we, uh, went, we just went through a major restructuring of the operations. We just merged uh, uh, the she and Z units with uh, the SQUI injury units so that we could have some synergy, okay, for all the seniors and all uh, uh, um, uh, people with disabilities program. So in the process, we had to cross-train all our staff so they could process applications for SQUI and also process applications for GE so we could have the economies of scales and efficiency that we need to have. So that's the reason why we, you see some, a, a little drop in terms of uh, the cycle time for a renewal for, uh, for SQUI and GE. But again, as I said, uh, over time, we're gonna gain significantly by having the staff, 
okay, being able to process both she and the and squee and you at the same time. So I'm expecting that uh, the cycle time to reverse back to its normal course. In fiscal 2018, she and G, DOF received over 21,000 applications, but it's only on track to receive less than half of that this year. Uh, do you expect applicants to continue spiking every other every other year due to the two-year renewal? The uh, last year, the special circumstances last year, as you know, we raised the income threshold to 50 uh, something thousand dollars. And as a result, there were a lot of people who were not previously qualified into the program that become qualified into the program. So that's the reason, that's what explained the spikes that you had uh, last year. Uh, I'm hoping that going forward, we could see uh, more, inc more people participate in the program. As I said, we have a very uh, ambitious outreach uh, program to try to bring as many people as possible into the program. And uh, we're working, we've been working with all the council members and other elected officials in their districts, basically to try to enroll as many people as we can. So there were some shocking wait times for she and G applications last year. Is DOF 100% through that backlog now? Yes, we, we clear all that backlog. As I said, because we had a huge increase, because the increase on the, uh, in the, uh, and the threshold resulted in a very big increase in the number of applicants. So, so that's what we had that backlog last year, but we, we, we got rid of that you backlog. you believe everyone who's eligible we, we, has been notified and is getting it? Uh, hopefully, yes. Okay. Right. Um, how many employees at DOF work on outreach regarding rent freeze, NOPV, and exemptions? Uh, we have the outreach team. They work on all aspects, you know, whether it's NOPV exemption and uh, and uh, with screen G, all all the outreach efforts. So it's the same team, and I believe we have eight. We have about eight people just doing doing just that. Eleven total. Okay. So this and they have in they are in high demand. As you can imagine, they, uh, every elected official wants to have an event in their district, so uh, it's uh, their very task. So according to DOF, she and D enrollment for fiscal 18 was just over 43,000 and 3,000. However, in fiscal 2017, these numbers were over 2,000 and 4,000. This drop occurred alongside a program expansion in fiscal 2018. Can you explain that drop? Say it again. So in, um, according to DOF, she and D, enrollment for fiscal 18 was over 43,000 and, and 3,000. However, in fiscal 2017, these numbers were 52,000 and, and 4,000. Oh. So the drop occurred alongside a program expansion. Yeah, what happened is uh, uh, for 10 years, we did not have a renewal program for 10 years, okay, with the program. So we had a lot of people, and we were audited by the comptroller's office, and one of the conclusions of the, uh, of, the, of the audit was that we had a lot of people who were in the program who were not qualified, were not eligible to be in the program. So when we started the renewal effort to, uh, about two years ago, that's when we lost uh, some of these people, because to begin with, they were not eligible. So even though we had 53,000, many of them were not eligible. Uh, regarding NOPVs, can you explain some of the outreach you did in, re in redesigning the form? Um, well, we, uh, once we designed the form, uh, we've been going all in all boards, you know, as I indicated to you, and uh, to discuss uh, the um, new design to get feedback uh, from uh, the public. And, uh, and uh, again, as I said, I'm sorry that we didn't reach out to uh, the council, to work with the council to get uh, input from the council, it's an oversight on our part. Uh, but uh, we reach out to folks, get feedback from them. Again, it's a, it's a, it's a continuously improving process. It, it, it's not the, the, the last time we're gonna change uh, the NOPV because even with the new one, as we get feedback and input from the public, we're gonna take them into, take them into account to continuously improve uh, that process. Because our goal is basically to make it as simple as po possible so that people understand are the taxes computed? Because this is a big, big, big question for a lot of folks. And uh, so we have tried to be as transparent as possible. So we're going to continuously improve uh, that NOPV on an annual basis. This is not going to be the last time, 
okay? And As we get feedback from the public, we're gonna try to incorporate those feedback into our account. And if you, got, if you also have feedback from your uh, uh, constituents, please share them with us, because we'll be more than happy to receive them, to evaluate them and incorporate them into the next round. And, and what has the feedback been like? What, what have you been hearing? It's, it, I think more, more, good than, more good than bad, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, uh, we are getting fewer uh, uh, complaints, uh, fewer calls going to uh, 311 asking for explanation compared to previous years, which is a good sign. But again, you still have some people not, you know, for some people it's still not clear. And as I indicate to people all the time, one of the challenges that we have is the law itself. Because you could go from the market value to the assets value. The challenge that we have, once you get to the cap assets value, it is hard to explain to somebody, okay? The notion of the 6% average, you know, how it goes over time, you know, how you hold it out into five years, it becomes extremely difficult for people to move from market value to assets value to cap value. That's what the problem is. And so we're trying our best to make it clear, but uh, at the end of the day, we're gonna have to, again, as I said, uh, um, that's probably one of the reasons why reform is needed to make certain things very transparent. Because otherwise, uh, as long as certain laws are in the book, it would be extremely difficult to make them easy for people to really understand uh, the NOPP. But our goal, again, as I said, is to try to be as transparent as possible, to make it as clear as possible. But, uh, uh, and to the extent that uh, we get feedback from the public and from elected officials, we will take them into account and incorporate them to try to make it as uh, easy as possible. And uh, before we let you go, Commissioner, um, I wanted to ask you about Local Law 45, which went through this committee. It was my legislation, authored uh, the new installment plans, um, and it was, went into effect on March 1st. Have you um, heard any information about that, how it's been, have people applied, is it getting out to the public? As, as you know, this is a program, this is a very new program, it's, very, uh, it's a very important program for us because we believe that is, uh, um, with property values going up, increasing annually, uh, property tax, one way or another, will keep rising, okay? And uh, we have uh, many people who are basically income poor, but house rich, who cannot afford okay, property tax. And one way for us to deal with this is to offer them the opportunity, opportunity to defer, to some extent, uh, some of the tax, or all the taxes, that, uh, as long as, for as long as they, they, they can. Um, so right now we have very few participants at this point in time. And uh, based on what we hear from around the country where this uh, program is available, outreach is critical. We have to do a lot of outreach. And that's why I'm, I'm saying we're gonna have to work with the city council members. But I think one of the reasons why we don't have a lot of takers at this point in time is because of the lean sale period. We have not started, begin, we have not begun the lean sales period yet. We have not sent any notice. So we expect, when we start sending notices to people, we expect a pickup in the number of applicants that will participate in the program. But more importantly, we think that outreach is critical and we're gonna have to work with a lot of folks to get the words out in their communities. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of interest at a community meeting that I attended where I spoke good. about it. And, oh, good. Um, People really, you know, wanted to get, you know, to know more information about it. Good. Do you have any flyers or anything on it? We do. We do. We have a lot of literature that we could share with you. Again, as I said, uh, we will send, make sure that we send, all, you know, all the flyers, all the literature that we have to all to the council, so you at least you could share with your members. That would be very helpful. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I just want to say we've been joined by Councilmember Moya also. Thank you for joining us, and I think that's going to be it for this hearing. I uh, thank you for your coming in and for giving testimony, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, pleasure. We'll just take a five minute break, and then we'll start with the next one, next hearing on DDC.
Good morning, everyone. We're going to ask everyone to find seats. We are going to begin and reconvene momentarily. Once again, if you could find seats at this time. Okay, good morning and welcome to the last day of the Council's Fiscal 2020 Preliminary Budget Hearings. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, chaired by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. We just heard from the Department of Finance and now we'll hear testimony from Lorraine Grillo, the Commissioner of the Department of Design and Construction. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but I will turn the mic over to Chair Gibson for her remarks and then we will hear from DDC. Thank you, Chair Drum. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson. I am proud to serve as chair of the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget. I want to begin by thanking my fellow co-chair, our chair on Committee on Finance, Council Member Danny Drum, and also the members of the Committee on Finance, as well as our Subcommittee on Capital. And today we welcome Commissioner Lorraine Grillo to discuss the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget of the Department of Design and Construction. Commissioner Grillo, 
Council has frequently praised your leadership as you also head up the School Construction Authority and really noted the authority's strong capital delivery, particularly relative to other city agencies. Your portfolio has grown considerably since your second appointment last July as Commissioner of DDC. So we hope that you are able to bring similar discipline to DDC and are encouraged by the recently released strategic blueprint for construction excellence. You are very busy, and we know that. Uh, in fiscal 2018, DDC completed 132 construction projects. In fiscal 2019, DDC has added an additional $1.7 billion in projects since the fiscal 2019 adopted budget which represents more than a 20% increase. In fact, DDC's portfolio of projects has grown every year since the council created the agency. Looking ahead, the fiscal 2020 preliminary capital commitment plan includes $10.2 billion in fiscal 2019 through 2023 for DDC's work on behalf of its client agencies, which represents more than 12% of the city's overall total planned capital commitments. I want to pull out two specific challenges that are facing DDC as it currently manages this vast pipeline of capital work. The first is how varied these projects are in terms of scale, from massive sewer projects for DEP to smaller projects such as playground renovations. The council wants to make sure that DDC has the resources it needs, as well as focus on necessary to maintain progress on every project and to not neglect the smaller projects which are equally as important. Many of those smaller capital projects are projects that the city council members have funded out of our own discretionary capital funds. The second challenge for DDC is executing the design build authority that Albany has granted for the borough-based jail program, as you know, which is currently underway. The city council has long championed design build as a procurement tool, and many of us are frustrated by the state's unwillingness to grant us blanket design build authority across all projects and across all city agencies. We are a work in progress to continue to get that to happen. We want to make sure that DDC is truly successful with design build and would especially appreciate any ideas and suggestions that you have about how you would use expanded design build authority and what kind of savings of time and money that might enable as we move forward. Um, I also want to join uh, Chair Drum in thanking our incredible finance division led by Latanya McKinney and all of our unit heads and all of our analysts for all of the work they've done. And I want to thank the members of the subcommittee, uh, Minority Leader Steve Matteo, Council Member Barry Gradenchik, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, and Council Member Keith Powers. And I look forward to hearing your testimony today, this afternoon, and look forward to our work together on behalf of all New Yorkers. And now I turn this back over to our chair, Chair Danny Drum. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask Council to swear in the panel. Do you, do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. Thank you. You may begin. Okay. Well, good afternoon, Chairman Drum, Chair Gibson, and members of the committee. My name is Lorraine Grillo, and I'm happy to appear before this committee for the first time in my role as Commissioner of the New York City De Department of Design and Construction. I'm joined today by members of DDC's leadership team. To my right is First Deputy Commissioner Jamie Torres Springer. To my left is our Chief Financial Officer, Justin Walker. DDC's preliminary capital commitment plan continues to grow, with more than $8 billion in new commitments over the next decade. As DDC continues to implement Mayor de Blasio's equitable infrastructure investment strategy, we also have a mandate to find ways to design and deliver those projects more efficiently. We have to change the way we do business to deliver more projects more reliably. We must manage capital projects better and more transparently, deliver them faster and keep costs down. We're changing how we do business and I'll share some of that, of that process with you today. 
As the city's primary capital construction manager, DDC builds on behalf of more than 20 city agencies and receives capital funding from a number of sources. The January capital commitment plan contains $3.1 billion in new planned commitments in FY 2020 for DDC across its portfolio. This includes $950 million for DEP projects, $1.2 billion for DOT projects, $81 million for library projects, and $253 million for sanitation projects. The commitment plan also fully funds the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, adding an additional $690 million in fiscal year 2020 through 2022 to allow us to complete this critical project on time. DDC's fiscal 20 operating budget is $182 million. This includes $136 million for personnel services with a budgeted headcount of 1,489. The operating budget includes $139.6 million in IFA funds, $13.2 million in federal funds, and $29.5 million in city funds. The DDC budget also includes $46.6 million for other than personnel services. DDC was created in 1996 and since then has completed almost 4,500 projects across the city, worth nearly $21 billion. In FY18 alone, the last full years of data we have, DDC started design on 137 projects and construction on 143 projects. We also completed design on 143 pro projects, completed design on 143 projects and construction on another 133. We have hundreds of other projects cycling through DDC in every stage of execution. DDC works in virtually every neighborhood in the city before the eyes of millions of New Yorkers. Some recent projects include the completely rebuilt Staten Island Zoo Aquarium, which we finished six months ahead of schedule, bringing new educational opportunities for students and young visitors. The new Far Rockaway Library, a game-changing public space, broke ground in November and will more than double library capacity in a neighborhood hit hard by Hurricane Sandy. In the Bronx, near Pugsley Creek, we are installing a massive $83 million sewer to divert overflow that was running into the creek, helping restore and beautify the natural areas nearby. At the new Fowler Square in Fort Greene, DDC introduced 4,500 square feet of brand new pedestrian space for the neighborhood. And in Washington Heights, we are upgrading century-old water mains on 50 blocks throughout the neighborhood. I'm also proud to report that in October, Mayor de Blasio singled out DDC as the top performing agency in the city's MWBE program. We've awarded more than $1 billion to MWBE firms since 2015. Between 15 and FY18, our overall MD MWBE utilization rate has increased from just under 10% to 23%. DDC continues working to improve our practices and develop vendor capacity so that we use and retain even more MWBE businesses. Since fiscal year 2015, we have hosted 24 procurement events and attended more than 150 others, engaging more than 6,000 MWBE firms. But we know more needs to be done. This is why we are creating a new business development unit that will reduce entry barriers for MWBEs who want to do business with us. Our effort to improve project delivery goes much further. When I arrived at DDC last summer, it was clear that I was working with an incredibly talented staff, but one held back by layers of policies and red tape that we just don't have in the School Construction Authority. So I asked for an agency-wide review 
to look for ways that we can deliver projects to New Yorkers faster and more cost efficiently. This effort is more important than ever because the value of capital commitments coming to DDC has more than doubled over 10 years, while our headcount has not increased to reflect that dramatic growth. In January, with the assistance of our, assistance of our government and industry partners, we released DDC's Strategic Blueprint, Blueprint for Construction Excellence, a far-reaching plan to transform how we deliver projects to New York. The, the Blueprint offers a long list of common sense fixes to streamline how DDC reviews and accepts projects and get them into construction, enhance our project management to run projects more efficiently, raise performance standards for consultants and contractors using improved metrics, incentives, and enforcement tools, and modernize DDC's information technology and internal systems to standardize how we track, measure, and manage projects. Let me, just, let me offer just a few examples. A lot of work is going into all of them, and we're happy to offer more details at the end of my testimony. Let me start with project initiation. In the past, DDC accepted projects with questionable scopes and funding levels because there was no standard for what was acceptable. This is just a formula for failure. Today, DDC's front-end planning unit carefully reviews sponsor proposals, all the factors that impact feasibility, and the cost and time it would actually take to execute. This back and forth has led to some hard conversations, but it has also produced clearer scopes and more realistic budget es estimates, helping us avoid potential delays down the line. Front-end planning has proved so successful that we are working with OMB to expand it in, the, in this year's budget so that ultimately all projects coming to DDC will be reviewed. After a project has been through front-end planning, we are taking a series of step, steps to shrink the time it takes to go from project submission to a certificate to proceed from 15 months to nine. After the CP is issued and the project is underway, one of the great challenges we face is coordination with utilities whose infrastructure may interfere with our projects. Moving it can add literally months or even years to a project. With the mayor's office, we are aggressively working with our utility partners to change this paradigm. We have also created a construction allowance and change order task force. All the units involved in the payment process now sit together in one office so that a payment request doesn't go from one desk to another for sign-offs. The task force is already producing results. This effort gives hand, goes hand in hand with another major challenge, an extra work allowance pilot program underway between the city and the controller's office to begin paying for project changes more quickly. We're not there yet, but the pieces are in place internally and with our oversights to get payments out in three months, down from a year, and keep work moving. I've been talking a lot about process, but we are also developing the talent to execute it. We have started in-depth project management training to empower our managers to make quick decisions to keep projects moving forward. We are aggressively pushing for more project delivery options like design build that eliminate steps in the procurement process and ensure collaboration. Albany has given us permission to use design build for the borough-based jails program, but imagine if we could use it for the next step street, museum, or library like everywhere else in the country, saving money and getting projects to New Yorkers faster and more cost efficiently. We are also dedicating significant resources to transforming our IT systems, helping us manage and, and track projects better, and enabling staff and contractors to work more effectively in the field. <coughs> Excuse me. 
This is only a broad outline of a comprehensive, detailed suite of improvements underway at DDC. These efforts are already in the works, and we will continue to advance them and track them aggressively. I encourage you to read our blueprint, which you should have received a copy of. This effort will require collaboration with the Council and other oversights with our sponsor agencies and the communities where we work, but it's well worth it and we're committed to seeing it through. I'm very proud of the work DDC does to improve the quality of life of our city, and we look forward to becoming an even better partner in the process. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer question, any questions you and your colleagues may have. Thank you very much. Uh, before we get started with questions, I just want to make sure everybody's been announced. We've been joined by Council Member Lori Cumbo, Council Member Adrian Adams, Council Member Keith Powers, Council Member Francisco Moya, Council Member Barry Gudenchik, and I think we announced everybody else. So thank you. Um, let me just start by asking some uh, questions about program management consultant. Um, the fiscal 2020 preliminary plan includes city funds of $4.5 million for fiscal 2019 and $11.5 million for fiscal 2020 for the program management consultant for the borough-based jail program. Correct. From what I know or how I understand it, the PMC will manage the four design build contracts for the four borough-based facilities. Um, but for the benefit of the committee, could you elaborate more on the nature of uh, the contract with the PMC? What specifically will be their role and the scope of responsibilities? Sure, uh, happy to. And of course, uh, First Deputy Commissioner Jamie Torres has been uh, intimately involved in this process. So I'm just going to give you an overview and Jamie can get into more detail. Uh, the PMC, as we call it, is a critical component. It's adding the expertise Managing, with managing complex design build procurements. Remember, we've not done this before as the city develops its related design build procurements. And subsequently, the PMC will manage the four design build contracts for the four borough based facilities. If you want to <coughs> add to that, Jamie. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, the, right, so the, the uh, borough-based jails program is a major multi-year endeavor that requires concentrated project management attention, um, very significant projects, uh, so we'll need that expertise. The program manager, in addition to what the commissioner said, um, uh, will bring in expertise from across the country uh, because executing a design-build project for the city in this first instance is a really important opportunity for us to demonstrate its effectiveness. And so we do need to go and bring in this national, in some cases international expertise uh, to be able to execute it. Uh, that program manager also will have expertise on building humane uh, borough-based or community-based jail facilities, uh, which again is a major shift for the city as we close Rikers and look at building these facilities, and so we'll have expertise from that program manager to be able to do that as well. So will those program managers um, be deciding, uh, you know, will there be community space within the borough-based jails? Uh, will they be deciding, um, you know, how the construction is actually done? I'm just a little confused as to exactly what type of role they're actually going to have. Right, um, I think that, those kinds of decisions are going to be part of really our community-based uh, interaction. We're not going to give, leave it up to a particular contractor of any kind to make those decisions. Those are decisions we need to make with the community, with the elected officials, and, and on the design of these uh, projects. And then the program manager will be the person who will Ex decide to, how to implement that or oversee the implementation. That's correct. Of it. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about path of travel. Um, you're likely quite familiar with this uh, because of, um, of your work and your other role. Um, but uh, these requirements stipulate that alterations are made to a primary function area up to 20% of the project's eligible, eligible cost must be used to make the path of travel to that area accessible. Mm -hmm. 
Has DDC estimated how much it will cost to comply with this requirement for projects in the proposed fiscal 2019 to 2023 five-year capital plan? I don't have an overall number, uh, council member. I, um, it's, it's my understanding, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm diving deeply into that. As you know, I have that experience of, at the SEA and we are really working, we have to work very hard with our sponsor agencies to, to have them look at this real and do a deep dive into what that cost will be. Uh, each project is different. There are certain components of a project that require the path of travel uh, stipulation. Other parts of a project do not. So it's very, very complex, but, but we will certainly work on that. So are those agencies bringing this issue to you or are you bringing it to them? Um, how, how is that happening? I think we work collaboratively on that. As we go through our front end planning process, this issue comes up and, and throughout front end planning, we are discussing the project with the sponsor agency. So it's collaborative. So will the cost of it uh, reduce the number of projects that are um, uh, eligible to be completed? Um, I personally don't believe it will be significant because as, I, as I've said, uh, we've implemented this at the SCA. Um, it's, it's, it's a complex process because there are certain mechanical systems that don't apply. Uh, other pieces of a project that are not required, it's not as significant as you, one would expect. So would you have to um, look at uh, past projects or projects in the process of being completed or just projects moving forward? It's, it's my understanding it's projects moving forward. Moving forward. Okay, and uh, with the PEG, the administration announced the program to eliminate the gap targets for all city agencies in order to achieve $750 million in savings between fiscal 19 and fiscal 20. Um, OMB has set DDC's target at 2.4 million, which is approximately 5% of DDC's city funded budget in both fiscal 19 and fiscal 20. Uh, what savings has a DDC proposed to OMB? And will those proposed cuts affect agency operations? I'm going to turn this over to Justin Walker. Uh, hi, Justin Walter, CFO, DDC. Um, so in comparison to our overall budget, this is not a e extremely large um, savings reduction target. Uh, we basically looked across our city funded accounts and we have some smaller other than personal services and uh, contracts that we, we have some accruals built up. Um, and then on the city, uh, on the PS budget side, the same as well, because we're not fully staffed up in certain components. So we've identified the savings, uh, shared them with OMB, and we don't think it's gonna have a large impact on our operations. Will you be able to go beyond the, um, the proposed amount? At the moment, we're just achieving the proposed amount. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. I'm going to ask uh, Councilmember Gibson because she has a lot of questions for you. We always want you to aim high. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, Commissioner, for being here. And, and certainly in my opening, I talked a lot about, you know, some of the things that uh, are happening, particularly at DDC and where we see the areas of, of growth. Um, and I definitely think the release of the strategic blueprint is going to be the path where we can create much more efficiency and, and in terms of timeline of capital projects. So specifically, I wanted to ask a few questions related to the strategic blueprint. Um, the first of the four main themes of the plan is really about improving the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And the key of the initiative is really about the expansion of DDC's front end planning unit that was established in 2016. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, what has been the difference in timelines between the projects that have been received in the front end planning unit versus those that have not? Because you talked about expanding. So there is a process by which projects are reviewed by the front, um, the front end planning unit. So have you noticed a difference between that unit and the projects that are not reviewed by that unit? Right, we, we are beginning to see a difference. I can't give you, um a specific timeline, but I will tell you this. I think what's important to note is the project does not start, our involvement is no longer starting at front end planning. We are working with our sponsor agencies 
before the project actually comes over to our front end planning unit. We know them, we work with them very carefully. We can sit with them as they decide on a particular project and give them some ideas as to estimates and timelines and the like. And so we're having those conversations early on. And then when a project actually comes to fruition, it comes over to our front end planning folks. There is a dialogue back and forth uh, with the sponsor agency. For example, um, we may say a particular heating system is um, not appropriate. We're the experts in this. Our folks are the experts. It's not appropriate. It will take too long to build. It is not energy efficient. All of those things. That's our job. We should counsel them. We should give them the appropriate estimate and timeline before we accept that project completely into our um, a portfolio. So, have I? Do can I define for you a specific time frame? Not yet. We'll okay. get there. Okay. And when you actually receive the project initiation document from the particular agency, are you able to reject that request, or do you have to take that particular project? I have asked the staff to no longer accept a project that we do not believe is a buildable and be funded appropriately. Okay, okay. Um, within the unit, how are projects prioritized? Because you said you're in active discussions with OMB on expanding the front end unit, um, but today, with all of the projects you received, how do you prioritize? Is there a system of metrics that you use to determine which projects should be given more priority over the other? Yeah, we, it, as I just chatted with uh, the first deputy commissioner, at this point in time, we do not have that prioritization. What we do is take, in, take on as many as we possibly can. Okay, and then you mentioned that not all projects you accept because you recognize whether it's the project amount or even the scope of work may not be feasible. Do you work with that? member agency Absolutely. on feedback? Okay, you do. Absolutely. Okay, okay. Uh, the second theme in the blueprint is really to manage projects more efficiently and effectively. And in order to do so, it's really necessary to have a detailed tracking of all of the capital projects. So I wanted to ask specifically for DDC, how are you currently tracking your projects to date? Well, we are in the process right now, and before I began at DDC, uh, our technology group was in the process of creating those um, systems that would allow us to track these projects uh, carefully. One of them um, right now is a system we call Benchmark, which really basically uh, gives detail on every single project that we have, uh, whatever the latest uh, information is. Um, and again, we're still perfecting that, we're still working on that, but that's just one of the systems that we've been working on to, to get up and running. Uh, we're working on a payment system. There are a number of IT improvements that we are working on in order to, to make this flow more efficiently. Okay, has the system yet identified some of the reasons for delays in capital projects? Yes, because that information is input into that system. It's going to tell you what is happening. For example, if I'm in the midst of a sewer project and we come across a utility and we notify the utility that they have to move their systems, we know where that sits. We know what we're waiting for and when, when we gave them that information. So we'll be able to to be able to tell where those problems lie, whether it's our problem or the problem of utility or other uh, source. Okay, um, who currently has access to Benchmark outside of DDC? It's an internal process. Okay, so would you be willing to work with the city council uh, as you continue to execute the blueprint um, in terms of accessing information and data through Benchmark? Sure, actually, um, one of your colleagues had, had a um, request to put a system into place that's very similar to the system that the SEA has that like is that easily accessible. And I'm hoping to be able to provide something very, very similar. Obviously, 
it's going to take time. These things don't happen overnight. But now that we understand the council's requests and the requests for information, we'll be able to draw from the other systems that we have and put something together. Again, I keep saying this, but it's going to take a little while. We're, we're on the road. Okay, I understand. I appreciate us being on the yeah. road. Um, also, I wanted to ask with Benchmark and some of the work that you're doing to expand it, do you think that there is a possibility that that would be tied to the city's financial management system, F FMS, um, so that projects can be linked to the budget so that there's more of an overlap and interagency coordination? Um, right, so uh, council member, the, as part of the, the commissioner was referring to a multi-year uh, multi-million dollar information technology overhaul at the agency. So as part of that, we're going to be working with the Mayor's Office of Contract Services on the development of their okay. passport system, uh, which is where the main financial linkage occurs. But part of our expansion of our system is also uh, to create a project data management system, and that will also be tied in. And the main advantage of that for the agency is to be able to facilitate prompt payments to contractors, mm -hmm. um, which, as we've identified in the strategic blueprint, is one of the major things that holds us back. Um, we need to be able to get contractors paid so that they can work in a more expeditious manner. Okay. And, and, and if I may, in addition to that, uh, it, getting our, project, our contractors paid, particularly <laughs> as it relates to MWBE con small contractors. Um, okay. So that's a very, very critical piece for us. Okay. Um, the next part of the plan is to uh, get more out of contractors and construction managers. Um, and I understand that DDC has started consolidating a request for proposal development for evaluation and fee negotiation. Can you explain in terms of what that looks like and the cost and how much you think you would save by implementing such a measure? Do you want to speak a little bit about the new system? So, okay. so in, in terms of um, the RFP process um, and uh, a lot of basically the procurement functions, uh, we are pulling into our agency chief contracting office shop. Um, and we are building out capacity and the expertise within the ACO shop. Um, some of these processes were sort of outside of the ACO shop and we're sort of marrying that together with overall systems development to improve coordination and collaboration within the agency. You know, to put a dollar figure on what, what we, we think we can save um, is a little challenging. Um, I think in terms of process, there's a lot of time savings in, the terms, in terms of process that we'll be able to save through better coordination and collaboration. Okay, and Commissioner, you mentioned in your testimony uh, the creation of the Construction Allowance and Change Order Task Force. So that's existing staff that's been merged together in essentially one unit? That's correct. Okay, and then overall you talked about uh, just managing more contracts, right, over the last several years, but not necessarily raising headcount. Um, is that something that the agency is requesting this year in terms of looking at headcount? or you're going to manage with what you have? Well, there are major, major projects coming up, as you well know, yes. uh, the East Side Coastal Resiliency uh, mega project. We have the, the um, off Rikers uh, jail projects and, and that sort of thing. So there will be staffing attached to that, additional okay. staffing. Additional, okay. I wanted to ask about the capital discretionary program. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening, really important for many of us in the city council, particularly those of us who are leaving soon, to get a lot of these capital projects up off the ground and running. Um, the smaller projects are very important for us, anything from a mobile unit purchase to the renovation of a park or a playground. So I wanted to ask about DDC's process for non-city projects from the inception to the completion. So you said every project is important, but for those of us that are working with our local not-for-profits where we provide a capital, how are you managing those particular projects as well as prioritizing them? Well, and I'm going to use this opportunity to introduce everybody to uh, the uh, DDC's general counsel, David Veroli, who manages a, a number of these discretionary projects particularly when it comes to the purchases, like you said, a mobile unit and that sort of thing. And uh, 
if I may, David, would you just join us to explain in more detail? Good, good morning, one. Good morning. Uh, just uh, can we uh, swear you in? Sure. Uh, do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chair Gibson. So I just want to make one clarification. The discretionary capital program that DDC manages does not involve the actual construction of the items that are placed into the budget. That is handled by the Economic Development Corporation, EDC. That was made pursuant to an agreement between this finance committee um, and OMB. So DDC is responsible for working on projects in which funding is given to not-for-profits for the purchases of equipment, uh, vehicles, and office type uh, merchandise. Right. The actual construction is done by EDC. Okay. Okay. So even, okay, thank you for the clarification. Sure. Now even with the purchasing of the mobile units and other equipment mm -hmm. that you described, what does that process look like in terms of timeliness, efficiency, communication with the local uh, not-for-profit? What does that look like and what does the unit um, that you particularly oversee in terms of staffing, what does that look like as well? Okay, so the, the unit uh, is run or chaired by an individual by the name of Bruce Rudolph. I hope some of you, if not all of you, have met and dealt with him. Uh, Bruce has been doing this now for over 10 years. Um, before joining DDC, he started at the health department, also working on these projects. Okay. Bruce oversees two other individuals um, that work with him, and the process is fairly straightforward, though I understand it's extremely complicated. Um, the process of giving capital dollars to not-for-profits uh, requires a number of legal requirements to satisfy the bond council requirements. And so what we have done is we have put together a manual. Um, we have actually pr done presentations and we will always make the offer to do more presentations, uh, whether it's within your own staff, your own committee, and of course with the various not-for-profits. Um, but from the moment it's placed in the budget, when we get the budget information towards the end of the summer, early September, the first thing Bruce and his team does is they reach out to each of the individual not-for-profits that are placed in the budget. He offers them and sends to them basically a, um, an e-file that includes not only the forms that we have worked out with Bond Council and have worked with the Finance Committee staff, but also a checklist. I'm a huge, huge believer in checklists, and so we've created a checklist for each and everything that they have to do um, as they work through the process. Uh, I'll be the first to tell you, though, the process is extremely, extremely complicated, uh, and while I love my fellow lawyers and want them to be employed, it definitely is, it makes a lot of work and money for lawyers because there's so many things that they have to do that I don't think the not-for-profits are used to doing when maybe they get grants from other organizations. And again, that goes because it's capital money versus expense money. So that's really, I think, the biggest issue. Um, and you know, we definitely, we work great with Nathan, who's fantastic on the Finance Committee staff. We work very closely with Bond Council. We are always looking to find ways to improve that process because we understand of the complications uh, dealing with the not-for-profits. Okay, I appreciate that and I definitely want to uh, recognize it is challenging. We hear from a lot of our not-for-profits about frustration in, during this process. So as we move forward, while this specifically is not a part of the overall blueprint, but certainly very, very important to us to make sure that these projects are moving forward and we address any of the gaps in the system. Um, so I would love to keep talking about that. Um, I don't know how many projects are currently in the portfolio, but to hear, you know, Mr. Randolph and a team of two um, is a little concerning for me. Okay. Um, and so I want to keep talking about that moving forward. Sure. I would just like to say um, that in fiscal year 18, we um, registered 26 contracts for approximately $8.2 million. Okay. Um, this year, right now, as of March 27th, we have already registered 28 contracts, uh, um, a little bit over 11.3 million, and we, have, we believe we're gonna have at least four more um, get to the controller's office before the end of the fiscal year for registration. So this small little unit is an incredibly hardworking, efficient unit, and like I said, it's not so much, I think, adding more staff, though I'm not going to be the one to say I don't want more staff, but I can honestly tell you it's, it's really the paperwork and documents. When we hand over the binder to the not-for-profit, we need them to really focus and spend the time and maybe have a champion on their side 
in addition to a legal champion to help them walk through that process. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to our chair. Just as a follow-up, um, if, uh, if I can just, just hold you there for one minute. Sure. So, did you say that there is, uh, uh, that D uh, D DDC does not have a role in nonprofit construction uh, capital funds? When the council um, gives direct money to a not-for-profit to build, say, a new addition to their facility, no, we do not. That, that There's is no sign-off by DDC on anything? No, we're, we're not involved in the budget process at all. We're not involved in the questionnaire and how the not-for-profits are selected for the budget, both on the equipment and vehicles as well as the construction. There were a number of legal issues when the program was first being discussed between your committee and OMB, and the decision at the time was made because of all this work was being done on non-city property that it was more appropriate for EDC to deal with those projects and to allow us to just focus on the goods and the equipment and the vehicles. Okay. okay. I, I thought, no, I just thought at one time I was dealing with the Irish Arts Center, to be honest with you, and I thought there had to be some type of a sign-off by um, DDC before that it can go before EDC. I, I can look in, was that was the Irish Arts Center? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll look into it and I will it's get back. It's done and it all worked oh. out, but it's just... Okay. I was, Are you happy with it? <laughs> yes. Good. Okay. <laughs> Got to fight for the Irish, you know? <laughs> I'm married to one, so I understand. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, we have questions now from Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Powers, and we've been joined by Councilmember Lander and Cohen. Okay. Councilmember Powers. I'll echo your sentiment on the Irish. Um, uh, thank you, and thank you for the thank you for the testimony. I want to follow up on the uh, east Co the east side coastal resiliency with a few questions and note that your staff did do a, um, a, a fantastic town hall with my constituents last night or a meeting uh, with the tennis association to, to discuss that, so I want to thank the staff for being there. Um, just to clarify, we had a hearing here two months ago, a month ago, about that, and I had asked a question. I want to clarify on nighttime construction work around the east side, coastal resiliency, particularly near Stuyvesant Cove Park and near where a number of folks in my district live, and I think there, so to get clarity, do we know today what the hours will be and what the nighttime work will happen around Stuyvesant Cove Park? Exactly. Thanks, Council Member. Yes, um, happy to clarify. So um, th the predominance of the project uh, is uh, in the area of East River Park, which we now have an engineering approach that will allow us to deliver that, doing the heavy construction work out at the water's edge, which allows us to avoid nighttime work. Um, uh, except in cases where we're trying to accelerate construction, but again, that's out at the water's edge. Um, the uh, outside of that area and within uh, your district, uh, including Stuyvesant and Cove Park, uh, we're still needing to do some construction work adjacent to the FDR, which requires uh, nighttime closures. Um, however, uh, we did look into that after the hearing that we had, and the primary area where we would be doing nighttime work is really adjacent to the Con Ed plant. We're not expecting major nighttime work uh, with heavy construction, with pile driving uh, adjacent, directly adjacent to buildings that are in your district. And we do have a, a map that demonstrates that. I don't have it with me today, unfortunately, but we, we're happy to, uh, we reviewed it with your staff, we're happy to review it again and okay. go through exactly where we see those impacts. But it is a very minimal, if any, area where it would be immediately adjacent to residents. And I know I've asked this a couple of times, so I'm sorry to be repetitive, but um, what we found with the L train, which is the most immediate thing on, on all of our minds, is that we had all these conversations around mitigation for traffic and other things, and we um, found out things about hours and construction, real life examples outside of people's windows <coughs> that, that caused a lot of chaos and concern amongst people there. And I, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna end up uh, with folks calling us to finding out there was at midnight there's you know, stuff happening. So I, we can sit down and talk about that as well. Um, can you give an update just on the East River Park? There's still, I know, conversations around phasing. Has that come to, because we're coming to ULERP in the next, I think, month or so. Is there, a, um, is there an answer, is sort of an update on where they are on in terms of how they can phase the closures of the East River? East River Park. Uh, sure. So um, the so the the closure of East River Park is a decision, definitely not taken lightly. It's a very important recreational resource. What we found was um, 
very concerned about the safety of potential park users while we're trying to undertake construction and also to get this done as quickly as possible. And we've managed to reduce the overall construction time to three and a half years. Uh, from five previously, we really need to be able to stage in the park. So that's the reason for it. Um, we're, uh, we've been directed uh, very strongly to uh, look at all measures we can take to mitigate that impact. That includes a, an interim recreation strategy that's being developed by the Parks Department. Um, which will have a number of different factors in it to provide other recreational resources. Uh, it includes looking as hard as we can at the phasing and where closures are needed and what the sequencing of closures is and also where there may be opportunities as we complete portions of the project to reopen the spaces so that the community can use them. Uh, and we'll be continuing to pro provide updates on that as we advance through design over the next few months. So th is that a long way of saying still figuring still figuring it out? It is. Okay. Um, and uh, the <coughs> final question I had was on, on the same project is there's, you know, I think maybe some concerns around legal action that would be taken, ba you know, based on any of the decisions being made here around how to do the, the the phasing of the parks or, you know, around park alienation or around uh, any of the specific pieces of the project. Is there any risk to the federal funding? I think it's 300 and something million dollars provided by FEMA, by HUD. Is there any risk to that based on a situation where we get taken in in court around, around uh, any particular piece of this plan? Um, uh so the plan is uh, subject to environmental review under both the federal NEPA statute, also the state SECRA and the city SECRA statute. Environmental impact statement is being prepared with the Office of Management and Budget as the lead agency for the federal actions uh, and the Parks Department as the lead agency for city and state. That, you know, we, we believe that environmental impact statement is fully taking into account all of the impacts and uh, I guess let me just ask this question another way. What, what's the what's the end date by which we need to have that money spent for the federal the federal component of the East Side Coastal Resiliency? Right. It's uh, September 2022. Okay. <laughs> and so we get through ULARP, we start moving into I guess <clears throat> design, and then eventually construction. Is if any part of that process gets delayed, do we are we at risk of losing the federal funding? Well, um, there's always that risk if there's a major delay on the project, but we are um, a significant way through design at this stage. Um, so, and we'll be advancing design to complete it by November of this year uh, to start construction in March of next year. Really gives us two and a half years uh, of, of work, uh, if I have my, my dates right. Uh, and so we think there's very little risk that we wouldn't be able to expend those federal dollars. Outside of a long delay for some reason. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Gvenchik, followed by Lander and Cohen. Okay. Councilmember Lander. All right. Yes, those are good questions. Uh, thank you to both chairs, uh, and thank you, Commissioner and President. Um, <laughs> So I really value the work that you've brought to DDC so far, the agenda you've put forward, the team you've built, like the way you're taking seriously reform uh, of capital projects management and the agency, I think is, is, a, is a good credit and I feel optimistic and I have not been able to say something like that about capital projects management in the city through, this is year 10 of hearings, so, um, so that's not insignificant. Like I, um, and we'll see, I mean obviously, proofs in the pudding and there's a long way to go on all your recommendations, but the plan is serious. I think it gets things right. I think it is aiming at the right problem. So, so I'm giving some credit where I, where I think it's due. Thank um, you. At the same time, like what of the last couple of months have exposed to me is still some disconnects at a level sort of above you guys. So we had a hearing on my capital projects tracker bill where the mayor's office of operations came and was on the hook for, I mean, uh, Deputy Commissioner Springer was there, but like they have that piece of it. And then we on the first round of these budget hearings had a dialogue with OMB uh, more about these issues of planning and how to think comprehensively about infrastructure needs and capital budget priorities and our frustration that the 10-year capital strategy does not reflect a uh, comprehensive prioritization of our capital projects. But um, so I guess I think the things you guys are doing are great. 
I would like to see those things being uh, the reform of the capital projects planning and delivery system, mm -hmm. not only of DDC, like you're developing a new software tool, which is great, but other, anyway, so I, I guess that's my question, is like, sure. are there, uh, I'd be glad if you would convince me that there are things going on I don't yet know about that in addition to all the good ADDC internal work you're doing, our reform of the way OMB relates to the capital agencies, to City Hall, the Mayor's Office of Operations, it's a lot of hands, but that's all the more reason why some coordinating ones are needed, and in some ways you're starting to do that, but I still feel like it's needed one, at least one level higher. Right. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Council Member, and thanks for the compliment. That's that's nice to hear. Um, I think that I, while I agree with you generally, I really do, and I think we're making some moves in that direction. For example, if uh, we we talked a little bit about um, change orders and having. Um, uh, God, I'm losing the word right now, but the our change order allowance system contingency. Thank you. Very good. It's been a long day. Um, <laughs> so when we decided to come up with that, that idea, um, everybody, we got the same reaction. It's never going to happen. <laughs> Nobody was ever going to allow that. But we sat down with OMB, and we discussed the logic of doing this. And they have been tremendously cooperative, as well as the Comptroller's Office, which is a, a a real step forward, and I think what our job here is to do is, is to show success. And I think as we begin to do that, they will begin to be open to other reforms as well. The other thing that we're doing, which I think is really important, the DDC is charged uh, with doing an asset management um, report, the AIMS report, which is done every year. But I would like to use that in a way that really helps make decisions about capital programming throughout the city. We do a similar at SCA, we do a building Absolutely. condition assessment survey, which really drives our capital planning process. So one of the things that we're doing right now is a pilot program with uh, the Brooklyn Public Libraries, where in fact we are going to use some of that resource in the AIMS program to review the buildings that Brooklyn BPL is using right now to see what condition their particular systems are in. If we can show that to be effective and show that as a way to prioritize their projects, I think that will go a long way to kind of spreading the wealth throughout the city and allowing us to use that in a much more effective way. Okay, so uh, that's great. I mean, those are two good examples of ways in which broader systemic reforms are needed that you're building from your agency, but that if they happen can grow to the larger levels. I mean, I assume if it becomes possible for people to tap into their contingency for their change orders without going through an entire contract revision, that won't only belong to DDC projects, that other capital projects could have the same benefits as well. And on the Ames report, this is just such a great example. Obviously, in some ways, the starting point for the 10-year capital strategy should be the Ames report. Like, what of our existing infrastructure needs to be fixed and invested, you know, even before we start talking about our subsequent critical priorities? That does not happen. Like, currently, the Ames report is a pretty meaningless document that is not used as part of developing the 10-year capital strategy. And then the 10-year capital strategy is a pretty meaningless document, which does not actually predict 10 years of capital investments, but it's just like, well, we got next year's capital budget, and then we just like threw a few things in as well. So um, I, I'm gonna like both appreciate and just at the broader level keep pushing. Like it is great that you are using the position you have to help shine a spotlight on some of these things and start moving us forward. Um, we need at the broader scale from the other side of this building at OMB and in the mayor's office uh, to really be paying attention to these things and building from the work that you guys are starting to do. I hope we can use the Capital Projects Tracker as one more piece of that, uh, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. We're going to keep pushing, okay. um, and we appreciate the work you're doing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Council Member Grudenchik. Thank you, Chairs. Uh, good afternoon, Ms. Grillo. It's always good to see you. Um, and I want to say thank you for all you do for uh, our constituents. Um, we had the director of OMB here, Ms. Hartzog, at the beginning of this process. Mm -hmm. 
and I was looking at the capital plan and you know those charts go up and down and then the plan kind of flat lines and it's like you know if, if it was a patient in a hospital it would be dead um, and I'm asked to specifically you know on uh, Monday um, the four new jails that are going to be built to replace Rikers Island uh, were certified and um, I asked her why they weren't included in you know the capital plan there's no money at all for corrections and I know these buildings are not cheap and I was just wondering have you had any discussions with corrections about this to come up with a cost estimate Thank you. Um, sure, yeah, I'll respond to that, Council Member. Um, so at the moment, the critical funding need that DDC has is for the program management consultant, um, which is a contract that we're bringing on board that is uh, funded within the mayor's preliminary budget, uh, its expense budget funding. Uh, in addition, DDC, uh, or, sorry, not DDC, this, there generally, as I understand it, is approximately uh, $1 billion that's in the capital budget for um, for corrections related uh, or jail related improvements um, but uh, the as the projects make their way through the approvals process additional budgeting will be required do you have a ballpark figure on what this is going to cost we don't have that figure unfortunately okay well that's a little disappointing but I I can I'm gonna have to accept that um, I just want to thank you for being here and uh, look forward to working with you uh, to untie the Gordian knot that is the city <laughs> procurement process, especially uh, regarding parks, because there isn't a day that goes by as parks chair that I don't hear from one of my colleagues about a park or another. And that's all to the good because we're all working to improve the system. And I thank you, as always, for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Cohen, followed by Van Bremer and Adams. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Uh, how are you? Good, thank you. Uh, I, you know, I want to echo a little bit of what Councilmember Lander said. Uh, you know, I am a big fan of yours, and I think that uh, I'm excited that you're at DDC. I think that, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, I just wonder if you could talk a little bit, though, about uh, how projects get to DDC. You know, I, I had a, an, ex an experience that wasn't great. It was before you got there, about where there was a project, there was an estimate of the cost, um, then it got tra at some point the the parks department transferred this project to DDC uh, and the cost from the parks department bore no relationship to the from the cost from DDC like how do we get in that position like who's like why am I getting a cost estimate from parks if, if you're gonna right you're, you're, you're absolutely right and and that's part of what we talk about in our strategic plan really is that front end that conversation that takes place when a project is proposed by the sponsor agency. That's where we need to be involved. We need to be guiding them through the decision making. We need to be guiding them through the estimating. And that's really at the inception. And then put it through our front end planning unit, which really goes into the deep dive into what the, the strategies need to be, what the feasibility is, what the costs are gonna be. And then we'll sit down with our sponsor agency and we will all agree that this is the scope of the project and this is the estimate for the project. Because oftentimes, and I don't know about this particular project, but oftentimes, particularly if you ask a cultural institution to estimate the cost of, you know, uh, doing a new uh, theater space, uh, they really don't have the expertise. And if they hire someone who has really no idea how to work with city government, the numbers will be completely different. So that conversation will happen before a project is taken into DDC's portfolio. We will all agree. Otherwise, we will not take that project on. You're saying you're implementing that now as we, yes. that's happening? Yes, we are. All right, that's encouraging. Just for the record, it's my, the, you know, the Van Cortland pedestrian. Yeah, I, <laughs> I've heard. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Chairs. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Van Bramer. Thank you very much uh, to the chairs, and uh, I too am hopeful with uh, yourself on board. So a couple of different uh, uh, things would 
love an update on Hunter's Point uh, Library, but also uh, as we hopefully get to a place where um, we can see that opening, also a little bit of lessons learned and, and how not to repeat. Obviously, a lot of that happened before you took this on, but uh, at this point, you've had enough time mm. in the current position to um, uh, do a deeper dive on what's happening there. So A, an update, then B, what are the lessons learned to make sure that this never happens again? Yeah, I, I appreciate that, council member. Um, yes, this is a project that um, I almost get to see every morning as I look through my window when I wake up, and it uh, has really been a thorn in my side. Um, it's a project that had uh, great expectations. It's a beautiful project. Um, however, some decisions that were made in the earliest designs of the project were, um, shall we say, beautiful but not very functional. So that was one issue. And I think as we discussed earlier and I've been talking about, I think the decisions early on were a bit unrealistic in terms of the budget. I think from now forward, we will all sit down and we will agree what this budget is and what we can afford, okay? And until such time, as we have all the funding available, um, we're not gonna start a project like that. That's number one. Number two, I think one of the things that I saw as a result of visiting that site with you um, had to do with supervision and had to do with decisions make, made internally by our own project management staff and our construction management staff. And we've been training and working with these folks to make those decisions, to feel empowered. So that, that certainly is another important piece to this because I think a lot of that stuff should have been handled in the field more quickly and more efficiently. Um, so I think that that's part of it. I think on the, beyond that, the um, Queens Library right now is working very, very closely with DDC on this project. Um, their needs, we're helping them with their loading on of equipment and so on and so forth. And I think, I'm not sure if that relationship was always as cooperative. I think it is now. So I think there are a lot of different things. I think payments, improving the way we pay our contractors. In, you know, things like we are looking at, for example, different methods of dealing with contractors that are unresponsive, contractors that are not doing the work and how we proceed in that way. We're doing a lot of those things, we're working with uh, our oversight agencies to see if we can come up with a way in which if a contractor is not performing that I can move forward and then with another contractor. And if you did that now under the current system, it would take up to a year to get a new contractor on the process. Right. On, on the so uh, just because I do we're on a, on a time, sure. uh, the current expectation for an opening in late summer is That's still absolutely the the target. Uh, I was there uh, last week, um, paid a surprise visit as I often do, um, and and saw some good things. So um, just want to uh, be clear. So there was a contractor on this particular project um, that. Uh, you had to work really hard not to sort of, uh, to avoid default. Right. Um, and I want to make sure that that contractor is not going to be allowed to work on future projects yeah. like this once we have seen a contractor perform so poorly as did in this case. Again, those pro that's a very good point that you bring up because I think that there was a, um, in the, in the past, there has been an inability or an unwillingness to uh, either default a contractor or give a contractor unsatisfactory evaluations. That is no longer the case as far as I'm concerned. So we will proceed, we will discuss this particular contractor with you separately. I appreciate it and lastly, um, pass-through projects for uh, libraries and culturals where appropriate and when those 
agencies can't handle that. Um, in my 20 plus years with libraries, um, the city's gone back and forth uh, in some ways between wanting it, encouraging it, discouraging it. Um, uh, libraries and cultural is always sort of wanting more of that. Where, where are you with respect to uh, allowing more pass-throughs, which generally speaking, allow projects to be completed more quickly and more efficiently? Well, see the goal, my goal, sir, is to uh, have the uh, libraries and cultural institutions request that DDC do their projects because we are going to be so efficient and we are going to do it in such a way that people will be very pleased. I understand, though, the concern that has happened over time, but I would ask that folks give us an opportunity to improve in a way that will make us the go-to agency to do this work. I love how aspirational you are, but in, you know, before we get to that yeah. great place, which you know, I have great respect for you, as you know, and, and you've done incredible work for our children, and for our city, and in particular our beloved Queens, although I know you're citywide, um, but, uh, but you are not opposed, no. and there is no policy against pass-throughs when they make sense, and when the agency has the ability financially to do that. Absolutely. Okay. No, I have no, no opinion, no opinion one way or the other on that. Certainly it's up to the, up to the sponsor. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Majority Leader Lori Combo. Thank you so much. Wanted to follow up on a question in regards to the selection of architects. So when we came in, there was a, a process where many of the larger architectural firms were qualifying for pretty much all of the work in the city of New York. And I know that through my interest in that issue and also uh, talking with your agency about it, that there was a creation of larger architectural firms, mid-sized architectural firms, and smaller firms that would allow many of our MWBEs as well as uh, smaller uh, minority-owned firms to qualify for these projects. Can you talk a little bit about where this program is now and how this change in structure of architects has impacted the city? Well, thank you, council member. That's a great question, and, and we're joined today by our chief diversity officer, Maggie Austin, who is doing extraordinary work in this area. Um, there are a number of this, anyone who knows me from the School Construction Authority knows that this is an important component to the work that we do. I am um, a strong believer in encouraging MWBE participation and businesses. And um, actually, the SCA has had the strongest record in the state, and we will do that for DDC, I'm sure. But yes, that particular program that you spoke about um, is, is strongly very, very important to me. Um, we are doing a number of things in that area, and, and one of them is actually recruiting MWBE architects and engineering firms, okay? Um, Do you have, have the numbers on that at I, this I point? I don't, I don't. Let, let me just check to see if, if Maggie has that information. Why don't you join us? It would be important to hear it from Maggie. She's been working on this tirelessly. You might have to get sworn in. Uh, Justice for you, and do you affirm that the information you will provide will be corrected to the best of your information and belief? I do. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, we've met actually a couple of times to yes. discuss um, architectural and engineering services at DDC. And two and a half years ago, what we did is we created the categories that you discussed. We had a micro category for firms under five. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, we have 10 firms, micro firms, under contract. And the, um, about 60% of them are MWBEs. And that program has worked really well for us because not only were we able to recruit these firms, but 
we right-sized the projects, right? So we didn't have large firms working on small projects, and this was a great way for the firms to enter our program. And as a matter of fact, we're getting ready to reprocure re that contract, and the firms that are under contract with us have grown so much that we're trying to figure out whether we change the category to more, you know, to firms that are 10 and under instead of the five and under. So it's been extremely successful. It sounds like another category has to be mm -hmm. created to kind of capture that. I would like, because this is something that I'm specifically interested in and I've experienced, I would like to have a, an actual breakdown of those firms and to understand which ones are MWBEs and to learn more about them, but also in the MWB um, e world, I'd also like to see which ones are women, which ones are African American, Latino. I would like to see what the breakdown of that is. Sure. So if we you could make sure that that information gets back to Chair Drum and then uh, disseminated to those on the committee, that would be wonderful. I will make sure that we do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I just have one other question. Um, this was brought to my attention in my district as well. It's the idea of the, the lowest bid wins. This is not so much pertaining to the diversity issue in the same way, but this idea of the lowest bid wins, I'm having an issue in my district around this, which you probably are aware of, in which the lowest bid wins, that particular contractor comes in, begins the work, is not able to do the work, you find out midstream that uh, maybe they've taken on more projects that they can actually handle, the original bid that they put in is not one that they can actually live up to, now you're in the middle of the project, a certain amount of money has been allocated to the project, what happens? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I have a legacy project uh, that I'm really question. excited about, but that happened to yeah. me. Um, Actually, this was, that was one of the first things that I saw when I became uh, commissioner of DDC, how incredibly unusual it was to me, coming from SCA, that a contractor who was not performing well on several projects was then given another project. Right. It was unbelievable to me. And so as part of that, we dug into that. As I said, we've been digging into all of these issues along the way. And we recognized that these contractors were not being evaluated throughout the life of the project. They would be evaluated at the end because the last thing you wanted to do was default a, pro a contractor. Because if you default a contractor, by the time you go through the registration process of a new contract, you go through a bidding and a registration, it's a year. So that project sits for a year, and we don't want to do that. So what we've been doing over time is nurturing these projects along just inch by inch by inch. So what we're trying to do here, and part of it is looking for design build authorization, but we're looking for something else called CM build, which for example, having a CM under contract that can procure a new contractor to finish the work that's been started and not completed by a very bad contractor. So that's one thing we're working very hard to do. That's going to require legislation in Albany. And as we're working towards design build, we're doing the same for CM build. Um, evaluations. Evaluations are going to happen regularly. And I do not want, and I'm you know, going with the legal team on this, I do not want a contractor that's performing poorly to get another contract until okay. they cure that process. Just a so please, go and, ahead. And I, and I just, I have, a, I have a suggestion. Sure. But you live and eat and breathe this all day. But I would like to see um, the lowest bid to also be averaged and coupled out with an evaluation of that particular bidder. So that if they're saying they can do it at this cost, but you, you've seen evaluations that say change orders are the order of their day. Right. They don't finish projects. They don't do those things. That somehow that's averaged into the fact that they are also the lowest bidder. So that way we can get to some middle ground of where someone who is performing well, who's getting the job done, and has an excellent rating can be 
rated above and beyond someone that's simply putting in the lowest bid. The, the, from what I'm being told that because of, what is it, G GML 103, which is a state law. Sounds like something horrible. I know. Um, Just by is. the letters and it the is. number combination, it, it sounds like doomsday. We have like to doomsday. accept the low bid. We have to accept the low bid. Yeah, okay. please. And this is a state law? Yeah. Yep. All right, that's good to know. If you like We've got a new assembly and a new Senate. Yes. Some things need to change. Yes, we do. If, if you like, Council Member, I'll just elaborate slightly. Um, G General Municipal Law Section 103 is what requires statewide, including the city, for us to accept the lowest bidder. Um, Well-intentioned law, anti-corruption legislation uh, originally, but uh, it actually prevents us from doing a number of very important things. We can't do this qualifications-based selection um, where you incorporate additional criteria unless you're able to find someone really non-responsive or non-responsible. So it's sort of a, a nuclear uh, option to, to go and say this person is just absolutely not responsible. Um, in addition, though, uh, as the commissioner alluded to, uh, we are seeking additional design-build authorization. Design-build also uh, is something that we can't do because of the requirement to take the lowest bidder. Um, and the same thing with those authorities to use a construction manager, CM to build or CM to work at risk. It's all really because of that structure of the legislation, and that's something that we're uh, taking up in Albany this session. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look forward to following up with you. Thank you so much, Majority Leader Cumbo. And with that, Commissioner, we're going to end uh, this part of our hearing because we are running behind schedule and we're going to reconvene with the um, Mayor's Office of Management and Budget. So on behalf of Chair Drum and myself, we do have further questions that we're going to submit to you in writing, and we expect that you will get back to us in a timely fashion. Um, and certainly we look forward to working with you in your capacity as Commissioner of DDC. There is a lot to be done, but we are grateful and we are encouraged by the level of commitment that DDC has. I think putting forth a blueprint and recognizing a lot of the gaps in the system is very encouraging because DDC does manage a lot of projects, and as we move forward, we certainly want to continue to look at ways to be more efficient and effective in terms of timeline, getting contractors paid, and many other things. So we thank you and your team for being here, and we look forward to working with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. Helen Rosenthal. Doing well. Can you leave all this here? Do you think that'll hold my seat? Hello, 
I think it'll hold. I think it'll hold your seat. Thank you. Girl power. Right back. Girl power go, in the yeah, building. Girl power on side. Yes. I'm gonna go cheer on the corner. Okay. No, OMB. Street <laughs> renaming. Kind of not. No. Are you ready? How are you? Good. I'm alive. <laughs> Look at your face and your breath and your whole thing. You're like, this is an issue. No, no, I read off on him. He, he at one point, he supported the Farrakhan. man. Uh-huh. Right? I don't know. Yeah. But I'm sure, but I don't know. That that never came up. Who do you trust over you? A friend has to back you up. Well, where's it going to be? It's the Jewish area? No. It wasn't going to be Do you trust anyone there in Crown Heights? It's not in Crown Heights. It's in Clinton Hill. You think it'll, do you just think it'll be too explosive? Do you think that there's no way? To it, right. Then, yeah. Because I, I looked, I, I googled, that it wasn't that much, but whatever it was, there, whatever it was there. I'm really pushing. It wasn't I'm pushing. It wasn't like, you know, right. I mean, it's always better to stay away from the house. I know. Right. And, and if, if you go for it, you know, it's still like, you know, Huh? No, it's still. I know, but they're, like, pushing. <laughs>
If everyone could please find seats, we're going to reconvene momentarily. Once again, if you could please find a seat. Silence all electronic devices at this time. Okay, good afternoon and welcome back to today's hearing of the Finance Committee. I'm Councilmember Daniel Drum and I'm chair of this committee. We have already heard from the Department of Finance and the Department of Design and Construction and we'll now hear from the Office of Management and Budget. The committee is joined by the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, chaired by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, and we're also pleased to once again be joined by the speaker, Corey Johnson. We're also joined by my colleagues, Margaret Chin, uh, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, Councilmember Chaim Deutsch, Councilmember Andy Cohen, Council and others will probably be joining us shortly. Uh, we're going to keep our remarks brief and just touch on some of the highlights before driving uh, diving right into OMB's testimony and questions from the members. We began the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget hearings on March 7th by hearing from OMB. Since then, the Council has held hearings nearly every day throughout the month and heard from 55 agencies about their individual budgets. We will wrap up this year's preliminary budget hearings by once again hearing from OMB so that we may ask them about issues that have come up at the agency hearings but are better answered by the Mayor's office. Many of those questions relate to risks to the budget on the city level. At the first hearing, we spoke at length about the risks to the city's budget that are coming from the state. Hopefully, we will have answers to those state questions within the next few days as our state leaders come to a budget agreement. But as the hearings revealed, there are many items that will need to be included in the budget by adoption that the preliminary budget does not address. Many of these are in the education budget, such as additional funding that will be needed for the school bus contracts, increased charter school payments, Carter cases, and custodial services. And there are other items as well that are wholly absent from the preliminary budget, such as funding for the mayor's placard abuse initiative, the newly announced $10 billion resi resiliency plan for Lower Manhattan, and the funding both for the purchase and rehabilitation of 17 cluster sites that are scheduled to close shortly. And added to that is the Council's discretionary package, as well as the restoration of funding in fiscal 2020 of all the items the Council fought for last year, but which the administration funded for fiscal 2019 only. 
I remain concerned about how these known needs will be funded, and I know that I speak for the Council as a whole when I say that we will not allow it to be at the detriment of the program so many of our constituents rely on to thrive or even just get by in this city. Cuts to EFAP, the Summer Youth Employment Program, Adult Literacy, or SONIC, just to name a few, will be a non-starter. I'll now turn the mic over to the speaker, who will say a few words. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Gibson, for holding today's hearing. As Chair Drum mentioned, today the Council is completing <clears throat> its month of fiscal 2020 preliminary budget hearings. Throughout March, we've had the opportunity to delve into agency budgets and learn more about the priorities of agency heads in their specific areas. One thing that repeatedly came up during the hearings was obviously the $750 million PEG program to eliminate the gap and how agencies are planning on meeting targets set by OMB. With OMB's release of the PEG target letter the day before our first preliminary budget hearing on March 7th, it was only natural that this would be a highlighted issue at each hearing. Unfortunately, most agency heads were either unable or unwilling to discuss what might be eligible for the PEG within their budgets. It is incredibly frustrating to the City Council to spend the time and energy of Council members and our staff in holding these hearings only to be stonewalled when we ask for critical information needed to conduct real budget oversight. Now that the deadline for the agencies to submit their PEG targets to OMB has passed, I am hopeful that we'll be able to get some answers at today's hearing about what the PEG will be at each agency and whether the PEG is primarily made up of programmatic cuts revenue swaps or accruals. I'd like to continue the conversation we began at the first hearing regarding whether the $750 million target was ambitious enough. That number is not much larger, if at all, than the savings plans that the administration has proposed over the last few years. If the PEG is essentially what would have been accomplished through another savings plan, I'd like to gain a better understanding of the decision to do a formal PEG and how the target number was reached. I want to thank Director Hartzog and First Deputy Godner for being here today to testify, and I now turn the mic back to Chair Drum. Thank you. Thank you, and um, thank you, Speaker Johnson. We'll now hear from Chair of the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, Councilmember Gibson. Thank you so much, Chair Danny Drum. Good afternoon. Thank you to our Speaker, Corey Johnson, for being here. We welcome you from OMB, and thank you for your partnership throughout this process. I am Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. I'm proud to serve as chair of the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget, and I'm honored to be here co-chairing today's hearing with Chair Drum as well as our speaker. Um, I'll begin this afternoon by talking about the draft 10-year capital strategy. At our first hearing earlier this month, the City Council asked a number of questions about why the capital strategy was so front-loaded in the first five years, but then funding for many of the agencies dropped off in the final five years of the 10-year capital strategy. In its response, OMB has informed us that the City Council to us that it recently implemented a further redistribution of the strategy, specifically $1 billion, $2.9 billion, and $1.9 billion from fiscal years 2019, 2020, and 2021, respectively, into the outer years. OMB further informed the Council that as it formulates the final version of the 10-year capital strategy, it has instructed city agencies to take a harder and closer look at the front-loading of their programs and to be more aggressive in providing a more realistic time frame for all of their capital projects. While we appreciate this effort and certainly want to commend OMB for its leadership, and we always applaud the administration when we do see a lot of progress happening, um, but this truly does not get to the heart of what we have been talking about, and it really misses the point of the overall 10-year strategy. Our issue with the draft 10-year strategy, just for clarification, is not that it was front-loaded or front-heavy. That was one concern, but we also felt that it was backlight. And the strategy is intended to be a planning tool and an aspirational document that assesses the future needs of this city beyond FY 2026, beyond this administration, even if many of the needs are not necessarily identified today nor funded, or how they will be funded in the future. 
We don't want you to just smooth out the first years of the strategy, but we want to see realistic planning for the last years. The administration must also continue in its efforts to better utilize existing city resources in providing an efficient, centralized system that really tracks all pending capital projects citywide, not just those that are at a threshold of $25 million, but every capital project that we fund in this city. In response to our follow-up questions from our last hearing, OMB stated that its role in tracking capital projects citywide was the publication of the Capital Project Detail Data Report. This report tracks project status and information on budget, on scope, and milestones and where it's applicable, the community board in which the project is located. However, much of the information in this particular report is blank and it's not publicly available. That's another concern we have. The ability to document this information in an existing resource that the city can use to centrally track capital projects citywide is what we are aiming to get to. And lastly, before I turn this hearing back to Chair Drum, I want to make one more plug on the budget lines. And we have been talking about this consistently since last year in terms of our expectation to see more with the release of the executive budget and even more by adoption. We want to see more descriptive budget lines. So once again, I want to thank you to our director because we have seen a lot of change and we just want to keep pushing and pushing until we continue to improve efficiency, project timelines, and we make sure that we're holding all of the agencies accountable, and we really have a 10-year capital strategy that is reflective of all 10 years, uh, not just the first five, but all 10 years, and that goes uh, without saying for every single agency uh, when you talk about new schools, new parks, new housing, and so we appreciate the work that's been done. We look forward to today's conversation, and certainly after today, working with all of you as we get to a final adopted budget. So I thank you for being here. I turn this hearing back to Chair Danny Drum and want to thank the Finance Division for their incredible work on today's hearing. Thank you, Chair Gibson. Before we hear from OMB, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for OMB will be limited to three minutes per council member. And if council members have additional questions and time permits, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I'd also like to remind any member of the public who wishes to testify to please fill out a witness slip with the sergeant at arms. The public portion of the hearing is scheduled to begin at approximately 2 p.m. and the witness panels will be arranged by topic, so please indicate the topic of your testimony on your witness slip. If there is any member of the public who wishes to testify but is unable to do so at today's hearing, you may email your testimony to the Finance Division at finance testimony at council Dot NYC dot gov by close of business on Friday, March 29th, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. We will now hear from the Director of the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, Melanie Hartzog, and the First Deputy Director for Budget, Kenneth Godner, after they are sworn in by Council. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chair Drum, Subcommittee Chair Gibson, and Council Members for the opportunity to provide an update to my testimony of March 6. I also want to thank Latanya McKinney and the Council Finance staff for their positive and collaborative approach to the budget. I'm joined at the table today by OMB First Deputy Director Kenneth Godner, and our dedicated and hardworking staff at OMB are here to assist me in answering questions. At the release of the preliminary budget, the mayor highlighted budget risks associated with the economy, the city's revenue forecast, and state budget issues. We still face these conditions and additional risks that I will discuss shortly. The first challenge we face is the possibility of a national economic slowdown that would pose a substantial threat to the city's financial plan. Our fiscal monitors agree. Last week, the state controller concluded that the largest risk to the budget remains the potential for an economic setback during the financial plan period. He added that the national economy appears more vulnerable in recent years. The second risk we face is related to city revenue. We forecast fiscal year 2019 personal income tax to decline. 
while offset by gains in other tax revenue categories, the decline is causing our overall revenue growth to slow. An economic slowdown or other condition that leads to a substantial deviation in revenue expectations would threaten fiscal stability and require us to take additional savings measures. The third risk is related to state and federal budget actions. The state executive budget still contains nearly 600 million in proposed cuts and cost shifts that impact the budget over fiscal years 2019 and 2020. This includes shifts of 300 million in education costs and 125 million of state costs to the city for TANF, financial assistance for families in need. This would shift the cost of cash assistance to the city and cut shelter rates. The executive budget makes cuts of 59 million designated for health care services like reproductive health and child immunizations and 13 million from programs that keep at-risk youth out of foster care and detention centers. We are currently working with our partners in Albany to restore this funding and the one house budgets have been positive. But if these cuts and cost shifts are enacted, our fiscal stability will be at risk. I would also like to highlight risks related to federal actions. The President released his proposed federal fiscal year 2020 budget a week after my last appearance. It contains billions of dollars of cuts to vital city programs. While the President's budget reflects priorities that are at odds with the city's needs and is therefore a threat, we believe that it's unlikely to pass. We are working with the New York congressional delegation to advocate for budget actions in Washington that support our funding priorities. In response to the risks I outlined today, the mayor announced a $750 million savings plan at the preliminary budget presentation. We will achieve most of these savings by implementing the administration's first PEG program. We are actively working with the agencies to help them reach mandatory PEG savings targets. The executive budget will reflect details, including programs affected and savings achieved. This savings effort is on top of the $1.6 billion in savings we achieved across fiscal years 2019 and 2020 in the two financial plan updates since adoption, and healthcare savings of $1.6 billion in fiscal year 2020 and $1.9 billion annually thereafter. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Director Hartzog. So I want to start off on the pegs. During the course of our preliminary budget hearings, the council heard testimony from several agency heads that the deadline for agencies to submit their pegs to OMB was last week. I wanted to ask first, how did you choose the target for each agency, and was it based on what they have already been able to achieve in prior savings plans? Good afternoon, Speaker. Um, the targets overall, well, first let me just say the overall PEG target had a number of different factors in our overall citywide savings plan of $750 million. The first was related to the fact that in December we saw the volatility of the stock market. I don't think we could have, anyone could have anticipated that. We started to see our estimated payments and personal income tax decline going into January. And as we were closing up the preliminary budget, very difficult to implement a PEG program in prelim which is why we announced at the point of preliminary budget that we were moving forward with the $750 million overall citywide savings, with a portion of that being the mandatory PEG program. So that played a factor into it and also the timing of it. In terms of the actual targets that were achieved, what we actually set forward for the agencies, it was a number of different factors. It did, in fact, look at historical um, savings initiatives that the agencies put up. It looks at whether or not the agencies have opportunities to maximize revenues, additional fees. So there were several factors that went into it overall. Uh, and sorry, the other point I wanted to make is the agencies have full flexibility in achieving their target of looking at both their fiscal year 19 budget and their fiscal year 20 and out. And so that it's not either you have to achieve the entire target on your fiscal year 20 budget. We want to give agencies that flexibility to actually look at both years and, of course, in the baseline. So now that you've received the proposed pegs from all city agencies, can that list be shared with the city council? We've been working with the agencies since the announcement of prelim and having a number of conversations with them. The agencies have given us a sense of what their overall preliminary ideas are for achieving their savings target. This is very early in the stage in our process. And everything that they've put is really in draft form, and they're having ongoing conversations with my staff at this point. 
as we move closer into executive budget and actually locking the plan, we'll have a much better sense of what the final actual PEG program will be. Do you, even if you can't share the details agency by agency on what the agencies have identified as potential savings and uh, cuts, uh, could you share with us preliminarily what percentage of the PEG is programmatic cuts, is accruals, is revenue swaps, and is one-time savings from fiscal year 2019? So we at least have an early sense of what it's looking like agency by agency, even in the draft form? I, th there's, I have not had even the opportunity just yet to review it. As I said, my staff are, and I'm not at a point where I can say that I actually approve and accept what the agencies are presenting. It's an ongoing process, and I think it's very too, it's just too early in the process for me to say this is exactly what we plan to do moving forward. So and I, I also want to say that we have a number of different savings proposals that the council has given us in the past, and we really take those seriously. We want to look at those and continue to talk with your staff about ideas they may have and incorporate that into the process as well. So we really look forward to any ideas you may have. So all of that, the way you laid it out, makes sense to me on, on how the process has unfolded. But um, so I, I'm sympathetic from the OMB side and from the administration side, agency by agency, on the process and why that process exists. And I'd, I'd just uh, ask you to kind of put yourself in our chair for a moment from the perspective of having to do uh, multiple preliminary budget hearings and do uh, the charter mandated oversight that's given to us as a legislative body, it's hard for us to do these hearings. It's hard for us to have a full conversation about agency budgets when we've seen initial percentages and amounts that were identified uh, early on, as you see on the screen, um, but for us not to be able to have any details about that or ask about that, it, it makes it hard to have a full conversation, an informed conversation on agency budgets when we don't know what it's going to look like. So in many ways, I think it's been difficult for committee chairs with the respective agencies that they're conducting budget oversight on to be able to have an informed preliminary budget hearing when we don't have the full information yet. And, and that's frustrating to us. And I just want to know, from if you were sitting in my chair, how would it's hard for us to conduct that level of oversight? I, there is the opportunity, as you know, when we release the executive budget and we fully support and we have worked in partnership with the council to ensure that you have the appropriate oversight of our budget. And in fact, the opportunity exists as we release the executive budget and moving forward, once it's released, for us to have the opportunity to both fully brief the council um, as the normal process is and then have our oversight hearings where the agencies and I come before you to provide you with that detail on what the actual PEG program will be and other changes and actions in the, in the executive budget. And then as we move forward, obviously, into the adopted budget, again, working in partnership with you and the leadership of the council to actually adopt the budget. Well, I, I would just say that I look forward to, of course, working in partnership uh, with OMB and with the administration throughout the entire budget process to arrive at an adopted budget that's negotiated and that reflects both sides of City Hall's priorities. But I would just say uh, for next year, um, if there are going to be potential pegs, we have to figure out a process ahead of time before the preliminary budget's released if there is going to be a significant savings program or programmatic cuts that are potentially proposed and agencies asked to identify those that we're not in this situation because it, it has been very frustrating for individual council members and all council members to go through the preliminary budget hearings and not have the information that I think is needed to conduct full oversight. And I don't think, I'm not saying that was done purposefully, mm -hmm. but I think that it is, it has, it has really hampered us to be able to do the job we typically are able to do in preliminary budget hearings when we have more full information on agencies that we didn't have in this situation. So I would ask that after this budget is complete that OMB work with the Council Finance Division to come up with some um, outlined process to figure out if pegs have to come next year, what is the process so that we're not in the same situation again? I'm happy to have conversations with Council Finance on that. And I appreciate 
the concern and the challenge of timing that I talked about, which is, you know, again, you, you, no one could have predicted the volatility of the stock market yes, in December, right. and so it led us to a real timing issue of presenting the peg. Yes. But clearly moving forward, we, the economy, where we are with the slowdown, we're in a very different environment. Um, the Trump tax cuts and what the impact is is very hard for everyone to predict. It's not just OMB, but I think many forecasters. And so I think moving forward, you're absolutely right. We will have a process where we work with you Thank to you. make sure that we have that impact. I appreciate that. Did any agency initially not meet its target? At this point, I'm not aware of any agency that has not met their target, but again, that happened on Friday where agencies submitted and my staff have been working towards it. I have not had an opportunity yet to sit with my staff. That and, will be happening over the next couple and, of days. And again, preliminary, did any agency exceed its target? Again, Speaker, I haven't had that chance to have those conversations. But just from what you know preliminarily, I mean, it sounds like everyone sort of came close to their target. I don't have any insight to give you at this point. I mean, again, I... I, I understand wanna, your frustration. This is very I frustrating. Do. I do. So... But we're very... It's hard to have this process. hearing if, if, if these very basic questions about a significant part of our oversight can't be answered in this hearing. I understand. I, we're here to talk about the preliminary budget, and at the same time, we announced the PEG program moving forward for the executive budget. So again, the challenge of timing when I'm asking and able to answer questions on the preliminary and we're still working towards the executive budget that will be released in the coming weeks. I understand your challenge on timing, but we're still working through it all. The PEG agency target that you released the day before the last hearing was about $200 million shy of the $750 million total target. Where do you think the remaining PEG will come from? We're still working on that. There's a lot of work that Ken and his team are doing on the citywide savings program, obviously looking towards debt service and other initiatives. So still a work in progress over the coming weeks. And when do you think you'll have an answer on that? We will all be reflected in the executive budget. When, when is the, the, the statutory deadline for the executive budget? I'm not remembering. April 26th. So about a month away. Mm -hmm. And by that time, we will have answers to all these questions that I just asked. That is correct, Speaker. Um, why was the target $750 million? How, how did we arrive at that number? It was a combination of a number of factors, the first being what I've described in terms of where our revenue forecast is and the very real concerns we have in the current year about where our personal income tax collections will be. April's a very critical month for us moving forward, and we are carrying a, right, a certain level of concern as to where that will be given what's happened in December um, with our estimated payments moving forward. The other factor was looking at where agencies' um, savings have been historically, and also mindful that we are midway through the fiscal year in 19, and wanting to give agencies flexibility on how to achieve those savings between 19, 20, and the baseline. Okay, uh, I have a lot of questions. I'm gonna try to go through them quickly. They're, they just hit basically three issue areas. The first is accessibility, the second is the census, and the third, uh, sorry, there's four. It's accessibility, the census, um, our reserves that we currently have and planning reserves for the future, and our revenue forecast. So I'm gonna try to go through these as quickly, as quickly as possible. Accessibility in the city must be improved, and we must adjust our processes going forward to address past issues and plan more appropriately for the future. In the fiscal 2019 budget, this council made improving accessibility of public schools a top priority. We worked with you on that. We added $150 million to the school capital plan to support accessibility projects and the administration followed our lead by proposing another 750 million dollars in capital for school projects DOE has also devoted expense funding to accessibility and has made programmatic changes to the school selection process for differently abled students SCA is in the process of looking at all school buildings constructed since 1992 is what SCA has told us to figure out what needs to be fixed and it is our understanding that they are that there are additional path travel requirements in the Americans for Disabilities Act that need to be addressed. How much do we think it will cost to be compliant with a path of travel for all school buildings constructed since 1992 in addition to current renovations at schools? So I'm asking for, we may have constructed buildings after 92, which is when the ADA, I believe, went into effect, that still did not have all the necessary requirements or the updated requirements that we need, and then buildings before that, what do we think the total cost is to bring all our schools up to accessibility for students? 
Well, Speaker, first, um, I just want to add on accessibility. We worked um, with the uh, council to add capital funding. Um, you can imagine as OMB director, you don't get a lot of credit in this role. I just want to take a little bit of credit for working with the CDBG unit in our um, shop, and we actually gave $133 million in additional investment for accessibility towards um, for Department of Education and work collaboratively with them on that front. I appreciate that. Thank you for your help. On the issue of the cost, as I understand it, um, uh, Lorraine Grillo was just before uh, me here today and talked about this very preliminarily on the cost issue that you're bringing up. That's work that she has to do. We will circle back and work with her on what that total cost could be. My understanding on this is that it relates to moving forward and not going backwards, and so that all of those costs moving forward are built in. But as to your question on citywide, that's where the commissioner testified that she will have to go back and take a look at this. So we will work with her on that. So could, could you all work over the next month by the time we get to executive budget to come up with an estimate of what we think that cost would be? We will most certainly try to do so. Thank you. Are there any ADA, are there any other ADA requirements aside from path of travel, which uh, OMB believes SCA will need to address? Not at this time, no. Okay. I want us to work with you on that because we may have some uh, flags on that. Okay. Another example of an ADA issue was DOT's curb cut program. DOT testified at the preliminary budget hearing that the city has over 600,000 pedestrian ramp locations and that it will be a long-term multi-billion dollar undertaking to make every ramp accessible. Yet the preliminary plan only includes $1.5 billion in capital expense dollars over the next 10 years for DOT's budget for reconstructing curb cuts across the city. Has OMB attempted to identify other ADA-related fixes that should be made to capital projects already completed? So DOT is actually in the process of undertaking a survey to determine what additional cost and work will need to be done. That will be complete by October 31st of 2020, and this will inform our future work um, and funding needs moving forward, beyond the investments that you noted. Does that include going back and assessing compliance failures so that we fix them in the future? Um, that is just related to ped ramps. So yes, it does include that, but it's related to ped ramps. Just on ped ramps, mm -hmm. okay. I would love to know from OMB and DOT what other potential projects that would need accessibility besides ped ramps. I, I can't think of what they are, but I'm sure the staff here might have an idea, but I'd love to for that to be looked at in the universe as well. We can work with your staff okay. on that. Among all agencies, including SCA and DOT, how much do we believe the city will spend to fix new construction and rehab projects that are out of compliance with the ADA? I think this is related partially to your question of citywide and also for our investments, and so I think we, we will come back to you with that. What controls are in place to ensure that new, new police precincts, new parks, new roadways, new courthouses that are funded in this budget will be built in full compliance of the ADA? Do we well, have controls in place? We have our own review process, but again, I think this relates to your question overall, and I'm sorry I keep saying that, but I think we, in Lorraine testified to this as well, needs to go back and actually come back to you with an assessment on it. And my final question on this is, DDC has hired someone to look at path of travel requirements across the city. Has the administration considered hiring someone to look at the city's compliance with all ADA requirements and assessing the need that currently exists? I'm not clear if, if Lorraine's role in looking at this is overall or just related to DDC projects. I need to come back and uh, have a conversation with her. If, th if that's not the case, I, I, would, I would love for OMB to uh, engage with someone who could actually take an overall look. The point I'm trying to get at, as you can see in all of these questions, is that we live in an inaccessible city for people who have mobility impairments, who are in wheelchairs, who are senior citizens, and it is unfair for them every single day to not be able to move around the city in the way that able-bodied people are able to. And I want to ensure that when we're spending city dollars, we're doing it in a way that makes our city more accessible, goes back and fixes the wrongs of the past, 
but when we're rehabbing new projects, working on new projects, ensuring that those projects and the tax dollars that we're spending are ensuring that every building, every park, every new pedestrian ramp, any renovations, any rehabs are all fully compliant for people who have mobility impairments so that they have an easier way of getting around our city. Understood. Okay, I want to go to the census. We have shared a concern of ensuring that the census count is accurate so that the city receives its fair share of federal dollars. I know you share this concern as well, given your role as OMB director. To that end, we're hoping that you will commit to being transparent about how census funding is being allocated and spent because it is difficult for the council to independently track given that the budget is not structured programmatically. So to help us understand the plan around the census work, we'd like further details about the budgets, interaction, and overlapping mandates of the Office of the Census, the Civic Engagement Commission, and Democracy NYC. How their individual budgets, how their interactions with each other, and how their overlapping mandates with regard to census work that gets done, how that all works. So my question is, what is the relationship between the Office of the Census, the Civic Engagement Commission, and Democracy NYC, and how do these offices work with the law department, if at all, on census-related work? So all of these entities are housed within uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson's portfolio in order to ensure that they are coordinated and aligned um, with goals and resources. And all three of those entities work with the law department. Uh, the census is responsible for engaging New Yorkers in the census and driving turnout numbers. Democracy NYC is charged with a broader democracy effort, not just the census, but projects like voter registration and early, early voter legislation. And the um, Civic Engagement Commission is a separate entity uh, that is created and within city charter charged with implementing participatory budgeting. So I would, it would be helpful would if- Would you like the actual, I can give you the budgets. No, no, what I'm just asking for is if, if you could come back to us, if the staff could come back to us and sort of delineate where their mandates overlap and, and just kind of delineating, given all these entities on the screen, city planning, which has the demographers, the law department, which has a significant role in this, the Civic Engagement Commission that was just created by the voters in voting on the city charter, Moya, given our immigrant population and making sure that they're counted, and Democracy NYC, as you outlined, how they all, what, what is their individual mandates as it relates to the census, their budgets, how do they interact, kind of delineating all of that for us so we have a clear understanding how that all is working from now as we move through the census count so that there's some transparency around it for everyone, the council and the public, to know what each of these important agencies are doing on census-related work. Yes, I think the appropriate um, is person to do that is Deputy Mayor Thompson, and so we can, I can communicate that to him and we can put it in writing. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, could, you, could you give us the size of each of the budgets for these offices? Sure, the Democracy NYC has two positions. The Office of the Census has uh, $4.3 million in 19 and another 1.2 in 20. And Civic Engagement Commission is, we're still in that process of assessing that and would reflect that in the executive, executive budget. budget. Uh, where are each of these budgets located? Under what agencies, under what unit of appropriation? Democracy NYC is in the mayor's office, U of A 020 and 021 with four headcount. Census is in uh, DCP um, with 10 positions and civic engagement, we're again in the process Figuring of assessing. That out. Yep. Okay. So the Civic Engagement Commission is scheduled to actually be impaneled on April 1st, so before the executive budget actually comes out, um, which is you know very soon, it's just a few days away. So maybe on that one question on the Civic Engagement Commission, since it's literally going to be appointed and impaneled and start meeting, that it would be possible to get some of the details around that before the executive budget, since their work is just about to begin. Not all of the details, but some of the details on where they're going to be housed, what we think preliminarily the size of the staff is going to look like, not in a hardened concrete way, but just the folks that have been planning this, what are their thoughts on it? The council has appointments to this commission, so we want to make sure we understand how it's working. 
Yes, the mayor made that commitment um, uh, to the council when we released the preliminary budget that we would have that conversation, so we absolutely can do that. Great. The fiscal 2019 adopted budget includes $4.3 million, as you just said, for the Department of City Planning for Census Outreach, and the fiscal 2020 budget includes $1.2 million. How much of the money has been spent so far and how much rollover are you projecting into fiscal 2020? Um, very little of the money has been spent year to date. I'm not yet ready to give you a projection on the amount that we would need for fiscal year 20. We would do that within the executive budget. Okay. The council's understanding is that much of the census work is going to be contracted out to potential private entities to do the outreach that's necessary across the five boroughs. If additional city funds are needed for census work and the state's provi and the state, New York State, provides the city with some of the $40 million that the council's hoping is included in the state adopted budget, what is the administration's plan for spending that money? It takes nearly a year to procure services. If it takes uh, that long, in this case, the census will be over by the time the contracts for census, census outreach are registered. So what's our plan to be able to do it in an expedited manner? Well, Speaker, I'm really glad you mentioned the fact that there is $40 million in both one houses for this purpose. I think that really speaks to the legislature prioritizing this as much as we are. And clearly that plays a role in actually our efforts here and what the, the need is going to be moving forward. And this should take care of a significant chunk of that. The, I would say the quickest way that they're trying to do this is to look at micro grants that would go out, which are an expedited way to do it. Um, but again, we can get this to you as part of the write-up that you've requested. On the, from the Deputy, Deputy, Thompson, Mayor. Deputy Mayor Thompson mm -hmm. memo. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I want to get to reserves. The city has buttressed its reserves in recent years for a net reserve of almost $9.1 billion, which represents uh, about 10% of adjusted expenditures. The fiscal monitors have argued that that is not enough. Last week, the yield curve for short and long-term treasuries inverted for the first time since 2007, which indicates investors see market instability in the near future. More troubling is that inverted yield curves uh, have forecast every recession in the last several decades, so it might mean that it's on the horizon. It's hard to predict recessions, but this is a potential warning sign for us. Do you believe <clears throat> this inverted yield curve means a recession is more likely in the near term? And if so, how is the administration responding to this development? Well, it, it certainly is an indicator of recessions. However, economists and financial institutions are really talking about and expecting a slowdown at this point. And I think in terms of being prepared, we've been working for some time in partnership with the council being prepared for this eventuality to come. That includes all the work that we've done on building the historical levels of reserves we've had, working in partnership with the council. We added more in the current year. Um, we've built up our reserves on the trust, and we continue to have savings plans. We had savings plans in times where we had far more revenue, um, and there wasn't such an economic slowdown. And in fact, those savings plans have actually yielded significant savings in the baseline. So if you were to look at over the course of the administration, how much we've actually saved in the baseline. It's about um, looking at fiscal year 19, the current year, 5.8 billion, rising to 6 billion in the out years. And we think that is the strategy that has worked and will continue to do so, including moving forward in the executive budget with the PEG program and working in partnership with the council to look at levels of reserves as we, as we move forward with adopted. Are you confident that the amount we have in reserves right now is enough to get us through a recession without having to make any programmatic cuts or significant tax increases? I'm confident with the level of reserves that we have right now to get us through what is the current forecast, which is an economic slowdown. And again, we're going to continue to do what we have been and it's actually proven effective and actually led to us getting a ratings upgrade um, for our bonds. And so it's that combination of looking at our reserves and continuing savings and being cautious on our debt service and our revenue estimates. Yeah, I mean, I thought that was a very irresponsible article that the New York Post ran about 
a potential bankruptcy for the city of New York on the horizon, which is not what any of the numbers show us. It's not what the bond rating agencies show us. It's not what we're seeing right now. And a recession could have a significant, if it happened, take a significant hit on us like anywhere else across the country. The Citizens Budget Commission, they did an analysis recently, as I'm sure you know, and they predicted that a recession like the last two recessions could cause revenue shortfalls of 15 to $20 billion, not per year, but over three years, an amount that would more than eat up all of our current reserves and potentially mean deeper cuts. And I think that we should be hoping for the best, but planning potentially for the worst Agreed. and how we look at the future so we're not in a position in making deep cuts to programs that help everyday New Yorkers and relying on our property tax system, which we rely on quite a bit. So I, that's a flag uh, in many ways. And, and I just want to, does, does the administration at this point think that we should add more to the reserves this year? Again, I think for, given where we are with our forecast and the fact that, yes, there are the indicators that you talked about, but it's really looking at an economic slowdown, we believe that our reserve levels are sufficient, and it's really the combination of our reserves, our continuing savings, and our cautious estimates on both revenue and debt service. Moving forward, as we did at the adopted budget with the council, we are always open to having conversations about where we can do more on the reserves front. And the, we can have that conversation as we move into I mean, I think we should keep adding to our reserves to plan for the future. The council last year um, asked for that, uh, and we got over $200 million in additional reserves. And I think that's something that we should continue to advocate for, given the slowdown in the economy uh, that we're seeing. Okay, lastly, I want to go to our uh, revenue forecasts. So you'll see on the screen, uh, that is the, that was the, on the end of the year reserves. So OMB is known for, <coughs> this is probably not a bad thing, but OMB is known for being conservative when forecasting tax revenues. Uh, this is a good thing as it means we rarely have to do mid-year cuts to keep our budget balanced. Uh, in a sense, your conservative forecast acts like a budgetary reserve in some way, uh, something the council continues to call for. So I am very supportive of OMB's conservative revenue forecasting in principle. I think it's a good thing and I think it's worked out in the past, so we haven't had to do mid-year cuts. However, there's a way uh, that this could be, the way that it's done is not very transparent. Not transparent for us, not transparent for the public, not transparent for people that pay attention to this. There is no way for an outsider to look at OMB's budget and understand how conservative the forecast actually is. And I think we can be both responsible in our budgeting and also transparent. So it's my belief that OMB should provide an actual best estimate of future reserve, of future revenues and then offset that with an explicit revenue forecast. This would require no change in net revenues, but it would show everyone that we're being responsible in our budget. Would you be willing to create a revenue forecast reserve in the budget so that we could do this? Well, first I want to uh, tell you that I really appreciate the, the council, the speaker, your perspective on acknowledging the fact that we are cautious. And I think as we experienced um, moving forward in the preliminary budget with what happened with the stock market and looking at where we were with our estimated payments on PIT, I think that caution is what actually ensured that we weren't in a situation at the preliminary budget where we in fact had to make um, cuts at that time with very little time to do so. And I actually think that there is a way that happens right now that we actually, you can look and see and gauge what our level of caution is. Um, there are numerous monitors and oversights that actually provide their own forecasts. So the independent budget office, the city controller, the state controller, the financial control board also does, and the city council finance does as well, present their own forecast. Um, I have taken a look at those forecasts almost at every plan to see where the council is, where the IBO, where the financial control board and others, I take those forecasts very seriously, to see where we are in comparison to those. So I think that that is there for that purpose. Um, and it's, we've always continued to have conversations with all of the auditors, monitors about where our forecast is, <clears throat> excuse me, compared to theirs. So would you be willing to create a revenue forecast reserve in the budget? I don't How think that's necessary. The goal, if, if I understand you, Speaker, is to present a level of transparency and have a gauge to look at 
where the OMB forecast is relative to, as a cautionary forecast, um, what, how does that compare to others? And that is out there and exists. And I, again, I look at it, my staff looks at it and takes it very um, seriously. And they are there, there's numerous ways to look at that. IBO, as I said, controllers do that, state and city, as well as council finance. So I think it's our perspective as we <clears throat> work with OMB, look at your forecasts, look at all the other forecasts you've talked about, the state controller, the city controller, the independent budget office, citizen budget commission, the ratings agencies, all of the folks that do this type of work, that we think there does need to be a level of improvement on transparency from the OMB side. Because we feel like uh, mid-year we aren't able to fully understand, and again, we're, we're glad that you all approach it with the perspective you approach it, but we don't feel like, from our perspective, from the council finance side, we have the level of transparency necessary as we're tracking the budget throughout the fiscal year to be able to understand uh, those adjustments. So I'd love to be able to work with you on, if, on creating the level of transparency that we find necessary to do our jobs, while at the same time saying up front, as I did, that we agree with the guiding principles that you use and how you approach this, but we would like some more transparency on it. Of course. I, I think our, we, we want to work with the council. We want to make sure that uh, the council, uh, particularly your finance team, is very clear about where our forecast is and what we see are the risks to our forecast. And if there's any clarity that's needed on the current forecast that we have in prelim, happy to have those meetings and conversations and moving forward to the executive budget. We, we do do a briefing, but if there's more extensive briefing, and Speaker, I would say if you want a briefing by my staff and me on where we are with our forecast, we'd be happy to do that. I, I, would, I would appreciate that, so let's follow up on that. I just want to end with this and turn it back to the, the chairs. Uh, I think doing a savings plan uh, and asking city agencies for uh, targets and making um, potential cuts is actually a very good exercise. And I think it's an exercise that we should probably do in a more formal way on an annual basis, whether you call it a PEG, whether you don't call it a PEG, whether you call it a savings program, whatever you call it, I think it's actually a very good exercise for agencies because when the tough times do come, they should kind of have the muscle memory of when they're looking on a regular basis of where they can save money. So I don't think this is a bad thing at all, uh, but what I want to say today, and I said at the outset of the preliminary budget process, and I've said publicly um, to the press is, um, I'm not sure the budget dance between any executive and any legislature will ever end, and I don't think that's a realistic expectation to, uh, to think that's going to happen. But I do want to say that a line in the sand for me as we move into executive and into adopted is, uh, is I don't want to waste time going into executive budget talking about social service cuts talking about cuts to vulnerable New Yorkers, talking about cuts to programs that we know work and that are helpful, talking about cuts for immigrant communities, on adult literacy, on summer youth jobs, on all of these things that collectively we together have invested in uh, since the mayor became mayor and since before I was speaker of this body. And so I will be extraordinarily disappointed and angry, frankly, if the executive budget comes back with cuts on these programs which serve so many New Yorkers, the most vulnerable New Yorkers, New Yorkers living in poverty, whether it's as the chair said on emergency food, which we worked together on last year and you all increased in the executive budget last year before adoption in response to our preliminary budget response. I, I just want to say at the end of these preliminary budget hearings, I do not want to come back here a month from now at the start of our executive budget hearings having a fake dance in some way or negotiation on things that just aren't going to fly and making cuts to seniors and making cuts to children and making cuts to emergency food and making cuts to immigrants, and making cuts on those populations and programs that we've worked on together and programmatic areas where we share the same values is a, will be a big waste of time. I don't know if that's what's gonna happen. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen, but I just wanna say at the outset, so my expectations are clear and that I'm as candid and transparent as possible as the executive budget starts to get put together and hammered out that 
I really don't want to see that. I want us to actually build a greater social safety net in New York City and not tear away at the social safety net when the federal government attempts to do that every single day. So I say that with respect, with respect to you and OMB, with respect to all the agencies that we partnered with, with respect to the mayor's office who we've negotiated and worked with over the last many years, and I hope that in a spirit of cooperation, and, and I don't mean this personally towards you, I don't want a level of sort of game playing or we're gonna pretend like we're gonna cut this even though we know the council's not gonna stand for it so it can get restored at, at adoption. I don't wanna play that game. Mayor Bloomberg did that with firehouses and with other things. We, I don't think this administration has done that frequently uh, over the last uh, six years and I hope that given we have a formal peg that has moved forward and that cuts are being identified in a more formal way that that doesn't happen going into the executive budget. And I just wanted to say that so you know where I stand uh, as OMB starts to work with the agencies on formulating what the executive budget will actually look like. Well, Speaker, I, I would say neither do I want to play the budget dance, nor does the mayor. And clearly, as we move forward with this process, we want to be extremely mindful, and I know that my entire team is pushing the agencies to think about where we can achieve efficiencies, where we can maximize revenue, and then looking at where, in fact, we have programs that we may have to reduce. Now, I can't say that it's always going to be in agreement as moving forward, and once we actually present the executive budget that we and me, the administration and the council agree on what that looks like, but I can tell you that that is the level of priority and criteria that we're applying to looking at the overall savings program. Thank you, Director, I appreciate it. Thank you, Deputy Director, as well. Thank you both for being here and your entire staff and team. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Um, we've also been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal, Councilmember Levin, Councilmember Richards. And, um, here we go. Spill some water. <laughs> Uh, let me just talk a little bit about gaps to the education budget. Um, the council has identified some potentially very serious shortages in the Department of Education's budget. As we discussed the last time, the state budget poses a threat to revenues that schools rely on. There are other significant risks that arise from underestimated spending projections for school bus contracts, for the New York City School Support Services contract, for child care contracts, for charter schools, and for Carter cases. The Department of Education's budget for pupil transportation contracts is currently at $60.7 million less than fiscal 18's actual spending, even though spending on pupil transportation contracts is expected to increase over the year. DOE's budget for the Carter cases is only $293 million, even though the actual cost of Carter cases was $463 million. Finally, there is a $163 million shortfall in the fiscal 2020 school facilities budget compared to the current year. In particular, the budget doesn't accurately reflect the cost of the contract with New York City School Support Services, which DOE expects will cost $672 million this year. The um, New York City um, School Support Services budget for fiscal 19 is only 649, 600, 649 million, and for fiscal 2020 is only 45 million. So how do you explain um, why DOE's budget is underfunded by hundreds of millions of dollars for critical school supports? Chair, uh, you, you put a number of different pieces into that, um, looking overall at DOE's budget. So I'm going to start off with a couple, of, and then I'm going to turn to Ken to talk about um, transportation, and I think you also mentioned NISIS. So relating to Carter's, I think, cases, this is one of the much harder uh, expenses to predict, given what the caseload looks like moving forward and in the current year. Um, we, on a regular basis, are working with DOE to actually look at what their um, cases level is like, what they anticipate it to be, and then reflecting those changes in the plan that's coming forward. And so we have continued to do it in that way. Um, and we will reflect any changes in terms of what any additional costs are needed for the Carter's cases in the executive budget. And let's turn to Ken to take the transportation piece. Right. Um, with regard to the upcoming RFP for uh, pupil transportation, uh, that 
As you know, uh, the administration and I believe the council also is supporting legislation to allow us to do a bid out, including the EPP, uh, as we've been seeking for the last five years. I, you know, last year uh, it did pass both houses. It was vetoed by the governor. Uh, again, this year we expect to see this uh, come up and we're, we're hopeful that this year we can get uh, that piece of legislation passed. Once we have that in place, uh, we will be able uh, for many of our contracts to open up to bidding, which we, you know, we're hopeful that competition will, will provide for efficient contracts. It's difficult to ascertain where you land until after you do the bidding, get back the bids and, and find out about pricing. Um, with regard to uh, NISIS, um, I know that there's been a lot of discussion about this back and forth. Uh, as we looked in the preliminary budget, uh, we looked at the spending year to date uh, at NISIS, and we believe that the, the, the appropriation we have right now is sufficient for them. Um, we are, though, going to continuously monitor their actual level of spend and what's going on in the schools. And, you know, to the extent that money needs to be added in order to keep a good level of maintenance and cleanliness in the schools, we'll make that adjustment at that time. So it looks like it's about $600 million less. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not address the, the second point you made. Thank you. Um, so the, the second part is as we roll into the following fiscal year. I'm sorry. I concentrate on the 19 portion. Um, if you recall, this money uh, for cleaning used to be in the, the, the city's, the DOE's main budget, if you will, right, before the creation of NISIS. Um, that contract was three years in length. The contract comes up. Uh, that, that $45 million is not all the funding we have in for schools. We have a residual number, you know, approximately $600 million that is currently in a different U of A. Um, we will, uh, as we renew the, the NICES contract, presumably, uh, we will you know, reshift that money to, to that uh, contract code so that the 45 is, is sort of an uh, uh, artifact of the, the fact that the contract expires. So you're expecting that to, ra to, ra to, to go up by probably at least $600 million. Yes. Okay. But that money, just to, just to be clear, that money already exists in DOE's budget. It's simply in a different U of A. Okay. Okay. Uh, why does the um, budget for the child care, um, it, it seems like um, it's uh, in DOE, do you think it's going to cost, at ACS it's less than what I think it will cost at DOE. And it seems that you're just pulling the cost of what it would cost at ACS into DOE. Don't you expect it to go higher because of the rate of pay in the DOE versus the rate of pay at ACS? Well, the, the transition that we're doing is moving our contractors from having contracts with ACS to having contracts with DOE. DOE SBO contracted services are 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 paid essentially at, a, at the same kind of rates as as the uh, the ACS contracts, and it, it's it's essentially DOE is taking over those contracts and the administration of it, which you know makes sense to have them under under our education agency. But but this is not uh, uh, you know an insourcing from the CBOs into our school-based uh, functions, uh, where I understand obviously if we if that were the case, there would be substantial increases in cost. And yet, nevertheless, there are still some differences, particularly in salary. I don't think that's true as we transition from DOE contractors. We will have DOE contracts with the same CBO providers that we're currently using, and if they're represented by 1707 Local 205, they'll still be covered by that agreement. It's sort of, it, you know, it's not even a change of employer for the employees. It's only a change of who the contracting entity is in the city. It's moving from ACS having a contract with the provider to DOE having a uh, similar contract with the provider. All right. Um, several years ago, there was a serious concern among many of the city's cultural institutions about a change the administration made regarding payments to cultural institutions' retirement system. In a nutshell, um, due to the introduction of early learn and cuts to ACS childcare, approximately 1,200 daycare employees withdrew from the plan. This necessarily shifted 
a withdrawal liability of approximately $40 million to the remaining participating employers in the plan. And the city has not reimbursed uh, the cultural institution's retirement system for this liability. The administration's planned shift of the ACS child care system to DOE could again result in the withdrawal of daycare workers from CIRS. The RFPs for child care that the DOE released this month advises bidders to include fringe cost in their estimates, but does not speak to continued participation in the CIRS. Given the changing landscape of the city's child care system, it is likely that the membership in CIRS will also change. Additional withdrawals will, um, um, will mean even more strain on the remaining cultural institutions in the pension plan. Has the administration or the DOE considered the impact of the child care shift in CIRS also? I don't know yet um, how we would be able to anticipate, you know, whether the employers who wind up winning the, the, the bids for the, on, on this new RFP, whether they will be participating or non-participating in CIRS. It's, it's our assumption right now that, that the outcome will not materially change the enrollment in CIRS, but we will have to wait to see how um, the actual bids come back and whether those employers are participants. So why doesn't the DOE RFP require continued participation by 1707 as contracts are awarded? If the employees are represented by 1707-205, part of their contract, their labor agreement, includes participation in CIRS. To the extent that there are non-1707 uh, uh, represented vendors, um, they may or may not participate in, in CIRS. So uh, how are contributions currently made to CIRS? Contributions are, are made um, principally, well, I, I shouldn't say, they're made in, in, in essentially uh, the two large employer groups are daycare and the cultural institutions themselves. Cultural institutions themselves um, make payment to CIRS based on their membership. Uh, the city reimburses them for their city funded positions. On the daycare side, uh, the city uh, currently directly makes contributions to CIRS based on the, uh, the daycare membership at the, at the vendors. Um, the city has, has been making those contributions in that way for a very considerable period of time. Will the administration pay for any withdrawal liability that results from the DOE's new child care contracts? We don't believe that uh, a withdrawal liability would be created. Okay. Um, a little bit different, on a little bit different note, um, when uh, some of the um, uh, AC, a, ACS uh, centers turned over to DOE, uh, there was a question about vacation time and about um, um, personal time and accrual of that. Has that been settled? Um, I'm not familiar with that. I'll have to get back to you. Okay, because that was a major uh, problem when, when that occurred. Um, let's just talk a little bit about units of appropriation. At last year's executive budget hearing, we asked if OMB would consider additional units of appropriation in the budget. Your response was yes, but it would take a year to analyze and assess how to incorporate additional U of A's into the budget. As a follow-up in last year's budget response, the council submitted an, ex an extensive list of proposed additional U of A's broken out by agency. Um, it was our expectation that at this point, uh, we'd be closer to finalizing additional U of A's to include in the fiscal 2020 budget. Um, so where is, um, the, uh, where is OMB in the process of adding the requested additional U of A's uh, for the large agencies like DHS and, um, and NYPD? Um, I don't recall a, us saying that it would take a, a year on looking at the U of A's. I think I, at adoption, um, we did add, in fact, several U of A's. I know that most recently um, Latanya has sent me a formal letter asking us to look at and consider a number of different U of A's and wants a response from us at the, before the executive budget, which I will definitely do. Um, the two agencies that you mentioned, I think there is, particularly on DHS, we have had conversations about where we could do that. 
Um, I will say that I am very concerned, and I know that Commissioner Banks would share this concern with me, that trying to break out U of A's, particularly on the contract side, would actually cause a great disruption on the actual services and for the services of not-for-profits, because it would mean actually having to re-register contracts. I can see Councilmember Rosenthal looking at me with eyebrows raised, um, which would mean delays in actual payments to providers. And so that's the one area that I did say was a caution, but there's room for us to look at providing transparency on that front. On the uh, police department front, I think that there has been a request, and I will put this in my response, around trying to provide more U of A's, um, particularly for some of the positions, and I think that is of great concern because it would have basically hampered the police department's ability to be able to respond to being able to move from, you know, police from one uh, particular event to another, given what is happening. I don't want to actually hamper their ability in any way. I know that the police commissioner and his CFO have also said this, but again, we can have a conversation about many different agencies. I know that the list is quite long and extensive of, of what you're looking for for U of A, so we'll continue that conversation. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about the partial hiring freeze. Sure. The administration has indicated that it will impose new hiring restrictions on vacant positions and on newly vacated positions in order to reduce PS spending. Testimony offered at the hearing has shown that there is not a clear uh, understanding of the scope of the hiring freeze. By our, by our estimates, there are approximately 5,000 full-time civilian positions across the mayoral agencies, and collectively, the uniform positions are at about 1,300 over-budgeted headcount as of December 2018. Can you explain the uh, hiring controls that we put into place? And will any agencies or classes of employees be exempted from the hiring freeze, such as police officers, teachers, crossing guards, or whatever? Well, you, you just covered several critical areas that are exempt from the uh, deepening of the hiring freeze. Maybe what I should do is just go back and talk a little bit about how the hiring freeze has changed when we announced the preliminary budget. <clears throat> so. Uh, when we launched the partial hiring freeze, we sent out clear instructions to the agencies around which positions were exempt, and clearly frontline staff was one of them, and also asked agencies to categorize in other various areas where they have critical hiring needs. With the deepening of, and that was related to filling vacancies. With the deepening of the hiring freeze, we're now looking at not just the vacancy that you want to fill, but the attrition that has occurred over the last month, two months, and working with the agencies to actually say, do we need to, we need to look at where you are trading staff, and do we need those staff, can we do things differently? This is not layoffs, by the way, this is attrition, meaning the staff person separates from that position, and where is that position, critical in nature, do you need it? So that is the deepening of the hiring freeze. The exemptions remain. But as another step, step to that, as agencies are presenting, if it's not a frontline staff um, position or uh, obviously a police class would clearly be exempt, we are looking again and scrutinizing even the vacancies. Um, let me talk a little bit about one shots. The fiscal 2019 budget includes uh, 91.6 million in one time funding uh, that were previously fiscal 2018 council initiatives and that support core programs at city agencies such as adult literacy, parks maintenance, and some youth employment program. And these initiatives are funded year after year by the council and have become integrated into the services that the agencies provide. I think many of these services were or are the services that the speaker mentioned prior to just leaving about the uh, safety net that he wants to uh, ensure. Um, has OMB looked at any of these initiatives to assess if they should be baselined, um, and um, if not, um, can the council work with OMB to start the baselining process for these initiatives? Well, actually, um, Chair, I thought the speaker was referring to the fact that our PEG program is actually looking at both fiscal years 19 and 20, and many of these one-shots are in 19 only. So 20, many of them are not reflected in the fiscal year 20 budget. I think this is a very challenging time that we face moving forward, obviously with the implementation of our first PEG program, um, which has to be achieved within the next month. And I think in terms of moving forward for fiscal year 20, those are conversations that we will have with the council going into the adopted budget process. 
So not included in the budget is uh, money for bridging the gap uh, to provide um, social workers for those who are living in shelters. Uh, yesterday we had a hearing on Thrive, and uh, one of the questions that I asked the First Lady and uh, Director Herman was um, about the um, continuous funding for bridging the gap. Uh, should we expect to see continued funding for the Bridging the Gap program in the executive budget, or what is your thinking on that now? This is a clear priority for the mayor. Um, this is a program that we initiated, initiated excuse me, and we have, in fact, increased our investment. The mayor has asked um, our team to work with DOE to continually evaluate and monitor and assess the program. That led to us actually redirecting some of the program's resources um, into different parts of it and then increasing our investments. And so this is not a program that you would expect to go away moving forward. It's a program that we continue to evaluate and assess and is a key priority for us moving forward. Um, all three rating agencies, the speaker spoke a little bit about our ratings, but all three rating agencies have expressed concerns about the city's long-term liabilities, including debt, unfunded pension liabilities, and unfunded health insurance liabilities for retirees. To quote Fitch, growth in the budget burden associated with these liabilities would negatively affect the city's credit rating. How seriously, in your opinion, is the city taking the issue of long-term liabilities, including but not limited to pensions? I think the answer is very seriously. Um, as you uh, probably know, the city is contributing uh, in the neighborhood of $10 billion to the pension fund each year. We are on track to uh, reach 100% funding in the next 15 years or so. Um, our, our funding ratio has been going up over the last uh, five years pretty steadily, uh, and our pension contribution is plateaued at about that $10 billion forecast level. Um, so we are, we are on track to fully funding that liability. Um, with regard to the, uh, the OPEB liability, the, the, the administration has made a contribution to the Retiree Health Benefits Trust each year of this administration, and I think there was some discussion just a, a little while ago with the speaker talking about you know, the desire of the council to, to see money, as we did last year, put into the trust. Um, I don't, I think that um, the level of, of funding that we have for that liability is appropriate. The fact that we put money into the, the trust each year is prudent. I think that, you know, uh, any sort of talk about pre-funding that liability like we do with the pensions would be unfair to current uh, taxpayers and citizens. Uh, it would deprive people of, of services for liabilities, the cost of which is somewhat speculative. Um, and so overall, we, we monitor this, we take it seriously, um, and we've, uh, we're on track to do uh, you know, all the right things in uh, both liabilities. <clears throat> uh, the growth in city funds has varied over the years, and I'm gonna put up a slide. Uh, as you can see from the slide, I think, yep, <coughs> there it goes. Um, Bloomberg's three terms saw an average growth in city funds of 6.3% annually. The last five years of the de Blasio administration also saw a significant growth in city funds of almost 5% annually. The preliminary budget, however, shows average city funds growth of only 2.4% annually. Can you explain why the administration's estimate for city funds growth is so low? I mean, I, th I think the, the overall point here, just in terms of growth in city funds, is actually a, a good thing, because we're growing, we're actually reducing our reliance on city funds, and it, the reduction is actually a good thing, right? We're generating more revenues, and we're actually achieving more savings. As I talked about, the fact that we've achieved $6 billion worth of savings, reoccurring savings in the baseline moving forward. So I, I think that's a good thing. Do you expect it to go up or down in the executive budget? 
I think that's hard to, to say at this point, given um, we have to continue to look at where we are at the PEG plan um, and moving forward, as well as looking at where we are and assessing some of the um, initiatives that you and talked about in terms of DOE. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn it over now to Chair Gibson, who has questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon again, um, Ms. Hartzog, to you and your team. Um, I wanted to focus several of my questions on the 10-year capital strategy. Um, it's been a huge focus of the subcommittee. And I first wanted to, there's a graph uh, on the screen. Um, the City Council has been in communication with a few of our city agencies and has even been informed by OMB that the agencies were given a target by OMB to move significant plan amounts to the outer years of the strategy and the capital commitment plan. Um, from our perspective, any movement of the plan amounts beyond fiscal 2023 is seen to us as a cut to the overall capital commitment plan. So I wanted to ask, do you anticipate any delays in capital projects that will be caused by any of these movements? Chair, can I just ask for clarification on, on your perspective of why you see that as a cut if we're moving out of 23? I just because we would see, right, if we're reflowing, we're actually more realistically projecting what the plan would be. It doesn't mean that that program is actually, or that capital project, excuse me, is cut. It's just reflecting a greater reflow of our budget to actually reflect how we spend. This is something I know that you said we've been doing well on. Clearly a priority for us. It's not everything that um, you know we want to achieve. There's more to be done, but right now, the, the budget continues to be slightly front-loaded. We've done as much as we can in the preliminary budget. We're going to continue to push for that within the executive budget to reflow it. But in fact, if you look at the out years, you would see of uh, the 10-year plan, it is more reflective of where our actual spending is than the first four years. Okay. No, I appreciate it and recognize uh, that we've been really focused on the front-loading, particularly in the first five years. But what we don't want to see is if we're asking agencies to balance that out a little bit more so that it's not high in the first five years and then it goes down to anything like a zero, we certainly know that's not realistic. We just want to make sure that that wouldn't be a cut or a reduction in any of the existing capital projects before that particular agency within that time frame. Um, I Does think, that make sense? Yeah, I think what you're saying is you don't want to see us actually reduce or eliminate a program as we're doing the reflow. And I would say we're Correct. not. We're, what you will see moving forward in the executive plan is we'll continue to actually do another right reflow of the total 10-year plan. Okay. And so I anticipate, and we're working very hard towards that, that you would see some of 20 go into 21, and that would keep cascading out. Okay. And so you would see 24 move into 25, ex and that would, et cetera. That's what I mean by the cascading. Okay. And what metrics did OMB use to determine some of the targets for the agencies? Was there some sort of a metrics that was defined, or was everyone given the same target regardless of past commitment history? No. no. Everyone is not given the okay. same target. Um, okay. There, uh, we do look at past commitments, um, and clearly the agencies that are actually really <clears throat> committing a significant portion of their capital plan, DEP, DOT, mm -hmm. um, HPD are some of the top, obviously, DOE. Mm -hmm. And so that, obviously, they're spending. We're not giving them a target of actually cascading out significant portions of their executive, of the, sorry, the capital plan in the executive budget. Okay. So other agencies that commitments are low, we are asking them to actually reforecast and cascade out to better reflect where their actual spending is. Okay, that was my next question. Mm -hmm. um, will OMB bring each agency to target if they, not ha if they have not met it on their own? So you're working um, consistently with each agency to make sure that they do reach their targets? The, the capital plan, in terms of agencies reaching their target, we are a little bit more flexible with right. because we don't want a situation where we ask the agency to cascade and they can actually register and uh, commit in the current year and then they run into a problem. So we don't, we have a little bit more flexibility 
on that front. But clearly we have, as you've pointed out, Chair, much more work to do on better reflecting year by year what our actual commitments will be. We're working okay. on that. And do you know the amount that of, of funding has been moved past fiscal year 2023? The value on that? I think we got figures for 1920. You're right. 20. I gave you figures for 1920 and 21. Right. But I'll get you the the figures for 22 and 23 is what you're asking. Right. Yep. We'll okay, that's fine. Um, so when we discussed the 10-year capital strategies, uh, lack of funding in the outer years that we're speaking to, um, a lot of our concern was also about recognizing that many agencies have projects that span uh, well beyond five years, obviously over a 10-year period. Um, including uh, the construction of new schools. The recently announced $10 billion Lower Manhattan Resiliency Project has now been added. So what we wanted to understand is, will the final, right, final working product of the 10-year capital strategy include the full funding for all of our priorities, such as SCA's five-year capital, the $10 billion um, for the Lower Manhattan Resiliency, as well as the funding of the four borough-based uh, facilities to replace Rikers Island? We are in the process of looking at all of the, um, as you know, different proposals that the agencies are setting forward with the intention of updating the 10-year plan within the executive budget. Some of those that you mentioned are definitely part of our conversations. There's also others that are, mm -hmm. we're talking I through. I could list them all. <laughs> I know there you more. could. Uh, will you also allow agencies to add new capital funding as you continue speaking with them to the outer years of the final 10-year strategy at exec? Or would you only ask them to move uh, existing funding to the outer years. So would there be new money or just movement of existing money? We're having conversations with the agencies about reflecting projects in the out years of the 10-year plan. Okay, and new then I would, I would also assume that with some of our, well, they're all priority projects, but particularly the project like the bar based facilities, which is being expedited um, and is very important to the mayor and the administration, um, projects like that would obviously get a lot more attention in terms of potentially adding new capital if that's necessary along the way, correct? I, Chair, I apologize, because I, could you repeat the question? Sure. I, I didn't hear the first part, I sure. apologize. Uh, with a lot of our priority projects, um, and I'm bringing up one specific, which is the bar based facilities that we're building in four boroughs to close Rikers Island. Uh, if there is a need moving forward to add more money to the overall capital strategy for priority projects, is that something that OMB is going to consider, or are we only going to look at um, shifting some of our existing funds in the capital strategy? It's, it's yes, we will consider adding. Okay, that was my that. question. Yes. Okay, so in, in your testimony and as well as my opening, I talked about the capital budget project detail report, um, and I have a slide to reflect that. Um, we asked a question in our earlier hearing this month, and in response in the follow-up letter, uh, we learned that OMB uses the capital budget project detail report to track capital projects. Uh, the City Council has really started reviewing the report and we've noticed internally that some of the basic information is missing from the project data. Um, and so if this report was fully updated and complete, we believe it's an extremely valuable resource. So I want to give credit and recognize that this detailed report we believe is very useful, um, but our concern is the frequency of its update as well as how much information is provided. So my question is how does OMB ensure the information reported by agencies in the capital project details report is up to date and is accurate? And the slide you're seeing is just one example of a fire department project. The original budget says zero. The community boards also says zero. It's, it says citywide. And it's just missing some information. So we just wanted to understand how you oversee agencies supplying information for the detail report. Sure, I want to point out that this report is given to the council at every plan 
Um, I appreciate that the council was taking a much more in-depth look at it, and to the extent that there are questions and needed clarity, um, we, we should be having conversations on an okay. ongoing basis about it, it as the council gets the report on a regular basis. In this particular instance, um, my team is telling me here that the money for this project is held in emergency holding code, and once fire needs to access it, then the money is moved out and a new project ID is created. And the reason why I say that we should continue to have conversations is because there are nuances to certain projects um, and processes that the council, obviously, you know, you're reading a report and trying to understand it without understanding what the nuances are, and we'd be happy to have those conversations and provide that in transparency to you on how, that, how this could happen. Okay, does that typically happen with some agencies where their projects are in an emergency holding? It's, it's typical of some of our agencies. I, I can think of DEP being one of them. Um, fire is obviously another instance, but there is, it is a typical practice, for, but okay. not for the entire. It's just for a couple of projects that you would see this happen. Okay, and what instructions or guidelines does OMB give to agencies in providing the information that's necessary for uh, the project detail report? Well, I, I, if, I'm not sure if you're referring to this instance because- I, No, just general. In not not in terms of this specific project, but just in general, the framework that OMB provides to the agencies in terms of providing the information for uh, this particular report. Well, all the data is provided as much as we possibly can with the exception of these certain instances for each, as you can see in this report, for each of the projects um, ID in the descriptions. Okay. Have you noticed with all of the agencies with regard to this report, if there are more consistencies along agencies in terms of some agencies that are providing the data, it's accurate, it's up to date, but then have you identified any areas where there are gaps in the system where we need to work with those particular agencies to provide more information for the detail report? Um, <coughs> There is some inconsistencies in the providing of the data from the agencies. I think it's something we could definitely improve upon in our work in getting the agencies to do that. And so conversations that we can have about moving that, moving forward, getting the agencies to do it and better reflecting more accurate data in the report. Okay, and each agency has the ability to make updates to the, the report as well, right? Chris, you should answer that. In terms of access? Yes, after every financial plan, we produce this report. So it coincides with the three commitment plans that we do. So every commitment plan that we do has this detailed backup uh, that supports every single project. Okay, and is there any reason why this report isn't available online? I think the, the real reason is it's, it's so long. Uh, we give it to the finance staff, it's on three CDs because it, it has so much data on it. Um, we can look to see if we can put it online, but it is an enormous amount of data when you take every single project and you put in all the milestones, start dates, original dates, budget dates, revised budget, and so forth. So I think it's just a matter of amount of data. Okay, and you did say CDs, right? Yes. CDs, okay. We give to the Council of Finance. Yeah, we're not a fan of those CDs, <laughs> just saying. Uh, we look. We, we love 21st century technology. I understand. We've Chair, received. If it's those a request CDs. for us to look at putting it online, we can do that. Okay. Yes, that is the request. We would love to see this uh, be provided online. Okay. I wanted to ask a question about cluster sites. Um, I work very closely with Commissioner Banks and DHS. Uh, we are in the midst, DHS is working with HPD on a potential acquisition of 17 buildings, 14 of which are in Bronx County, many of in, them in my district. And I was critical to Commissioner Banks earlier this week at the general welfare hearing because I was very concerned at the value of this acquisition. Almost $174 million that we are paying, $30 million over the city's own assessment through a third party company. And I was very concerned about the existing operations of the buildings. Uh, many of these buildings are not in good conditions. They currently have actively 
open hundreds of violations. And so my concern and my question to Commissioner Banks was number one, the reason why we are entertaining a contract $30 million over the assessed value of these properties, $174 million. And secondly, are we going to hold those landlords accountable to address the existing violations in the buildings today before we give them any more money? And thirdly, the future costs that we anticipate once we take over these buildings and turn them over to a local not-for-profit is going to be additional costs of renovations outside of the acquisition. So those are my general three concerns, not just from the perspective of the Bronx, but overall, um, what is the, the, your thoughts from OMB on how this is happening and what we can do to make this system better? So let's, let's start off with a little bit of facts here. The first is I believe that the appraisal that you're referring to is one that was done with HPD that had not actually considered eminent domain. The law department. So working with the law department and HPD, the appraisal that was done by the third party appraiser that the law department was done considered eminent domain. And we had to consider that as part of the appraisal, we would have been required to pay it three years out or we could have paid that cost and given permanency to over 1,200 children and adults. And on top of that, provided 261 additional tenants in these 17 buildings with permanent, affordable, and upgrades to their existing apartments and getting rid of what has been a horrible landlord and putting a nonprofit in place who will now be moving forward providing for the maintenance and operation of these buildings. This has always been part of our overall turn the tide plan, and this is part of providing a critical permanency for many families and children. And so I think that that cannot be missed in the overall priority that has been given for this project. I think that's really critical, and a critical component of us being able to provide uh, permanency for families and move them out of shelter. Again, on the cost side, the law department appraisal that was done had to do with actually looking at the valuation related to eminent domain. That is the big difference between what HPD had done a few years back and now looking at the possibility of eminent domain and what we had to pay. We're going to pay it three years from now or we're going to pay it now and provide the permanency for over 1,200 individuals and families. So it's your position that you agree that the city should be paying $174 million over the 143 that you acknowledged was the assessed value? I agree that it is based on an appraisal that was done by the law department and HPD that this okay. is the actual cost for purchasing of the buildings and that 1,200 families and children will get permanency and get a new landlord, a non-for-profit in place that will provide for 1,200 plus the additional 261 tenants to get upgrades needed to those buildings. Okay. Is the purchase of these units reflected in our budget today, the 174? There's a, the, we will be reflecting a portion of the, sorry, we'll be reflecting the cost within the executive plan. The entire amount? We're, we're currently looking at assessing HPD's overall housing budget, capital okay. budget. Okay. And what about the outstanding violations that exist in the buildings today? That is all part of the conversations that HPD and the law department um, are having as part of the closing process on the actual um, buildings. Okay, and then future-wise, when we do acquire the buildings, we are also understanding that there will be additional costs to renovate a number of these apartments, not just the cluster of families, but all of the traditional tenants in these buildings as well, right? There are additional costs for the rehabilitation of the units that um, moving forward, HPB will be doing that assessment. Okay, so we don't have numbers yet on how much it will cost in terms of estimates on renovating any of the units just yet. I believe HPD testified to that as well, yes. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask a quick question about state risks, and you talked about that in your opening, and as a former state legislator, I've been down that road too many times. Um, I know the mayor and some of the commissioners were in Albany yesterday with um, their staffs. Do you have any updates on any of the potential cuts that we've talked about, particularly TANF and social service funds? Uh, I know we're getting closer to April 1. Well, I'm sure, as you know, in your former capacity, things change in Albany by Every the day. 
well, yes. by the minute and by yes. the hour. Yes. Um, I think we are very pleased to see that both one houses included the restoration of many of these critical cuts, including the TANF funding that you just referenced um, and the funding to um, health care services as well. But it's, it's really down to the wire of when the budget finally gets enacted that we would see what the actual um, restorations look like. Okay. Um, I had another question. Uh, housing is a big priority for all of us. Um, and the HPD commissioner was here Friday and specified that the city is on track to build and preserve 300,000 units of housing by 2026 in the Housing NY plan. And to date, we have exceeded our targets in housing preservation, which I applaud. Um, where we find gaps are in the lowest income category of extremely low income. So we have met our targets in low income, middle and moderate income, but extremely low income, we are below our targets. There is a lot of advocacy, and I am not understating this at all, from many, many housing advocates, and I support them because the Housing NY plan recognizes 24,000 units of housing set aside for homeless New Yorkers, homeless families that are living in shelters every single night. We do not believe that is sufficient. Through the plan is FY 2026, but the immediacy and the need today is great. And our concern is if we allow that plan to move forward at the current priorities, then we're going to have more homeless New Yorkers that simply do not have housing because they can't afford the housing that is being constructed. So my question to you is, is there any consideration that the administration is looking at today that will raise that set aside from 24,000 to 30,000 just to recognize the need, the crisis, the urgency, and the priority of housing families that need long-term housing? There are a number of different strategies that we have in place that are effective and working around providing <clears throat> rental subsidies and supports to the most vulnerable. That includes all the work that is being done through our rental assistance programs. There is also a bill that is pending um, on, up, up in Albany, the home stability bill, mm -hmm. that would provide additional rental subsidies and enable us to move many more families into permanency. Um, that is one that I hope the council will work with us and support that it's getting done with the leadership of Assemblymember Hevesy and Senator Kruger. Um, in addition to that, on the, on the H Housing 2.0 side, we've added $1.9 billion for an additional 10,000 units for the extremely low income um, last year. So there's a number of different strategies that we've put in place and continue to put in place, including the one that you just questioned me about, which is clusters and moving to provide permanency to many families and children, over 1,200 in the case of the 17 buildings, um, and we will continue that strategy as well. So it's not just one that we rely on, which I think um, is not the answer, it's to have multiple strategies that are in place. I recognize that the 1.9 billion that you mentioned for the 10,000 units, is that 10,000 units over the course of the plan through FY 2026? Yes. Okay. Do you know how much that would be each year added on? It's within the overall housing plan budget and a number of units in total. We deepen the affordability of the existing number of units. Okay. Um, well, I, I do appreciate that, and I, I definitely think that it is in line with what this council supports, but I just have to be honest that it's still not enough. Uh, we are not building enough housing for families at the lowest end of the income spectrum. And as someone who represents an incredible amount of family shelters and shelters for single adults, I believe I have every right to demand this, that this administration does more. I said the same thing to the HPD commissioner because with the work we're doing around right to counsel, it's great. We're keeping families in their home, a number of different programs around anti-displacement, anti-harassment, partners in preservation. I can go down the list after my rezoning. I know them all and they're great. It's all a part of the different tools that we need to make this system work. But at the end of the day, with every opportunity and every project that I get in my my district, I'm able to get anywhere from 10% to 30%. Overall, 50,000 applications 
on one project. And so the numbers are enormous because I think the need is great. And so it's my hope, and again, not taking away from anything that has already been done, but just a recognition that it's still not enough. We don't have time to wait until FY 2026. We have families in need today, and we do so much. Their children are in public schools and all the other factors that we support. And I just have to urge OMB to really, really consider that request of 30,000. It doesn't take away from what we're already doing and what's in the plan, but it does speak volumes to this city's commitment to really address housing for the most vulnerable New Yorkers that we represent. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to our chair. Okay, thank you very much. I want to say we were joined by Councilmember Cornegy and Grudenchik, and now we have questions from Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, followed by Margaret Chin. Thanks so much, Chair. Good to see you, Director. Um, I have a couple of questions, just finding them. Um, I wanted to know, first of all, at yesterday's contracts uh, committee hearing, we talked about the um, uh, the savings achieved through procurement, and I asked at that time that they uh, that OMB possibly, if if you have this, could look over the last few years since the De Blasio administration came in. Um, how, how much savings has been, in, been put into the budget for procurement? Um, I believe that you're referring to any... I'm sorry, from, yeah, procurement savings. Right, you're referring to citywide savings that we've taken um, and anticipate as a result of implementation, full implementation of Passport. Well, I mean, this year I, I heard a number of $90 million for procurement <laughs> savings. I can follow up with you offline. Yeah, let's follow up offline. And but, you know, like usually in the preliminary budget, they announce where the savings are going to be. Procurement has been in there a couple of times. I th again, I think it's the citywide savings that we have reflected that are now in the baseline, but we can... Yes, get, those. Yes. We're How saying much? the same thing, and I think we have to get back to you with a number, and we can break that out for you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um, secondly, what's the timing on that, do you think? Like a day, a week, a month? A, a day. You can get Great. Secondly, about uh, the mayor's office to end gender-based... You should have taken the month, but... I'll take day. Yeah. I choose day. Uh, the mayor's office to end gender-based violence, where you just uh, um, created the office. It's no longer a commission. Um, is there a way to uh, put in units of appropriation in each of the agencies that do the work of uh, ending gender-based violence? So in other words, um, NGBV is in multiple agencies, I think mostly in HRA, and is there a way to call out you know, and say this is specifically to address ending gender-based violence? Um, you know, I think this is one of the areas where I'd say the, there's a portion of that work that's contracts. For us to do that, we run into the same challenge of re-registering contracts to a new U of A and what that Oh, goodness be. gracious. This is so, why footnotes exist. Don't, don't re-register a contract. But I think what we can do if you need um, greater clarity um, and we can provide that to you That'd be and great. any ongoing reporting that you want. Great. Yeah. Let's start there. Okay. Okay. That's cool. Yes. Okay, great. Third, in our um, hearings with any of the city agencies that provide, um, that have human service contracts in their uh, agency's work, um, we heard from the human service providers that um, the, that while it's very much appreciated, that this administration, after 20 years of complete neglect, this administration absolutely put in money in the budget for indirect costs, to get to minimum wage, to increase COLAs, that it's really, uh, sadly, because there had been so much neglect for 20 years, it's still deficient. And I'm um, wondering if, you know, this is something that 
the administration is considering. For example, you just put out a manual um, that would help the nonprofits determine what their indirect costs would be, but there's no funding in there for the actual indirect costs, so if they were to take the money for what has been agreed to is their indirect costs, there would be a cut to program services. So um, how do we get more money to pay for food, rent, uh, salaries, um, when you know they're hanging on by a thread? So we worked very hard with the non-for-profit sector to actually put together a consistent indirect rate policy. And I think what had been a real challenge for the sector was that many agencies- I'm gonna interrupt you because I get, I have a five, I, I'm on the clock. And so I just wanna get in the last question and I, I really think indirect costs are an unfunded mandate at this juncture and I would ask that you sort of help rethink it and rethink funding. But my last point, which is sort of included in this, is just on pay parity and consistencies, where you have two people in a contract budget doing the same work, paid for by different, even agencies, and doing the exact same work, and there's no pay parity. The nonprofit, again, has to not fund something programmatically in order to give pay parity, or else they're gonna lose staff. And as well as you know the ACS DOE pay parity problem. Okay, so on the issue Sorry. of indirect rate, yep. I actually um, disagree. We added 106 million dollars to provide for the indirect rate. I know, and, I and it well, wasn't let me, enough. I want to say, prior to that, there was there was not adequate funding for the indirect rate, and we brought everyone to a sufficient level to get to a 10 percent on average. I think that the sector is is has the Right, uh, right to ask for more on that front, but I think we've done a significant investment that had not been there for some time. And we created a policy across all the city agencies that was clear and consistent. And that took a lot of time and effort, and I think those things should be acknowledged. On the issue Good. of parity, I think the, we have done investments for the workforce of the nonprofit sector, as well as overall, to the tune of over $600 million, including the fact that we have done a lot of work on the 1707 front with the uh, collective bargaining contract that's in place currently. We can agree to disagree on this. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Director. Thank you, Councilmember Chim, followed by Levin. Thank you, Chair. Director Hassas, great to see you. We had a very robust DIFTA budget hearing. I heard. Uh, and so there's a budget gap, right, for DIFTA. And we were able to confirm that there is supposed to be a second tranche of 10 million for the model budget. So we also still have not gotten a clear commitment from DIFTA. They say they're working with OMB when the money for the food, increase in the food cost and the food service worker is gonna be added. And I hope to see it in the executive budget, but for the council, we hope to see the second tranche of the 10 million for the model budget uh, in this fiscal 2020 budget. So I hope that will happen. That's my first question. The second question is that in the hearing, we heard from DIFTA that is, there's 1,000 senior on the case management wait list and 100 on the home care wait list. Now for the clients, they have to be assessed by case management before they can even get home care. So that 100 of home care wait list really doesn't not, that's not the reality because you got a thousand waiting to get assessed. So, well, we heard some good news that in the state budget, uh, there's gonna be some money allocated for the expanded in-home service for the elderly, which is the great ISA program. Uh, and they might be able to get 3.9 million. And DIFTA said it would cost at least 5 million to clear the wait list. So, I want to know, can we get OMB to commit to clearing up that wait list to add an additional 
a million each to case management and home care, and also for DIFTA and OMB to work out a process that, so that we don't have a wait list every single year. Um, the administration always put money in at the end because we never managed to clear this wait list. And my last question, the third one, is about what we heard from DIFTA is that there were a, around at least 30 senior center that lost air condition during some point last summer, right? And if not most of them, but most of them are also a cooling center. So can we get OMB to commit to fundings to take care of all those air conditioned systems so that all the senior center will have air conditioned during the summer, especially because they're also a cooling center? So those are my three questions. So I think on the question of the food analysis that we talked about when we met, um, we made a commitment to have that analysis done um, in late spring, and I believe that DIFT is actually on track to do that. Um, I think the issue on the wait lists, there is additional funding that's being proposed at the state budget, as you mentioned. I think that is definitely a use of that funding to do that. We've worked very hard, as you know, um, I want to say it was like two adoptions ago, mm -hmm. to actually um, do an estimate on what the wait list is for both case management and home care and put that funding in and baseline that. But I think these are really challenging times to be able to make that commitment moving forward. To the extent that the state budget enacted actually includes the additional funds moving forward, absolutely for the state funding, but I think making a commitment at that this point in time, given where we are, um, that I cannot do. On the 30 NYCHA centers, I think this is something that obviously cooling centers um, cannot go without being able to meet that goal. Um, I will absolutely look into this and make sure that we address it. My first question, you didn't answer that one. Your first question. The, sec the 10 million oh, my for the model budget, which is a second tranche, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think there was more like five or six questions. That <laughs> no, that was my first question. Okay. The audience agreed. Uh, They're my witness. But there was supposed questions. to be another 10 million, which was confirmed by DIFTA, right? So we want to know is that if that 10 million will be in this year's the FY 2020 budget. Thank you, Councilmember, for keeping me on my toes. The, the 10 million additional is fiscal yes. year 21 for implementation of the next phase of the model budget. So we do have time for that piece of it. So you're not willing to put into this year? It's for fiscal year 21, well, not what, 20. Then so I you expect- have your 10 million currently that right, we began to implement in 19 and it becomes annualized in 20, and then the next 10 will be in 21 in addition well, to our work on the food. The effect. first 10 didn't take care of everybody, but mm -hmm. I think that the other big question is the food money for the food service worker and the f increase in the food costs. And I really hope to see that in the executive budget because the last time there was an increase in the food budget was 2014. I think that it would be very challenging for us to, to get that done within the executive budget. I think we have the analysis done, but I think it needs to have a full vetting um, for us to make sure that the, that analysis is accurate and we can actually- But the food increase is there. I mean, the, and then increase for the food service worker. It, the need is documented. The need is there. And you need to put the money in to show the administration's commitment. It happened with other agency. Monies were put in in the preliminary budget. And I didn't see that in Dipton. I was very disappointed. And I hope not to be disappointed in the executive budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Levin followed by uh, Councilmember Combo and then Councilmember Grudencic, and that'll wrap it up. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Director. So I have five questions. Uh, so I'll try to keep these. I, I, maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, them first, and, and we'll kind of go through them, and I can remind you of what they are if we get, we get lost. First one is um, uh, regarding pay parity uh, in the early learning system as it moves over from ACS to the Department of Education. Um, 
we know that this needs to happen in order to stabilize that system. Um, uh, work, uh, those the people that work, teachers um, that are working administrators in the early learn system at ACS are getting paid uh, $10,000 less than their counterpart in DOE UPK. They work longer hours, they work longer years. Um, this is, at this point, uh, a, you know, a justice issue here. Um, we need to do right by these teachers and uh, we cannot continue to have this level of disparity. And so I would be interested to know uh, how OMB is looking at this issue and what, um, what we think the cost would be and what we're prepared to do to rectify it. So that's the first question. Second question has to do with ACS's PEG, uh, which has a very high percentage target of uh, 7%, uh, much higher uh, than many, many other city agencies. Obviously, ACS is tasked with protecting the most vulnerable people in New York City, our children, uh, those children who may be at risk. Um, and so I want to know how you arrived at a 7% uh, PEG and whether OMB can give the commitment today that we're not going to uh, cut into services for uh, and programming at ACS as part of this PEG. Um, and whether or not if there are savings that were, that were or, or revenue that we're realizing um, that, uh, that that moving forward be baselined uh, and not seen as uh, as a, as a one-time uh, revenue. Um, next question is around um, the council last year with the mayor, the speaker, um, had an agreement, and it was our understanding that we had an agreement on um, uh, the uh, certain uh, programs for uh, in ACS, um, that would go towards foster care. Uh, and uh, they include uh, a number of, sorry, I have it here, foster care recommendation, $7.8 million, $3.3 million for kinship navigators, 2.8 for family visiting, and 1.7 for uh, workforce employment to support foster youth. Um, it's our understanding that uh, uh, only about 700,000 or 800,000 of that has been uh, allocated by ACS. And so it's, you know, our understanding was at adoption, these programs were going to receive $7.8 million, and obviously um, only about 10% of that uh, has been allocated. And um, so, you know, we're wondering what, what is going on there. I've asked Commissioner Hansel about this and haven't gotten uh, a satisfactory answer as to. Uh, why this funding was not budgeted as part of the adopted 19 budget. Um, next question is around unit of appropriations at Department of Homeless Services, um, where uh, right now we only have uh, two unit of appropriations, uh, PS and OTPS, um, which leaves a significant, uh, us with a, a real deficit of understanding uh, of, of DHS's budget and how they're, uh, how, how we're paying for, I mean, a lot of it's contracted, but we don't know um, how much is going towards things like rent or programming um, or, um, you know, other, other types of related services. And it's, uh, it's very difficult to do that type of oversight that we need to do if we don't know how budgets are being arrived at for particular contracts and where our priorities should be. Just for example, uh, our understanding is that uh, hotels, which uh, there are 90 hotels in the system that, ho that house homeless families and individuals, mostly families, those hotels don't have social workers. Even though tier two shelters, which represent uh, you know, a larger percentage of family shelters, they do have social workers. Um, but uh, at hotels, which is a sizable amount of, 
of funding, hundreds of millions of dollars, I don't know, four, five hundred million dollars, um, they don't have basic supports for children. And if you go to one of these hotels, you'll see that there's um, no space for these children. The rooms are, you know, 15 by 15 maybe. There's no refrigerator for them to, uh, it might be a mini fridge, but there's no real refrigerator. Uh, there's no stove. Um, there's no place for them to do their homework. There's no place for them to run around and be kids. Uh, there's no um, place for them to, uh, you know, just to, to, to put their clothing, uh, put their toys. Um, and, and yet, at the same time, we're not providing them with social workers. Um, and without a clear breakdown of programming, uh, and, and a correlated uh, budgetary uh, demarcation, we don't know if, the, if, if the, the funding being allocated is appropriate. And so we've asked numerous times for DHS's budget to be clearer in terms of units of appropriations, um, and we've been rebuffed uh, over and over again. Commissioner Banks made an argument the other day that it would hamstring uh, the agency in terms of what it's able to do because if they broke out too many units of appropriations, uh, then they wouldn't have any flexibility. There's got to be some way to make it practical while also allowing for some oversight and not just having two units of appropriations for a $2.1 billion budget. So those are my questions. Okay, so I'm going to start from the last question and then go to the top and um, have Ken talk about our efforts on pay parity. So on, and I think question four on the U of A and the question on getting greater insight into the um, hotel spending. So we at the point of adoption um, as a term and condition agreed to work with council finance to actually provide ongoing reports that break out some of the spending in light of what Commissioner Banks is talking about, which is the fact that if, in fact, we had to go and break out um, more U of A's, that it would actually result in having to re-register contracts. There has been a lot of effort for us to, as much as we can, expeditiously move contracts through. We're in the process of giving the rate increases right. as part of that. And so it's about 40 that some odd amendments that Commissioner Banks committed would be registered by the end of the fiscal year, which I don't, I mean, that's like 80% of them, so. Right, but as you know, going forward, there will continue to be amendments to contracts that happen all the time. And so I think even if you have a contract in place, you still have to go through the process of creating a new U of A and re-registering those contracts, which would ultimately lead to delays in payment, which is why we agreed to have an ongoing reporting as part of the terms and conditions. Um, my staff is telling me that as part of that, we have need, we need to finalize what the actual components of those reports are with council finance, but I think that would be very helpful to you I just because that is one of the challenges. I'd just like to point out that based on the agreement from last year, they were supposed to go along with the, the, the various plans. The November plan was delivered to us in early March. It's to start at prelim. We had the same conversation and we talked about this. That but we got the prelim report for the prelim plan, the January plan, the, the afternoon before our budget hearing last Friday, at three in the afternoon, and my budget hearing was on Monday morning, and we didn't receive the data that we, that we were supposed to get until three in the afternoon on Friday. I think we're talking about two different reports. So let me okay. circle back with Latanya on this too. We, the council had requested a very detailed report and we agreed to provide it, and I think we were still working through all of those various details that would give you that greater insight into it. And so we have yet to provide that for prelim, and we need to do that, and we will do that for you. Okay. Um, and I touched on the U of A issue um, that we just talked about, and that report taking care of that piece of it to some extent. On the 7.8 million for foster care, the agreement that we had at adoption was that we would have a number of pilots that take place at ACS on these initiatives to actually evaluate and see what their impact is, and then moving forward, we would determine whether or not, um, what their impact, and then fully fund them. On the issue of ACS. Sorry, just, just with that, I mean, that's something that I think there might be some disagreement on. I'll, I'll circle back with our finance director and the speaker, 
But when they reported back to us at BNT uh, in June of last year, uh, our understanding was, because we had a dollar amount, $7.8 million, that will be in the budget. So I don't know, you know what documentation there is of that, but, but we're going to have to discuss that as part of the 2020 discussion. I'm happy to oh. talk offline as well with you and with uh, Latanya. But, oh, okay, sorry, just adding to that, that question though, this year there's been a priority for fair futures as a as a as a as a, a, a uh, an initiative, and I, I just want to quickly get your take on that as well, if, if you wouldn't mind. I think preliminarily, as as I understand it, in the broad strokes of what the goal is in terms of providing additional supports for youth in order to reduce reliance on foster care. I think that's a, a very great initiative and worthwhile us having conversations about, especially if it reduces our reliance on foster care. I, Commissioner Hansel obviously in his expertise is much better positioned on that, but I think it's worth having conversations about. And is moving. OMB examining kind of what the budgetary impacts of that would be in terms of the benefits as well? I think this is very new. It was just uh, a just announced, I think, even yesterday or the day before, um, or at least this week. And so I think that's, we don't have much detail on it at this point, but I'm happy to talk with Commissioner Hansel about it. Okay. Certainly something that we would like to talk about in terms of our budget response and in the, in the exec. I'm happy to have conversations about that. Um, yeah. On ACS's PEG, just to uh, get to all of these, and I really want to clarify this, it is not 7%. Um, the value of the PEG is the way that that 7% is calculated is not the way OMB sees it. The 7% is off of their fiscal year 20 budget. Their peg value is across both 1920 and even into the out year. So that's, I want to be really clear, it is not 7%. And in terms of trying to look at opportunities to maximize revenue and reduce reliance on city funding, obviously that's always part of our goals um, as we look at the uh, citywide savings plan. And then, Ken, you want to talk a little bit about pay parity? Okay, with regard to the pay parity question, uh, the mayor has supported, uh, you know, this sector and this group of employees um, bringing, you know, support to, for the first comprehensive labor agreement since 2006, right? That agreement provided for the certified teachers uh, in the program for raises between 20 and 27 percent. Uh, that agreement, which is still current, between uh, the daycare council and DC 1707, local 205, will expire in September of, of 2020. Um, there have been substantial overall increases in the amount of money that we've spent on these, uh, in these programs. And by the end of the contract, we will have equalized the pay between the non U pre K teachers and the pre K teachers. Um, in the CBOs. But not with DOE UPK teachers, correct? That is correct. Uh, and we're committed to continuing the progress we've made in, in developing effective uh, compensation structures for early childhood education. Why on earth wouldn't we I have pay parity I, between DOE teachers and how much, I, I just, the question that I had was how much would that cost and what are we prepared to do about that? So let me ask your, your real pay pa real pay parity real pay parity. Well, that, that's because we could do it outside of the contract. We could do it in the RFP. It's not. We could do that. We could we could fund the daycare council to give pay parity to teachers. It would be unlawful for, for us or we can them update, we could, to give to give raises to employees outside the collective bargaining process. As you know, they are the exclusive bargaining, bargaining agent. It is not true. You could do it outside of collective bargaining. That's just that's just a question of law, right? Okay, but there's nothing that prevents us from doing that as part of collective bargaining. We could do that outside of a contract cycle. There's no, we just did it with, didn't we just do that with teachers? We just, we, we didn't, was that, a, was that a new contract? We have that a we'd... new contract with the UFT that begins on the expiration of their old agreement. We negotiated it in advance. There's, we're not allowed to, to negotiate in advance for this? We're not the negotiators, the, the, the daycare councils, their employers? That's, I'm sorry, but that's not. The daycare council stands with 1707 at a rally calling for pay parity. Daycare council is not funded to have to pay the teachers. So to, 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 the, 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 using the daycare council is a fig leaf. I'm sorry, I, but I'm it not. is ultimately trying, the city trying. of New York and OMB and OLR that make this decision. And it's, 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 you, can't, you can't have the daycare council do it without the money to do it. 
I'm just trying to answer your okay. question. Okay. How much would it cost? How much would it cost so to get pay parity? cost, I think one of the most interesting questions then becomes how do we define parity? Because as you know, the UFT has a web of compensation factors, including experience and education. Depending and, and the application of, of those factors to the current group of employees and future group of employees would, would help to determine and substantially affect the cost of, of achieving that. And we've been asking this question for like three or four years, so you would think by this point that we would have, that we would have thought through what that cost would be. I'm sorry, but this is not a new issue. It's not a new issue. It's obviously one that we prioritized. We've actually made investments into the co existing collective bargaining agreement. It's one moving forward, clearly a top priority of the mayors as we look at 3K expansion and actually bring early learn over to DOE and the most recent RFP that we're going to continue to have conversations about it. All right, I'm just, the whole system is going to fall I, apart gonna, if we don't address this. I'm the gonna whole end system it here, will fall apart. Although this is a very important subject for Thank me you, as well. Thank you. Thank uh, but we need to move on, and we have other council member questions. Uh, council member, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo. Thank you. I certainly want to add my voice as a mom um, of a son who is in one of our child care. Uh, organizations, I'm deeply concerned about this particular issue. So my question is, how is the city preparing or are they aware that DC 1707 teachers are considering a possible strike? And they are looking at that. Have you looked at ways to prepare should that happen? Because I obviously, like thousands of other moms and dads, have to go to work. And what would happen when we talk about a, a fair city, when we talk about wanting moms to be at work and, and to be able to do their best job, if we're not uh, able to come to work because of a possible strike, what are the administration's thoughts on a possible strike? I mean, clearly the administration does not want a strike to happen. And clearly, as I said, uh, when uh, Council Member Levin was asking the question, we believe that early childhood education is a priority, and that is clearly reflected in our investments both in universal pre-K and ramping up on 3K in the most recent RFP that was released. On the issues of implementation and what would happen, that really is DOE and ACS in coordination um, to work with their contract agencies to implement. But as I said, moving forward, it is clearly a priority of, of the administration. Is it a priority of the administration that will be addressed and resolved in this uh, budget cycle? The collective bargaining agreement is one in which expires on September of 20. September of 20. And so that would be moving forward for a new collective bargaining agreement. So, so why has this issue the executive budget process? Why is this particular collective bargaining uh, issue taken far longer than so many of those that were resolved from day one when we came into the city council in 2013? So many were resolved. Why is this one taking so very long to resolve? From day one, when the 1707 contract had expired and been expired for many years, the mayor <clears throat> actually moved forward and made a significant investment in the salaries of teachers within the existing contract, with, as I said, expires um, in fiscal year 20. The next contract will be for that next round, and contracts overall have different dates of expiration and they're staggered across many cities, including the municipal workforce. So are what you're saying, and I, and I just want to conclude on this because I have other issues that I want to address, you're saying that in this budget year, this will not be a priority. That is not what I'm saying. You asked if it was actually tied to the executive budget, which is for, at this moment, moment point in time, right. the collective bargaining contract ends in fiscal year 20. If the, moving forward, the collective bargaining process happens, there is ample opportunity to add funding in the next plan cycle to update the plan for fiscal year 20. But your question to me was whether or not any funding is coming into this year's budget within the executive budget. And the That's answer to answering. that is yes or no? The answer is no, because the collective bargaining contract is not up. And there's no way for us to be able to support those teachers in that gap time? The existing contract provides funding and we, with a, or an agreement on what those salaries are, and we have already fully funded that contract. 
But at this time, I guess the clarity, because I have to make it plain and I have to bring it back to our communities in terms of where this issue lies, the ability to fill that gap, whether it's that 16,000 at base that is the, the, the disparity between uh, both entities, that gap can't be covered at this time without uh, a contract agreement. Could it be, and we're just choosing not to? It cannot be unless it's collectively bargained. That was. That's the point that Ken was making as well, too, that you can't simply provide a salary increase without collectively bargaining it. I'll have to speak at another time about that because I, it's very difficult to be able to go back to our communities for yet another year and to say to these same child care workers, once again, we're sorry to disappoint you, but your salary is going to remain however it's going to remain, and if some of you want to go and do something else, I guess you're going to have to do that because, again, this issue has not been resolved. And for me, being in the council almost six years and this disparity still happening is of great concern to me. I'm but happy to talk offline with you, council member. What I will say is, going back to many years ago when we were in the Great Recession and were not able to have a collective bargaining agreement and had to make cuts to childcare at that time, which was a very difficult time. The fact that we actually came in and the first thing that was done was do a collective bargaining agreement with 1707 and address and chip away at this issue, I think is significant and clearly a priority for the mayor moving forward. Okay, we certainly look forward to addressing this, for me, six-year issue that has been um, apparent for some time. I want to talk about, just very briefly, I want to talk about, and I want to ask these questions on the record so that they can be um, answered um, at another time because I understand we're pressed for time. So um, thousands of individuals from my community and all across the city have come together for the Metro IAF program, a home for all New Yorkers, low income senior housing as a model for citywide affordable development. What we saw in our communities were that black and brown uh, communities that are being ravished by gentrification, many houses of worship were losing their congregations. Many want to attend church, can't attend church because they're being pushed out of their homes. And so they came together um, to fight for senior housing in their communities. They came to City Hall, they came to areas, they've gone to Gracie Mansion, oftentimes with canes, wheelchairs, oxygen tanks, coming here to fight for affordable housing for seniors. Now, what we saw, they came here in celebration at the handshake, the Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus, along with many other members, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, at the time, public advocate Letitia James, Jamani Williams, many others, our state representatives have all come together to celebrate this $500 million. Now looking back, in terms of implementation, looking through the budget, they do not see the $500 earmarked anywhere. So we are at a loss in terms of where is the $500 million, where is it earmarked, where can we find it? That's the, that's the number one question that I want to have answered, but I'm going to ask the other questions. Um, which city agency is responsible for the implementation of the affordable senior housing plan? Um, Governor Cuomo allocated $15 million in low-income housing tax credit in support of East Brooklyn Congregation's Metro IAF's plan and this Vital Brooklyn initiative. Where will the first 1,000 units be constructed? What other tax credits have you allocated to finance construction in other neighborhoods and boroughs? How will the RFP process be structured? We have asked for a RFP process that can be structured so that MWBEs and local developers can actually win the bids because in my district I've seen no MWBEs, no local developers to actually be able to win uh, any of these contracts. How will local development companies and not-for-profit developers be prioritized in the RFP process? What is the process for identifying and vetting sites for development? How will specific NYCHA developments, local communities, and our boroughs be prioritized for affordable senior housing? And how will this project work with NYCHA Next Gen, if at all? Where are we in the pipeline for the development sites that Deputy Mayor Glenn identified for senior housing developments? 
These are all really critical questions. We have to go back to our communities and explain where the $500 million went, where is the senior housing. They are coming to the pastors and myself asking for applications, and we're not even able to give them enough information to say where the $500 million is in the budget. Where is it that we can look for it in the budget today? So um, let me, you've asked a series of questions, some of which I think are best for HPD to be able to answer around the process um, versus me. But on the actual sites for the 1,000, we have Ingersoll, Millbrook, Batanza, Sumner, Bushwick, Sotomayor, Baruch. And on the HPD side, um, 97 West, 169th Street in the Bronx, 516 Bergen in Brooklyn. Let me just stop you right there. When you say Ingersoll, are you talking about the Nitra Next Gen project that's already in construction that's yes. soon to be completed? Yes, those are the sites. Okay, we're not talking about those because that's old money that's been allocated, spent, in the ground, applications are out. We're talking about $500 million that was allocated in the most recent um, handshake deal um, that we had where it was announced and celebrated and it went out in a press release on both sides that this money was allocated. So take those projects off the table. We're, those numbers were insufficient in terms of the need of senior housing. So we want to know, since this new allocation of a priority of senior housing, where is that $500 million? The 500 is existing within the HPD budget, and it's for the sites that I just mentioned, as well as the balance of HPD sites, which I can go through. Hey, we're going to have to also end it because we need to move along here. Okay, can you just go through those particular sites? I'm happy to get them to you in writing if we could. You have a number of different questions, so we can- I will, if you could just list those sites, that would be helpful. Ingersoll, Millbrook, Batances, Sumner, Bushwick, Sotomayor, and Baruch. HBD is 97 West, 169th Street. In the Bronx, 516 Bergen, Brooklyn, Fulton Street, Brooklyn, and Astoria, in Queens, uh, DOT lot, did I get that right? Okay, we will have to further discuss this because that is in essence what the issue is. We're not able to find the $500 million and if we're talking about past projects that are already completed that should account for that $500 million, that's still a huge discrepancy and an inability on our part to be able to um, talk with our constituents about where that particular funding went. So we'd like to meet with you. Um, several requests from our side to the admin, admin side has not granted that type of meeting for us to get that kind of clarity. So it would be very important if you could commit to having a meeting with Metro IAF to be able to further discuss this. We can commit to following up to answer your questions as well as show you where the actual 500 million is within HPD's budget and we can work with council finance as well. In a meeting. We can commit to get you that in writing as you've requested. As I said, I would. You've but not in a meeting. You've a number of questions, so. But not in a meeting. I, I'm giving you the information that you asked for. I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but respectfully, when we're calling to ask for a meeting to get information, it's important that we have the ability to have open lines of communication so that we can share this information. If I have further questions, to be able to look someone in the eye, to be able to pull that information and to get further information. We most certainly have open lines of communication and we're having that now. I want to make sure that we are responding and writing to you around what your questions are and your concerns. I think that's the best way to do that. And then we can follow up and see if there's another meeting, or I should say a meeting that needs to happen to further clarify. But I want to make sure we get you answers in writing. All right, we're at the same place, but we'll look forward to that information. Councilmember Grudenchik. You sure? <laughs> Good afternoon, Director. Um, I was going to talk about parks, but I'm a little tired today. But I, I do want to note that the percentage of funding for parks in the overall budget is down below 0.6%. And while I think the mayor has been fairly good to parks, um, we are spending, we're gonna spend probably $5 billion in the next 10 years on capital for parks, which is a wonderful thing, but we're not making the commensurate uh, investments on the investments on the expense side. So I wanna just put that out there as you go forward and you, uh, you'll be hearing more from us, I'm sure. Um, the last time you were here, um, it's always good to see you, um, 
I asked about the new correctional facilities. There are going to be four of them built in uh, all the boroughs except for Staten Island. And um, they were certified on Monday. And we don't have a number about what this is going to cost. And um, we're going to have to vote on this sometime in the fall, the council, working with the mayor. And I think it's fair for us to know exactly what we're buying for our money, because we really don't know what we're buying right now other than kind of a, you know, a thought of a jail somewhere. Well, we know where they're okay. probably going. So do you, do you know, I don't think you have an answer yet, because I asked this morning Commissioner Grillo, and uh, we have a long-term working relationship with her, and they said there was some initial planning money in, but um, do you know when we might have an answer on this? Will we have it before adoption of the budget? Um, I think that is most certainly the goal that we're trying to work towards. I think some of the, uh, as you know, with the actual um, number of different proposals that are currently in Albany around bail reform, um, that could have significant impact on the planning for the borough-based jails. And are, you, are you suggesting they might be smaller? Correct. Okay. So and obviously you have even a ballpark cost. figure that I, I can... I don't at this time, and I think there's so much still in play around what those bills, the governor's proposal, interpretation of danger, what that means, that it would be, you know, kind of giving you numbers that you can't make sense of because there's so much happening on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis in Albany. I think that we're continuing to be hopeful that it will actually um, be part of the enacted budget. Um, and if that's the case, then we'll have further, we'll have some clarity on how to move forward on that front and what the impact is for the borough-based jail plan. Because it's, it's going to be tough for us to vote on this without numbers. I mean, I, I know that you I understand. understand that, and I just wanted to put it out there today. With okay. that, I'm going to yield the remaining 224 of my time. I was going to tell a joke, but maybe next time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your generosity, uh, council member. I also want to thank you for your generous time and for coming in and answering all the questions. We look forward to continuing to work with you. And uh, again, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Chair. We're going to take a little five-minute break, and then we're going to start with the public portion.
And if everyone could please find their seats, we are going to reconvene in just a moment. Once again, find seats. We are now at the public portion of the finance capital budget hearing. So once again, find a seat. Private conversations, please take outside. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, we'll now begin the public portion of our hearing. As a reminder for members of the public who wish to testify, please fill out a witness slip with the sergeant at arms. Additionally, the witness panels will be arranged by topic, so please indicate the topic of your testimony on the witness slip. If you have written testimony, please be sure to give the testimony to the sergeant at arms when your name is called to testify. We'll now call up our first panel, and I'm proud to say that it will be Henry Garrido, the executive director of DC 37. Welcome, Henry. Let me know when you like this. Uh, whenever you're ready is good. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Um, members of the committee, so good to see you uh, today. I'm Henry Garrido, I'm the executive director of District Council 37, uh, representing 125,000 municipal workers and 60,000 retirees. Uh, Mr. Chairman, for the sake of time, I am not going to go through uh, my testimony, but I want to highlight some of the uh, most salient points um, as we move forward uh, with your testimony. It's been a long day, and we want to make that the rest of the day very productive. So. For the sake of us, um, I'm here with Jeremy John, Director of Political Action Director uh, for DC 37. Um, I, I wanna concentrate and highlight the impact of, of, of the testimony in three specific areas. One is we are proposing today and highlighting a set of a renewal of what we did the white papers on revenue generating or revenue capturing ideas. Some of those ideas are not new, but they are worth um, re reissuing them because they were issued about 10 years ago, and we need to renew, um, given what is happening with the, the federal government and the impact on the budget. So I wanna talk about some of those, and some of those are actually are new that we wanna have a conversation about. Uh, the first uh, idea that we talked about is idea of capturing revenue. And we had, in District Council 37 since maintained that the city is doing a disservice by not capturing the revenue it should in terms of collecting revenue from cell phone towers, from billboards, uh, and from other properties that have not been captured of new construction. And that, we believe, is directly tied to the decline of, uh, of uh, city workers who are now revenue capturing. And uh, at the last uh, two th uh, uh, audit by the controller of the state of New York um, in 2016, uh, a report was issued that 82% of the city's uh, billboards are not being reported. The city has a system um, where real property income and expense reports are expected to be filed uh, by the property owners. It is an owner system. <laughs> it is an owner system that doesn't work. If you compare the number of billboards and cell phone towers, for that matter, to those that are uh, filed in terms of the Department of Building permits, 
there is a vast discrepancy between those who are reported in our tax rolls and those who are actually in existence that have permits to exist. So we believe that there is an opportunity to capture them. For the record, the entire city of New York has one individual, a DC 37 member, who's responsible for capturing revenue for, uh, for uh, billboards. We think that's a ridiculous proposition. Now, we're not proposing the increase of headcount in those areas for the mere case of increasing the union role. We believe that there is some serious revenue that could be captured as a result of it, and some of them are on property that were formerly owned by the uh, Department of Transit, uh, uh, the MTA, and some are existing in areas that we should be uh, working uh, very closely to capture, particularly on central towers, which go up all the time. So that's the first thing. Those are not new ideas, but we think that if doing more, back in 2010, I testified at this very hearing. Um, we have less successor today than we had in 2010. And we believe that this is a mistake, and we should be collecting this revenue across the board. The second one, which is a new idea that I'm sure you hear a little bit from later on from some of our, our local uh, 1757, is the idea of um, collecting revenue for fiber optics cable. In 2018, in December 2018 to be precise, there was a court ruling in the New York State Court of Appeals which ruled that in fact, fiber optic cables installations um, are to be taxed, are ca you're capable of taxing them, the city's not doing that. Now, it's a prime example, right? We have this discussion about Google coming into New York. Now, there was a lot of discussions about Amazon, and very little discussions about Google, but Google did come into New York City, and one of the attractiveness of that is the number of fiber optic cables underneath where the edification across in the Chelsea market is. So. If there are entities that are benefiting for the hundreds of millions and millions of dollars that are there in the fiber optics, we should be taxing those and we should be capturing that revenue. So before we turn to the city as an expenditure problem and begin to start cutting critical services, like cutting libraries and reducing parks and trying to uh, um, cut into childcare and daycare centers, we believe that there's an opportunity to capture that. Uh, we have um, put together a list. We'd like to distribute that to you, Mr. Chairman, for your consideration. We'd like to share the same list uh, for the city of New York. We believe that there's revenue to be captured. Uh, the second area that I want to briefly touch on is on the issue of renewable investment, which is a very big priority for our union. I, I sit as a pension trustee in the New York City retirement system, and as such was one of the main um, uh, leaders and sponsors of divesting from fossil fuels and to reinvesting uh, what is now $4.2 uh, billion of our pension money into green renewable energy. The way the city is approaching this renewable energy, unfortunately to us, there are some serious concerns. One of which is obviously is the, the way that the implementation for uh, um, uh, uh, solar panel and wind energy is being done here in New York. There is solar wind, offshore wind coming into New York. And there is an RFP out, the state has um, all, all the pieces together and I wanna thank um, a Councilwoman Vanessa Gibson for the work that she did in reaching out. But I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna take a moment to, to uh, talk about um, one piece which we are in complete support of and that is uh, Council Member Costa Constantinidis uh, uh, legislation, uh, Bill uh, 1253, the so-called there has been legislation. We are in full support of that, and we think more of that should happen. But we, I want to make the point that one of the concerns we had in the previously installed legislation similar to this is that if you expect the private sector to police itself in terms of energy renewable, that, that is not a, a good proposition. We believe there has to be a component of city government that should be enforcing the rules. Just like you have Department of Building Fines, just like you have uh, all of these other departments enforcing the rules, the current plan the mayor has, which is done through DCAS, does not call for that, does not call for the Department of Building. So we're looking forward to working with the council in instituting and implementing that because 
we think if our money and our pension is going to be in it, invested into what is good and a political uh, process, we should be there. And lastly, I want to talk about investment into city service. We've heard a lot about uh, the role of public hospitals, city hospitals, as far as safety net and the fact that the federal government continues to cut funding for the uninsured and the disproportional health care, which happens all the time. And then we're hearing, although there's good progress in terms of the Medicaid cuts for the state, we would like to see uh, the city council uh, to invest more into the public hospital systems. And, and, and we applaud the mayor for attempting to create a health insurance that covers 600,000 uninsured. But I don't think people realize the tremendous work that has been done to uh, turn around the finances on the public hospital system. Um, the question then is, what is the role of the city council in funding and also in the decision-making process? Uh, I believe one of the concerns that I have is that the council has been left out of the decision-making process, uh, implementing some very good ideas, worth a while, but we would like to see um, a more robust conversations about public hospitals that are clear critically in, in, in some of the council members' districts like Metropolitan Hospitals and its reconversion. Uh, and we look forward to being part of that discussion with you, Mr. Chairman, not uh, in there. Um, we are renewing our request for funding for investment in public libraries. So we're requesting $35 million this year for maintain the progress we made when we baseline the funding um, because uh, of increased expenses. Um, we're requesting, of course, you heard earlier uh, today, requests for funding for public parks and the fact that the parks are wo woefully underfunded. We are uh, asking uh, this year for the council, the, the parks. Um, it, it, there's such a meager investment by the city in terms of public parks and such a great value for New Yorkers. We, we would like you to, uh, the council, to do that. Um, we renew our request for... Um, investing in an education, whether it's uh, substance abuse counselors or redesigning cafeteria. Folks, I, I, the summer is about to start. And uh, last year, we, we had a number of incidents where workers were literally fainting on the job because the heat was so strenuous that we were afraid that people were literally going to drop dead. No one who shows up for work, dedicate themselves, um, to feed the children of New York should be subjected to the kind of grueling temperatures that we saw last uh, year and the year before and only likely to increase this year. We need your help on this. There has been most discussion about this because it's not directly related to children. I believe it has been put in the back burner. There was a state uh, a legislation, there was a NICOSH report on the cafeteria. We're not asking for all the schools. But if we have resources to put air conditioners in the classrooms because it's grueling for the teachers uh, and the students, guess what it's like in a cafeteria? And putting a fan that circulates hot air just does that. Increases the hot air that's being circulated. I think it's unconscionable that we ask our men and women of the city of New York to provide feeding and we, don't not, and we are not providing a safe work environment for them. So I want to renew that request. So lastly, I won't go, uh, I'm submitting my testimony. I ask, take any questions for, I will just say one question about, a lot of discussions have been done about the, right, the increasing size of the city's workforce, as if somehow it is directly related to the city's new financial uh, challenges. Let me remind the council and all of us that a lot of that workforce increases are directly related to the very good progressive ideas that we've made, some of which we heard here today. Universal pre-K and 3K increase the headcount. The reduced fare uh, uh, as an example of that. So if we're gonna be a real truly progressive uh, city, which is a shining example of a city across the country, we can't be bringing other new programs without recognizing that we have a uh, population increase of nearly a million New Yorkers, which are now New Yorkers, are coming in, that if you can make the city the robust city in, in terms of services for tourism, which is a major increase in revenue, that you cannot do by having uh, a workforce that's dilapidated and cannot deliver services because in the end people will leave. So I want to thank you for your work, thank you for your leadership, um, um, and look forward to working with you during this difficult budget process. Thank you.
Thank you very much, and uh, let me just start off by saying a number of your priorities are our priorities, and it's unfortunate uh, in a number of circumstances we continually have to fight to get those services put back into the budget. I'm thinking of parks employees and whether or not they're even going to know whether they have a job in the summer or not. You know, these are issues that we've had a fight in the past. Um, I'm, I heard your testimony about the billboards, but I, how many billboards are there, do you know? So, so the answer is, is we don't know, mm -hmm. um, but we, we, we have an assessment, right? So there is a number of billboards that are registered right, by borough. Um, they have to be registered. We can only know those who are um, reported on the RPIE report. Um, there are a lot of billboards that we found that are not even registered. For instance, um, if you drive towards the airport in Queens along the... Uh, towards Long Island uh, before that. Um, personally, I had a physical inspection. Many of those billboards along the Bell Parkway on the way out from Brooklyn to Queens are not even registered. Um, so we estimate that concurrently with the state controller, 82% of them are not being assessed. So I thought when I was early on in my, in the, in my tenure in the council that there was legislation that outlawed some of those billboards. There was a number of uh, legislation. There's a number of uh, also litigations that ensue after that. For instance, there was a question about whether, in fact, you had the ability to tax billboards that were attached to an MTA property or transit property as you go into an elevated L on that. And I'm sure uh, some additional information can be provided by the 1707. But at that time, there was already a ruling that allowed for the collection of that. Um, there are questions about uh, billboards that are attached to NYCHA and to other properties that are property exempt and whether in fact they are exempt themselves. We believe that if the city were to invest and have in really tracking the existing billboards and taxing them properly, it's not a new tax. You're simply collecting. And some of these boards bring in revenue of over $100,000 a month. That, and the fact that they're not being taxed is just a waste that we should be collecting at this time. The same thing happens with cell phone antennas, <laughs> with the telecommunications, they're all over the place. They come up like mushrooms <laughs> and they start. Um, the same analogy exists. In there, the only difference there is that because there are communication issues, because you have to register cell phone antennas for the purpose of emergency operations, the data for antennas is far better than it is for billboards. Mm -hmm. So, but we have found also that we have not, we're not collecting that. We have a number of properties where it's listed as vacant lots, where buildings are already existing there. But because we don't have the personnel, we don't have the assessors, we don't have the assistant assessors to do the physical inspections, we're not collecting that revenue. We have revenue that are uh, properties that are listed as uh, property exempt because they're nonprofits, but they're not being used by a nonprofit anymore. They might have been sold. So there, instead of the exemptions and nonprofit, we should really uh, invest in collecting that revenue. And one way to do it is to have, just like the state is looking at a revenue plan, the city should have its own revenue plan. And it involves capturing existing revenue that is losing. Interesting ideas. Um, Councilmember Rosenthal, I think, has a question. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. And um, thank you so much for testifying coming, testifying coming in today. I won't keep you. I was actually just speaking with a revenue analyst to see what we could do around some of these ideas. I really appreciate your bringing them in, and um, absolutely, we're going to pursue them. And I would also like to double down on what the chair said about um, making sure that uh, our workers are getting their jobs, we're filling vacancies, um, so we can actually serve the city of New York. So thank you so much for coming in. I appreciate it. There's, there's a bit of a vicious cycle here when revenue goes down because of one way or another. Immediately we ask for efficiency. We issue hiring freezes. We issue headcount reduction pegs, right, which we have now. There's always been a tenor, you don't reduce revenue <laughs> producing titles. Unfortunately, that's what's happening. We have over a million parcels in the city of New York. We have about 110 assessors, 110. 
uh, that is a ridiculous proposition. If you look at Nassau County, you look at New Jersey, you look at you know, the counties upstate, the ratio of property and the value in a place like Man Manhattan in New York as it applies to tax class two buildings is just ridiculous. And we think the city will be better served to do the opposite. Instead of cutting and reducing, if you were to increase these titles, your revenue that you would capture would be many, many times over. So in this particular area, we're against any hiring freeze for that purpose. So thank you. Thank you. I'm actually just jotting down that idea as well. Thank you. Okay, very good, uh, great suggestions, a lot to digest there. We thank you for coming in and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you as we move down the path to a, to a, um, to a budget, negotiating a budget. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Okay, our next panel, Ralph Palladino, Second Vice President, Local 1549, DC 37. Maria Policarpo, President, Local 1757. DC 37, the assessors, uh, Rainer Teller and Orgia Guapa, Workers Justice Project, and Shane, whoop, I'm sorry, missed one, and Wynn uh, Periyazmani from the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies, and Shane Corriera. Center for Court Innovation. I'm missing some people, so I'm just gonna, I know Ralph is here. Is Maria here? Okay. Raina? No. Win. And Steve. No. Okay. So you just give me a oh, Shane. No. Shane Corriera. No. Okay. Greg Waltman. Okay. And um, Julia Durank Martinez, New Economy Project. Oh, we'll get a chair. Okay, Ralph, would you like to start? Good afternoon, Chairs. Ralph Palladino, Clerical Administrative Employees, Local 1549. Um, I'm back again, uh, and unfortunately, with the reduced budget and also the uh, freeze that's on, I have to say that in the, human, the HRA, uh, Human Resource Administration, uh, the public is not gonna be serviced properly. Uh, people are gonna be waiting for SNAP and Medicaid uh, as they do already online and also on the phones because our members on tips take the thing, take the information and give it to the eligibility specialists. And we know that there has been 400 positions attrited in four years in HRA. If that continues, the lines are gonna continue. If you don't hire the HRA eligibility specialist, no matter what you do, the lines will continue. Uh, hopefully you'll be supporting New York City Care. That initiative is important for hospitals. The interpreter title is vital for the new immigrants and also uh, expanding services in the city. Face-to-face -face interpretation is the way to go. Under revenue areas, 911 surcharge, 42% of 189 million dollars is sitting in the state being used for other purposes and nobody in New York City except Local 1549 is asking the state to pay that money to the city and enhance 911. It's a shame. 
Under civilianization, which is an old issue, the city could be saving $30 million a year if they get the uniforms out of the desks. I was in One Piece Plaza today, and there are sergeants and captains doing clerical work. I want you to know at One Police Plaza. Then you have an issue where the city is hiring or using higher paid managerial, non-competitive jobs at times uh, and subverting civil service and the clerical positions, and they are doing clerical work at a loss of almost $3 million a year to the city. That's money lost. Under civilianization, you can get $300 million. Uh, 30 million, I'm sorry. Under, under, under 911, if you, if you go to the state and request the proper funding, you can get part of the 42% of $189 million paid last year that the FCC says they're not paying to, to the state. So these are important issues. But also, going to Albany this week is critical. For hospitals, it's life and death to get funding from Albany. Medicaid rates have to raise. They're losing $150 a visit every single time someone comes into a clinic. If you're uninsured, it's $350. How does, HH, how does ho hospitals survive? So I'm asking to please reach out to the state and make sure that we have proper funding. And also TANF cannot be cut. And that's a state issue at this point. And we all know what we have to do with Washington. And thank you very much. And remember that the people who are on civil service lists those police administrative aides that should be sitting there instead of officers, those eligibility specialists who should be taking care of people and there's, there's nobody to do it, and management, by the way, is harassing people, they're following people to the bathroom, they are timing people going to the bathroom, okay? They're standing over people, shouting at them and threatening them because of this budget cut that's been happening, not, not budget cut, but reduction of staff for the eligibility specialists. It's gotta stop. And if, it, if there's no funding for the eligibility people, it's going to continue. And we're going to have to continue to fight that as a union. But these folks on these civil service lists and the clerical associate list paid to be on that, on that list. And they're being subverted off that list. Okay? And they work and live in the city of New York and they're mainly from communities of color and the poorest areas that need jobs. So we're asking that the city do the right thing, and we're asking the city council's advocacy and support on these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for going over. No, that's okay. Uh, thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon, members of the I just hit that mic here, the red light. Okay. Good afternoon, members of the city council. My name is Maria Policarpo. I am president of Local 1757, which represents assessors, and I work as an assessor in the tax commission. I'm going to speak in regard to the critical need for the hiring of more assessors as a crucial part of the Department of Finance's budget for the upcoming fiscal year. The gross insufficiency of these professionals in the property field division is a leading cause of uncollected revenue. Assessors are responsible for overseeing the valuation of approximately 1.1 million parcels within the five boroughs. There should be a minimum of 150 districts to properly maintain and value them. Instead, there are only 87 districts with 23 of them vacant. There are supposed to be 17 supervisors for those districts, yet six supervisor, supervisor positions are vacant. Staffing is at a crisis level. The hiring of 80 additional assessors will help to backfill the current vacancies and create smaller, more manageable districts. The city continues to lose hundreds of millions of tax dollars due to the limited time an assessor is able to spend in the field for inspections of new construction or major alteration projects who file with the building department and virtually no time to pick up those who do work without permits. Director positions, which should be held by administrative assessor titles, remain vacant for over a year. The assessment division is being run by staff analysts who have never held the title of assessor and have no assessment or appraisal background. Somehow, these same staff analysts were also in charge of training newly hired assessors. We cannot stress enough the importance of creating a dedicated training unit run by qualified and experienced assessors. Time for this is running out as senior staff is rapidly retiring and taking their knowledge with them. Over a million dollars has been wasted on field computers that never worked. Additional funds are now being allocated for a third useless tablet. However, simple cameras are not available. The modeling system was meant to be a tool, yet management continues in its attempt to have it take the place of the assessor. In turn, the quality of the tax roll is very poor. This is evidenced in the 56,000 and counting property tax appeals filed yearly with the, with the tax commission. 
The additional, the additional liability facing New York City must be considered in the upcoming budget due to the irresponsible passing of intro 1038A by the council, even though the mayor was compelled by our argument of its detrimental nature to return the bill unsigned. Assessors at the Tax Commission are tasked with determining an average of 2,000 parcels each per season and are required to complete 10 hours per week for 12 weeks of mandatory overtime. This year, we face the additional burden of rendering sound decisions without the benefit of certification by a CPA of income and expense statement figures on the majority of parcels heard. The additional workload this creates and the number of individuals eligible to retire in the near future calls for a line of succession to be addressed with the hiring of 20 additional assessors in the Tax Commission. The impact of the shortage of assessment staff will be a loss of billions of dollars in tax revenue in the coming years, along with tremendous liability incurred if property tax appeals are not settled. Local 1757 thanks you for your time and consideration, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mm -hmm. um, with the assessors, how much of a change has there been with the assessors due to, um, uh, you know, computerized systems and being able to look at properties, satellite uh, looking at properties? I'm sorry. Say that again? The, 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 um, the Department of Finance Correct. has a system mm -hmm. that is, um, I guess, by satellite that they can look Correct. at properties. And that might be one of the reasons why they're not hiring assessors, okay. because they don't need as many people to go to the field, or they may claim that they don't need it. Do you well, know if that's been part of the reason for the lack of the hiring of the assessors? I can't explain why they don't hire, but I can tell you that um, field inspections are mandatory because we value based on usage and a exterior inspection based on one time per year is certainly not um, giving you an outlook on what's inside that inside that building and I don't know about you but I don't have 3D vision to see inside a building and there is also taxable status date those images are captured once per year and real estate is actively and rapidly changing and therefore it cannot take replace field inspections by assessors who understand what the usage is. Have you, have you heard of Cyclomedia? I have heard of Cyclomedia. Okay, okay. And it should be a tool for the assessor. It should not replace the field inspections. Okay, okay thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next please. Good afternoon, Committee Chair Drum um, and Council Member Gibson and Rosenthal. My name is Julia Duranti Martinez and I'm the Community Land Trust Coordinator at New Economy Project. A New Economy Project co-founded and co-convenes the New York City Community Land Initiative, which is a coalition of more than two dozen housing and social justice organizations that are advocating for community land trusts to address the root causes of homelessness and displacement. And as an outgrowth of this work, New Economy Project and 14 partner organizations are proposing a new citywide CLT initiative that would incubate and expand CLTs in all five boroughs. Um, and CLTs are a proven mechanism to preserve vital affordable housing stock and prevent the extraction of public subsidies. A CLT is a nonprofit that owns and stewards land in the community's interest and leases use of the land for affordable housing and other community development. And CLTs issue renewable 99-year ground leases that establish resale and rental restrictions. And I want to emphasize this because these terms protect public investments in CLTs from being lost to the market over time, which makes them a more effective use of public funding than conventional affordability projects of 15, 30, or 40 years. As also, as part of their commitment to permanent affordability, community-led development, and stewardship, CLTs engage in ongoing community organizing and provide a central education, outreach, and support to their leaseholders. These activities make them important in partners with city agencies in implementing affordable housing goals and broader equitable community development. The CLT model has sparked a citywide movement that has achieved tremendous gains in recent years. And some examples include passage of the city's first local law defining and entering CLTs into the administrative code, increased HPD support, expanded training and technical assistance networks, and investment of New York State Attorney General settlement funds in local CLTs. More than a dozen community-based organizations from the Northwest Bronx to Brownsville are now working to develop local leadership, deepen community partnerships, organize tenants and homeowners, and identify properties suitable for their CLTs. The proposed citywide CLT initiative for fiscal year 2020 will allow groups to build upon this exciting progress at a critical moment of opportunity. The initiative will support essential CLT community education and organizing, board and member training, and other startup costs, build capacity through legal, financial, and technical assistance, and promote coordination among CLTs so they reach a sustainable scale. 
we ask the committee to include the CLT initiative in its budget recommendations for 2020. And thank you for the opportunity to testify. Okay, thank you very much. Next, please. Hi, council members. Thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Wynn Perry Asami, and I'm a health policy analyst at FPWA. We're a membership organization of 170 faith-based and human services providers working on the drivers of income inequality and reaching 1.5 million New Yorkers per year through our membership. Um, towards the goal of building a city of equal opportunity, we'd like to talk about three, um, three main points. One, we believe in um, funding the day labor workforce initiative to an enhancement to $3.6 million in FY20, um, which this service, uh, like this initiative provides New York's most vulnerable wor uh, workers, day laborers, um, with safer employment options and workforce development opportunities. Um, this would bring this opportunity to a new center in the Bronx, as well as increasing the capacity of the other five centers throughout the city. Um, we also are uh, promoting the restoration of funding for Access Health NYC to $2.5 million, which is reaching and funding the uh, CBOs, about 30 CBOs across the city um, on the ideas and like education to reach hard to reach and underserved populations and make them uh, know their rights and access to coverage and to health care. Um, and finally, uh, Nonprofits uh, help keep our uh, uh, community strong, um, and we, to this point, we're encouraging the city council to um, support uh, funding of two, uh, $250 million um, to fill the gap um, between providers, um, their indirect costs, and contract reimbursement rates. Uh, we're asking for this to be included in budget response um, to the mayor's executive budget. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. The Bronx doesn't have a, a day labor center? Um, there, it doesn't have one currently, um, just from funding cu uh, cuts to my knowledge, um, or like funding capacity to my, no to my knowledge. This isn't my initiative but, um, that I work on, but this would bring, uh, we have a partner, I believe it's Catholic Charities, but I can get back to you with that information, sure. um, that would be able to, um, their position to be able to start doing this work and create a full center in the Bronx. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon, Councilman, Councilwoman. Greg Waltman, uh, I represent clean energy company, G1 Quantum. Um, I was interested in hearing the debate, I uh, believe, between Councilman um, Gambo and the OMB. And I was wondering if the council could clarify an issue. Is that related to yesterday's inquiry with the First Lady, the budgetary concerns of $500 million, is that? About council member, which council member? Gambo? Combo? Combo? Yeah. So, so there's, a, there's a separate issue? Yeah, I think she's talking about housing. Mm -hmm. And then the other one was about Thrive, which was yesterday's hearing was on, on mental health issues. Yeah, no, Thrive, Thrive New York City, and, and I, was just, I was just wondering if those were interrelated budgetary issues. I don't think so, no. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, uh, I just wanted to bring to the council's attention um, that solution um, we've I've, I've discussed, quantum tracks, I would like to discuss um, quantum border wall solution, where if you put solar panels on the border wall of 2,000 miles, now some people wouldn't, agree that the border wall should be there or you know it shouldn't exist but if it's going to be there you might as well put solar panels on the border wall and at 2,000 miles at 10 feet on the southern side you can create some 242 trillion kilowatt hours of energy or 291 billion dollars of energy per year so parsing through the value essentially zero sum budgetary concerns not only on a federal capacity but a local capacity where contracts um, delegated or related to that or delegated through uh, New York could be quite lucrative in offsetting different types of budgetary concerns. I would just like to bring that to the council's attention that um, merit-based negotiations could be formulated around solar reapplication and being able to create the type of um, bipartisan um, reciprocal type of approach that actually gets things done. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Interesting proposition, and we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you to this panel for coming in. 
Okay, our next panel is Tasfia Rahman from the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. Aya Tasaki from Womankind, 15% and growing. Ying Yu Situ from Ming Kwan, 15% and growing. Uh, Rachel Acher, Arab American Family Support Center, and 15% and growing. Dia Vasven, Sapna, New York City. Uh, Alexander Kim, youth leader from Ming Kwan. Okay, great. Would you like to start? Uh, good afternoon, uh, Council Member. Good Tom, afternoon, Council Member Gibson. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Tasfia Rahman, and I am a policy coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families (CACF). Um, since 1986, CACF is the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization and leads the fight for improved and equitable policy systems, funding, and services to support those in need. CACF also leads the 15% and Growing Campaign, a group of over 45 Asian-led and serving organizations that work together to ensure that New York City's budget protects the most vulnerable APA New Yorkers. So I, I have a list of a number of budget priorities, but I just want to highlight um, uh, the first one, actually. Um, so we, we understand that the city is facing budget cuts at the state level and financial uncertainty at the federal level. However, we also know that APA communities are facing increasing challenges to all aspects of their lives, including their health and nutrition, economic and housing security, and educational opportunities. We make the following ask to better protect the survival and well-being of our communities, including the heavily immigrant APA community. So um, for uh, the one that I want to highlight is to increase funding and provide oversight in the 60 million in annual bridge program funding promised by the administration in their two 2014 career pathways plan. While current city investment in bridge programming focuses on skills building and career pathway development, it does not consider population based needs. Immigrants comprise 47% of the workforce in New York City and an estimated 1.7 million New Yorkers are LEP. Job seekers with limited or no English proficiency who do not meet the requirements for intermediate or advanced proficiency are often excluded from current bridge programs. Therefore, we urge that a significant portion of that funding be used to fund an innovative pilot immigrant workforce development initiative with a focus on integrating pre-literacy and basic ESOL classes with vocational ESOL, digital literacy skills training, and student support services. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was good to meet with you also and uh, to see Thank these you. priorities. Thanks. Okay. Next, please. Sure. Um, thank you to the Committee on Finance and the entire New York City Council for inviting community-based organizations to comment on budget proposals for fiscal year 2020. My name is Rachel Eicher, Development Officer at the Arab American Family Support Center, and I'm honored to testify here today on behalf of immigrant and refugee families throughout New York City. At the AFSC, we've strengthened immigrant and refugee families since 1994. Um, among a range of impact measures this last year, um, AFSC's trauma-informed home-based services kept 830 children from 329 families safely in their homes and out of foster care. Um, we assisted over 1,200 survivors of gender-based violence at family justice centers across the city, and we also launched a new mental health initiative. To address the heightened risk of depression and anxiety immigrants face in this atmosphere of uncertainty and hostility. Um, with 25 years of experience, we have special expertise serving New York's growing Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian populations. Um, and our, spa our staff speak 18 languages and reach underserved groups. So we understand the needs of immigrant community members, and we recognize the City Council is committed to their health and well being. Um, so for fiscal year 2020, AFSC respectfully requests. First, increasing the adult literacy initiative to 12 million for community-based organizations to give immigrants struggling to communicate the skills they need to adapt and contribute. 
Second, continued full funding for city council initiatives that provide life-saving and transformative services for immigrant communities, including the Domestic Violence and Empowerment Initiative, the Initiative for Immigrant Survivors of Domestic Violence, Access Health NYC, Access to Healthy Food and Nutritional Education, the Step In and Stop It Initiative to address bystander intervention, and the Young Women's Leadership Development Initiative. Um, to just to wrap up, we also are interested in seeing the council support expanded eligibility for the Communities of Color Nonprofit Stabilization Fund to include all service organizations regardless of size, and we'd ask for robust funding of census outreach to ensure participation from traditionally hard to reach immigrant communities. Um, immigrants are 37% of the city's population and an undercount risks further reducing resources allocated to our neighborhoods, our city, and our state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And our speaker was advocating for additional funding for the census today, earlier today. Mm -hmm. And um, isn't it ridiculous that we have to fight for the adult literacy every year, year after year? Every so year. unbelievable, yeah. Thank you for fighting for it. Though. Oh, thank Thanks you. So much. <laughs> All right, thank you. Next, please. Good afternoon. I'm the Basu Sen, director of SUPNA NYC. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Um, SUPNA NYC is a nonprofit organization that works with South Asian immigrant women to improve health, expand economic opportunities, create social networks, and build a collective voice for change. To date, we're one of very few organizations addressing health issues in this fast-growing, high-need South Asian immigrant community in New York City, working in the Bronx and Queens, and the only CBO based in the Bronx providing culturally and linguistically competent social services empowerment programming and health education for this population. We recognize that many of the council members have supported APA organizations in their districts and are thankful for their support. However, city investment in the APA community is still not where it needs to be. We make up 15% of the population, but our funding falls woefully short of that. We're calling on the city council today to do more and to recognize that investing in these CBOs that serve the APA communities is really the most effective way to meet a rising need that city agencies are simply not yet equipped to meet. CBOs like SUPNA are uniquely equipped to serve APA immigrant communities. We're born out of the communities we serve and therefore are some of the most effective service providers. Having a deep connection um, to the needs and experiences of our clients. Um, these CBOs provide services that are simply not available or accessible elsewhere. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you guys to read a little bit more about some of the specifics. Um, but not only do we serve, um, give direct services where there are none, we also help to get our communities to services that the city is offering where there isn't always knowledge of how to access or what exists. Um, and if the city is investing in those services, it makes sense that you want people to actually utilize them. Um, so thank you very much um, for your time today. Where, where is SAPNA in Queens? We don't have a location in Queens. We do a child health program that's a home visit based program and we do workshops kind of in different areas. Within the borough? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No problem. Much needed, thank you. Yeah. Next please. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, council members, for allowing us to testify today. Uh, my name is Ying Yu Situ, and I'm the advocacy and organizing coordinator at the Ming Kwan Center for Community Action. We're based in Flushing, Queens, which has some of the highest population of foreign born folks. Um, and we are a social services and immigration advocacy nonprofit that uh, serves the working class Asian American, oftentimes undocumented community. Um, so I wanted to key in on two pieces within the 2020. Um, budget priorities within 15% and growing, specifically immigrant services and housing and economic security. Um, so more specifically, we're asking that $2.6 million are restored to the Immigrant Opportunities Initiative, which would provide legal services for folks to naturalize, receive legal assistance related to their citizenship applications. Last year, we serviced over 600 clients um, who came in with questions oftentimes relating to things like green card fraud because they were targeted, um, not understanding the immigration system, um, they were often targeted by folks who sp spoke the language and they didn't know English um, and applied for these false green cards that would then jeopardize like their future applications for citizenship. Um, so stuff like this comes in all the time. Um, 
uh, this money would allow like community organizations like us to disseminate like truthful information in language and provide services in language so that this doesn't happen. Um, in terms of the housing and economic security piece, um, we all know that affordable housing is a huge issue all across the city. Um, increasingly, more and more tenants are coming in with issues related to eviction, landlords who prey on them because they don't speak English. Um, uh, we have such a high rate of poverty in our community that many folks struggle to make rent and have to apply for emergency relief or SCRI funding. Um, so this money would support us in continuing to do this work um, pro bono as these cases can drag on sometimes uh, over years or they need very immediate relief. Um, as well as provide things like know your rights training, um, tenant support so that they can advocate on their own behalf. Um, and one more piece in that, um, I would like to ask about affordable housing um, being built within Queens because we organize senior tenants and many of them have been either applying for eight years, um, still haven't heard anything about senior housing. Um, the few who have received it ended up moving to places as far away as Yonkers, meaning that they lose their community, they lose their networks, they lose their families. Um, so it's a question of why is there no afford like truly affordable housing being built within our neighborhoods and our boroughs. Um, so just to close it out, um, you know, New York City is a sanctuary city, um, and we hope that the budget can reflect that, and we thank you for your continued advocacy. Yeah, when advocacy. I look at Flushing, I see all the new development that's going up there. And I, I wonder how much of it is affordable. I don't think much of it at all, actually. Is, Absolutely not. <laughs> right, exactly. And I'm going to have to challenge you about having the, uh, the district with the highest number of, of immigrants, uh, minus 68% recent immigrants. OK, sorry about that. But we all, either way, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> uh, it's, a good, it, it's a good thing. Thank you. Yeah. Next, please. Uh, good afternoon, council members. Um, my name is Alexander Kim, and I will also be talking about literacy. Um, I'm actually a senior at Regis High School, um, if you know it, and currently live in Queens. I work with Minkwon Center, um, just as Ying does, and along with other people, I am asking for $6 million to be allocated towards the Adult Literacy Initiative. Literacy is one of the most important human rights and should not be treated as a privilege. Um, about 18% of New York City residents do not speak English profici proficiently, and the need is greatest in the boroughs of Queens, Bronx, and Brooklyn, where 24 to 28% of the population cannot speak English proficiently. Um, the most limited English proficiency individuals are immigrants. Um, nearly 19%, which is about 4.7 million people across the US, were born in the US, uh, mostly to immigrant parents. Of those who need a literacy education in New York City, only about 40,000 or 3% are actually receiving it. Literacy in the English language is one of the most is one of the few ways to succeed in the US, um, not only in the workplace, but also to get through interviews, read important forms, uh, fill them out, answer calls, etc. The Literacy Initiative not only helps the reading, but also writing and speaking. Personally, I have friends um, and many families who often fill out forms for their parents or have to interpret essential government forms in order for the family to correctly fill them out. One of them recently seek, for example, uh, the renewal of their family's green card as a college student because their parents were not proficient in English, even though the parents may have a better understanding of how to get through the system. Um, yeah. Uh, along with that, a lot of gentrifying spots th throughout New York City, as you may know, a lot of landowners are pushing out people, especially those that cannot speak English, and argue with them on how their rent is being increased and how unfair it is. Um, and while housing issue is one example, not being able to read, write, or speak English creates a big mental stress and means that immigrants miss out on important information that impact their lives. And to conclude, I would just like, I would just like to ask again um, for the $6 million to be restored to the Adult Literacy Initiative. Thank you. Yep, we're fighting hard for that money, so uh, you have a commitment from us here in the council on that for sure. And uh, we're very familiar, I'm very familiar with Ming Kwan also, so thank you. And thank you to the panel for coming in. We appreciate it. Okay, our last panel is uh, Sharanya Pillai from India Home. I know I'm probably messing up names horrible here. Joanne Yu, Asian American Federation. And Man Yuk Yu, Academy of Medical and Public Health Services.
Yeah, and you can begin. Okay. Oh, we're missing someone. I thought I called three people. <coughs> Manyak is unable to make it today. Okay, okay, very good, okay. Okay, well, thank you, Finance Chair Daniel Drum and the Committee on Finance for helping India Home provide better senior services. India Home is a nonprofit organization founded by community members to serve South Asian older adults. The mission of India Home is to provide the quality of life for older adults by providing culturally appropriate social services. India Home has grown tremendously in the last year to fulfill our mission to serve South Asian older adults with culturally appropriate social services. At our Desi Senior Center in Jamaica, we attract on average 100 seniors daily who would otherwise be socially isolated during the daytime. We have started our community mental health program, and in addition to these exciting new steps, we are continuing our programs in collaboration with existing senior centers once a week in different locations, such as at Sunnyside Community Services and Queens Community House. In total, we serve over 250 seniors a week. We plan to continue to lay roots in council districts 23, 24, 25, 26, 28, and 29 to provide targeted and much needed senior services to South Asian older adults. We <coughs> must note that despite our continued advocacy, grassroots community-led programs such as India Home have only minimally received the benefits of the baseline budget increase. India Home and other immigrant-led organizations that serve seniors fill a critical gap in serving an intersectionally vulnerable population, those who are immigrants, have low English proficiency, and have low income. We are laying the foundation for services that will only be more in demand in the coming years. Every week, we receive a multitude of phone calls and inquiries on behalf of seniors who are looking to attend our centers and receive our services. The City Council has been an invaluable partner in our efforts to provide these critical services to immigrant older adults. However, our community resources are running very thin. India Home tries to address the growing needs of senior center services, which include, include congregate meal programs, case management, health and wellness programs, and various one-on-one -on -one services. Each day, we see our congregate meal programs fill to capacity. We try to address the growing need for all these services. However, we are in need of more expense funding to better serve the growing aging community, and we ask for one million from the budget for expense funding to support our senior center services. And in addition to the expense funding, we request $1.995 million in capital funding for the acquisition of an 8,000-square-foot independent building in Queens Village to meet the critical need of senior services to aging South Asians. Our plan for this permanent location is to cover three main functions, program space for senior center and adult program, office space, and the creation, creation of a commercial kitchen in preparation for healthy, culturally appropriate congregate meals. Um, we request your continued and increased expense and capital support to help India Home better serve the South Asian senior community. Thank you. Thank you. Of this $1 million expense request, how much are you currently receiving? Um, we are currently receiving around 600000 for this fiscal year. So it's about a 400000 increase. Yes. And where are you along the road in terms of the um, acquisition of the property? Um, with the current property for um, Blacksford Terrace, we are currently um, in works with finalizing the contract and we're hoping to have acquisition by end of this year latest. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chair Daniel Drum and the Committee on Finance for this opportunity to testify. Um, as you might notice, I am not Joanne Yu. Uh, Joanne had to attend a meeting with Jumani Williams for his transition team, so I'm filling in for her. Jumani um, always beats us out. Eh? <laughs> You'll have to take that up with him. Um, my name is Tiffany Chang. I'm the Advocacy and Policy Manager at AAF. So as you know, the Asian population is the fastest growing um, group in New York City and now represents at least 10% of the population in 26 council districts. Um, one in four Asians lives in poverty and half have a, a limited English ability um, and more than seven in 10 are immigrants. And so all these factors really compound um, the need for culturally competent services, um, but unfortunately, despite the rapid growth of the community, um, only 1.4% of contract dollars from city social service agencies went to Asian-led, Asian-serving programs. So um, I believe that, uh, that you're familiar with our work already, but I wanted to highlight a few key issues. 
The first is the dire need for funding for community-based organizations to encourage participation in the upcoming 2020 census by Asian communities. So we really do see this as a crisis, um, and it's great that the, the speaker and other council members, um, like Council Member Nanchaka and Rivera have been uh, leading the charge on this, but uh, AAF is the only census information center um, designated by the Census Bureau um, that collects information particularly on the Asian American community in the Northeast. Um, and re recent Census Bureau studies have found that Asian Americans were the least likely um, to say they intend to participate. So we're really asking for council support in making sure that the organizations that have worked for years to build up trust in these communities are given the resources to lead the charge in um, working at the front lines to, to encourage participation. Um, secondly, just to kind of double down on the, the request from yesterday's hearing on mental health, we really want to flag the fact that Asian Americans have um, high needs for mental health um, services um, and resources to develop community-wide capacity. And lastly, I just wanted to highlight um, that you know the recent Comptroller's report um, shows that the Asian American community is um, bearing the brunt of immigration enforcement proceedings, 21% um, are Chinese immigrants and 10% are Indian immigrants. So we really want to stress the need for universal representation and increased uh, support for legal services and, and, um, and integration services for um, the communities most in need. Um, so thank you very much for this, com for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, and that's an issue I've brought to the attention of knife up uh, providers as well as the you know uh, ability to represent Asian communities in the deportation proceedings. Um, and um, how, how visible is Thrive in the Asian community? Well, as my colleague Ju um, testified yesterday, there has been very limited interaction between the Asian community and our member agencies that testified with us yesterday um, and, the, and the leadership at Thrive. Um, we, do have a, we do have a meeting with Susan Herman scheduled for tomorrow, but up until now, the interactions has been, have been rather, rather limited despite um, how vocal we've been about the need to not only um, provide ad hoc sort of top-down services, but also to create a truly comprehensive an integrated, e integrated ecosystem that is successful in reaching hard to reach communities. Yeah, I'm sorry I had to miss that portion of the hearing yesterday. I had another uh, hearing and, and, a, and a meeting after that, but I did hear some of that stuff um, afterwards, so um, we, I'd like to hear back from you about um, what happens at the meeting after you have it with okay. Susan Herman. Absolutely. Okay, so get back to us on that. We look forward to working with okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. All right, I think that's it. Nobody else wants to testify, right? Either that or hold your breath forever. Okay. Um, we are now finished, and this meeting is adjourned.